today is to show you applied anatomy for instrumentation of the cervical spine and we are predominantly going to focus on posterior instrumentation and I hope in this next 15 minutes I am able to give you an introduction for all the talks that are going to follow after me. So let's begin with the occipital region. So the surgical anatomy of the occipital bone you want to know that there are three nuchal lines the supreme, the superior and the inferior. Supreme is not so prominent. These nuchal lines converge on the external occipital protuberance and there is a midline crest that is running downwards from the external occipital protuberance. So if you flip the bone uh, around you will find that the external occipital protuberance corresponds to the confluence of the sinuses and the superior nuchal line corresponds to the transverse uh, sinus. So here you can see the transverse sinus and the confluence of the sinus that corresponds to the superior nuchal line and the external occipital protuberance and you will appreciate that your instrumentation has to stay below this uh, vascular structures so that you don't injure them with your screws. If you shine a light inside the skull you will find that the thickest por portion of the occipital bone is around the external occipital protuberance. So the area that is best suited for putting screws is this inverted triangular area that is below the superior nuchal line in this region more or less closer to the midline crest. So here in this case example you can see that this is the external occipital protuberance and this is the midline crest. So your instrumentation is going to be in an inverted triangle below the external occipital protuberance or the superior nuchal line in this fashion. This is a keel plate where the screws go in the midline or the keel of the occiput. Now there are other variations uh, of the occipital plate. You can have screws that are placed laterally but laterally the occipital bone thickness is quite thin and to make these two constructs equivalent you will have to place three screws on either plate on either side to make it equivalent to a midline plate which can be strong enough if you put three screws in the midline. Bicortical screws have much more strength at than unicortical screws and at the external occipital protuberance you can because of its thickness you can put a unicortical screw and have the same strength. Coming to the C1 or the atlas vertebra so this uh, vertebra has a unique anatomy and most of the instrumentation happens in this lateral mass or a big area of the bone that is connected by the anterior and the posterior arch. So when you are dissecting on the posterior arch trying to expose the lateral mass don't dissect too far laterally on the superior border of the C1 arch because you will hit the vertebral artery beyond 12 to 15 millimeters. So always try to dissect on the inferior border to reach the uh, lateral mass. So the entry point of the lateral mass is at the base of the posterior arch in the middle of the lateral mass like this and sometimes you have to sacrifice the C2 ganglion to visualize this area but mind you there is a lot of venous uh, plexus around this area and you can have a torrential bleeding here if you are not careful. Another peculiar uh, anatomy uh, here is this overhang of the uh, posterior arch which can force your trajectory of C1 screw to go upwards like this. So if you put a screw like this you are more likely to violate the OC1 joint because it dips down like this. So you might have to burr down this area to make sure that your screw trajectory is pointed towards the lower part of the anterior tubercle like this. The anterior relationship of the C1 lateral mass is important. You can see the anterior part of the C1 lateral mass is posterior to the anterior most part of the anterior tubercle by about 7 millimeters. So when you are putting a screw you want to stop short of the anterior arch because if you go all the way anteriorly your screw is going to come out somewhere here and you have the internal carotid and the hypoglossal nerve right in front of the lateral mass somewhere here a little laterally. So the direction of the lateral mass screw also is a little bit medial especially because this screw is stronger if you have a bicortical purchase. So alternative entry points are the such a kind of entry point where uh, some try to notch the posterior arch like this so that your entry point shifts a little bit 
superior or you can pass a screw directly through the posterior arch like this uh, where you can see on this x-ray the screw is going through the posterior arch in directly into the lateral mass for this you require the posterior arch to be of sufficient uh, thickness so if you put a screw directly through the c1 uh, arch like this you can avoid dissecting the venous plexus and uh, putting your screw close to the c2 uh, ganglion but you have to be careful of this and anomaly when you are putting such kind of a screw this is the ponticulus posticus and it's seen about 15 percent of patients uh, you can on the lateral uh, x-ray uh, you can easily uh, identify this as an arcuate foramen like this during dissection have not anticipated this anomaly and you want to put a posterior arch screw somewhere here in the middle uh, the screw directly will go through the vertebral artery if you don't account for this uh, anomaly the C2 or the axis vertebra again is a unique vertebra. The odontoid process uh, forms the pivot of the uh, of the C1 C2 uh, joint. But what is more important here in the posterior instrumentation is this region. The superior articular facet is is not exactly over the inferior articular facet as it is there in the rest of the cervical spine. There is an offset here which makes uh, this area of bone elongated and that's called the pars of the C2 where many of the screws are inserted. People use these pedicle and pars of C2 terminology interchangeably. By definition pedicle is this small area uh, of the C2 and pars is the part of bone that is between the superior facet and the inferior facet that's why it's called the pars interarticularis. So this is a pedicle screw, the screw that goes across the pars and reaches the pedicle of the C2 vertebra. Par screw as the name suggests is in the pars which is also a shorter transarticular screw and a laminar screw goes into the lamina of C2. As you know the C2 lamina is quite thick and the largest lamina in the cervical spine. The problem with the pars of the C2 is that the superior articular facet is deeply notched by the vertebral artery sometimes and the notching has uh, quite a bit of variation ranging from minimal to such deep notching which makes the putting of screws in this region quite dangerous so if you have a very high riding vertebral artery like this which reaches very close to the superior articular facet then putting screws here can sometimes be dangerous so there are two measurements here that you have to remember the internal height which is the distance of the vertebral artery cave from the top of the superior facet and the isthmus height or the pars width that is the distance of the vertebral artery cave from the dorsal surface of the pars uh, uh, interarticularis. So if you have a vertebral artery cave that is too tall or too high then you can still pass a transarticular screw like this because there is room behind. But if you have a vertebral artery cave that is too posterior this will make the isthmus height smaller or the pars width smaller and in these cases the transarticular screws can be a dangerous screw if there is not adequate room to negotiate the screw through the pars. To identify these anomalies you need to do multiplanar reconstructions either yourself using softwares like Horos or Osirix or sit with a radiologist in the department to get these multiplanar cuts which are in line of the uh, screw trajectory. So like this you can see here you are getting uh, a, a plane uh, where you are able to pass this screw without interrupting the vertebral artery cave in this first example but in the second example you can see that the vertebral artery cave is in the path of your screw uh, before it reaches the lateral mass of C1. So planning is extremely important. So sometimes the vertebral artery notching not only is too high but it can be too medial as well like you can see in these pictures and in these cases the C2 pedicle screw also can sometimes be dangerous. So that for that also you should be able to do multiplanar reconstructions pre-operatively on CT scan to make sure that you have adequate room in, in that path of the screw. Uh, to uh, to place it safely without injuring the vertebral artery and many people think that the par screw is a safer screw but par screw is just a short transarticular screw so par screw is a safe screw as long as you stop short of the vertebral artery cave 
and if you stop short of the vertebral artery cave and don't reach un under the superior facet that screw is going to be uh, a 14 millimeter or a 12 mi millimeter screw which is a very weak and uh, small screw uh, so that's why more a preferred instrumentation if your pedicle screw is not possible is a laminar screw where invariably the c2 lamina is is thick enough to accept a good screw in this particular direction the course of the vertebral artery is important to understand we have already seen the v1 segment can have such anomalies such as high riding vertebral artery the v2 and v3 segment can also have anomalies like this and there is uh, an enormous variation here and it's important to recognize this because if you don't recognize this pre-op on a CT angiogram you can get into real trouble. So this is an example of a persistent first intersegmental artery where the artery is going underneath the arch of C1. Here you have a fenestrated VA where it is going below as well as above the C1 arch and here you have an anomalous origin of the pica where if you injure this artery underneath the C1 arch you can get a cerebellar infarct or a pica syndrome. In this case example here the surgeons recognized a persistent first intersegmental artery and have skipped the area completely uh, but this patient was not so lucky where they did not do a CT angiogram uh, pre-op and here you can notice that the foramen transverse area is very rudimentary and there is a deep notching here. This anomaly if you ever see on, on an axial cut you can imagine the vertebral artery is here and instead of going through the foramen transverse area is actually going inside uh, the C1 uh, ring rather than going through the foramen transverse area. So choose wisely some screws are risky with respect to the vertebral artery or anatomy some screws are safer and you have to know pre-operative planning on CT scans and sometimes we do get 3D printed models uh, to help us make this assessment. So thank you very much. Uh, so that was kind of an introductory talk. Uh, and uh, I think we will go to the next talk because these uh, topics which were raised in, in my talk are going to get repeated again and again. So all of you feel free to uh, ask questions at the end of each talk because uh, Dr. Balamurli has a flight to catch. We are going to upgrade him to uh, first class. So he's going to be uh, speaking on occipital cervical fixation. Over to you, Dr. Balamurli. And then we'll take questions for both of us at the end of this talk. Yeah. Uh, th thank you very much for the upgrade. And my sincere thanks to ASSI and Dr. Srivatsava for having invited me for this talk. So um, my, my talk has become a little bit more easier now that you've already seen the anatomy because uh, occipital cervical fixation technique is all about understanding the anatomy. And I'll give you some tips and pearls as to how we can uh, go about doing this. So the primary indications are usually an instability, which is either primary or secondary. Um, secondary is usually due to a decompression at the first and magnum and C1 and people do develop some problem with kyphosis at this level but most of the pathology is usually primary a congenital traumatic infection or uh, inflammatory uh, conditions like rheumatoid arthritis. So the preoperative planning as it was very beautifully explained is very very important to do a CT with an angiogram and an MRI scan and here it's very important because you want to look at what size of implant you want to use, what is the location of your implant what is the extent of decompression of the pathology that you're looking at? Whether you can put a screw in C1 or skip C1 and go to C2 um, because you have to connect the occipital to the spine. Uh, what is the thickness of the occipital bone and what is the anomalies as we have seen in the vertebral artery around C1, C2. So it's very important to do a preoperative planning. The next important thing is you're going to fix uh, uh, permanently the cranium to the spine and so here you also want to see is you know how is the patient going to be positioned so a plain x-ray a lateral x-ray involving the face and the the skull and the uh, spine is very important to know what is the normal uh, posture because the pathology would actually cause the patient to be in a, a slightly kyphotic position and if you are going to fuse the spine in that same position, you're going to run into problems. And neuromonitoring is not always necessary, but certain pathologies, you probably need neuromonitoring. So the cervical alignment is very important. We have to look at the correlation between the occiput C2 and C2, C3, the subaxial spine. So if you have an uh, occiput C2 kyphosis, would require a large amount of lordosis as a compensatory alignment. 
Uh, and excessive lordosis at the craniovertebral junction can lead to a reciprocal kyphosis. So understanding this is very important. And sometimes it comes with experience when you see the patient, when you position them in surgery, it's very important. So the technique, what we are going to see is we're going to look at the positioning. We're going to look at the exposure and the implants and, the, and all the various connections you're going to make and a few tips and pearls uh, and how to avoid certain complications. So if you look at the position, it's a prone position, a reverse Trendelenburg position where you want to avoid all the venous drainage um, and you have a slightly elevated head. Um, I definitely use Mayfield clamps uh, and weights and tractions are required in most cases because you want to do some kind of a reduction. And I use it routinely in my patients. Uh, some people do not use it routinely unless they have to do a reduction. Um, so it is it's very important to position the patient in a similar concord type of position where you've got a reverse Trendelenburg, your, your, your cranium is above the heart um, and you have also have the weights as you can see that the weights are positioned and you give access to your anesthetist in case they want to do anything and you also have to have the leverage to be able to lift the head uh, or change the position. Once you put the screws, the decompression, sometimes you want to do a slight extension or flexion. But ideally, you want to stand by the side of the patient, look from the side, look at the position, look at the gaze, um, and take an x-ray and look at all these things. So it's very, very important. And I think in, in the cadaveric course that we will try and explain this to you, how we do this. The exposure is very important. You do the exposure from the midline, um, in, in the midline from the external occipital protuberance down. As it was very beautifully explained, uh, you have to make sure that you don't go above the external occipital protuberance in your, your instrumentation because you will hit the transverse uh, sinus. Um, and then lower down, depending on what level and what pathology, you would do a uh, dissection. And this was also explained how you place your pedicle screws. So now once you've done... Uh, the, the way I do this is I first insert the, the cervical screws. Uh, so you can do it the other way around, but it's ideally first to do the uh, cervical uh, screws, whether you use lateral mass, C2 parts or C1, you insert all your cervical uh, screws because then you will be able to judge about how you want to place what type of an occipital plate you can use. There are different types of plates which are available and depending on how your screws are aligned and whether you're able to get this, you can decide on the plate. Whereas if you use the reverse, then you'll be stuck with less options. So the ideal place to put your occipital plate is you look at these lines. Um, the superior nuchal line and the inferior nuchal line would be your safe area. Uh, that the area three is where we marked it's got the thickest bone as was very beautifully shown with that light in the skull. It's got the thickest part and the safest part uh, where you can easily get an, uh, anything from a 10 to 12 millimeter screw. Um, so this was again very beautifully explained. I'll skip this slide. How we, when you look at the skull from inside, the midline ridge is very thick rather than the lateral portions. Um, and in adult males, it's anything from about 12 to 15 millimeters. And in women, it's about uh, 10 to 12 millimeters. And as it goes caudally down, uh, you will have it slightly getting thinner and thinner. But it's very important to a CT and look at the CT because you have so many variations in this. So when you're inserting your occipital screw, you actually go in first at 8 or 10 millimeters. I take usually 8 millimeters. I feel it. I probe it. And then I add another 2 millimeters and then another 2 millimeters to get a bicortical purchase because sometimes it's very easy to just get slipped and in the worst case you have an intracranial abnormality uh, then you don't want to take a chance uh, by inserting your uh, you know a 10 or a 12 millimeter straight away so it's better to go step by step um, and the fusion rates are much higher with a uh, plate system a plate and screw system than wiring but i do a lot of pediatric work and there you do not have systems and you have to rely on on wiring and in these cases you have to take extra caution about the fusion about what you get a nice fusion mass of a fibular graft or a cranial calvarial graft or whatever you use but you have to really depend on a lot of fusion so the types of screws are either occipital plates or you have a hinged rod which is integrated with the occipital plate or an Various eyelets where you can actually place the plate and then based on how it comes uh, after bending the rod, then you can place your screws in a later stage. So that is why I said it's very important to get the cervical um, screws first, then go to the occipital screws. So these slots are, um, you know, different companies, you know, every company has a different variation, but most of them have this variation where you have midline three screws. Sometimes you can get away with even two screws um, and then you have the slot which can be slightly moved. Uh, based on how you want to get your rod. 
Um, so this step is very important to understand before you open the set, you understand what type of an um, you know, occipital place. And usually every company has a few variations uh, available. So once you have that, um, as I had explained, you would then uh, start with an old. Now with a starter, you make an entry point and then I use a start with an eight millimeter. So you have a slot which goes in exactly into this with eight millimeters. Then you take a drill and, and with the drill, then uh, you, you pass the drill and you, you drill it down uh, to eight millimeters. Um, and then you feel, then you use a probe. Uh, the, the probe then allows you to have a depth gauge. You find out what is the depth. If you still can feel that you have not pierced through the inner cortex, uh, then you can uh, go ahead and then you can, uh, you know, add another two millimeters now and, and go for a bigger one. You have two screws. Usually all companies have two screws. One is a regular screw, one is a rescue screw. So first you use a normal screw, but in case you have to change or you're going to remove that screw and place another one for whatever reason, your plate is not sitting well, you're not happy, then go for a rescue screw. Make sure you have a good purchase. Because sometimes, you know, if you don't use a proper screw, the purchase is not good and the whole construct is going to fail. Um, then once you've done that, then you want to use um, some kind of an uh, um, <clears throat> contour, contouring. You want to use this to measure and have a template. You can either use a straight rod and you can bend it yourself. Or most companies, they come with uh, angled rods of various lengths on the cranial side and in the caudal side. Um, and then once you've done that, you place your plates um, and then following that you place this. And there's a very interesting system, which I've not come across, but I've just found this um, image from the internet uh, where you can actually slot it very nicely. But it, it is not very straightforward like this in real use because it just never usually falls in like that. You have to really contour it because we're dealing with not normal pathology. We're dealing with a pathological problem. Um, and, you know, it's very difficult to get these rods and plates in some cases. Um, it's very important to tighten uh, the entire screw system at the end. So after you've done all of these, make sure that your plate is retightened. Um, and once you fixed all the rods and screws, and this is how it looks at the end of the procedure, uh, where you have the plate and the rod system. Um, and, and this is a case that we have done. So a few tips and pearls. The screw insertion, if you get a CSF leak, it is okay to get a CSF leak. And sometimes some people say that it is better to get a CSF leak, but you don't have to wait for it. If it gets, just put the screw in. If it doesn't stop, put some bone wax. Usually it's never a problem. Um, also the fusion bed, before I insert the rod and before I put the entire system, I prepare the bed. Because once you put the rod, you cannot really prepare it well. So you prepare the bed after you put the occipital screw, um, and the rod so and make sure you use a lot of bone grub because one of the commonest reasons for failure at OC fusion is where you don't have a good fusion mass you, you cannot rely just on the head um, of the uh, of the construct um, few other points which were all mentioned vertebral artery taking care that your occipital probe does not go inside you can cause brain injury I've seen that uh, you I've seen hematomas positioning that if your muscle cover is not adequate, you can have an, um, you know, uh, implant dehiscence. You can, you can have it coming outside because the scalp sometimes in elderly is very, very thin and it becomes a very big nightmare to deal with this. And this patient, we actually had to go for a wiring technique and have to have a plastic surgeon do a graft because there was no way we we're going to get a plate. Uh, and at the same time, uh, you if you don't align your head as well, you will end up with a patient with the wrong alignment, uh, not able to see up or if you're, if you're flexing it too up, you cannot see it down. So these things are very important. And if you're not somebody done this routinely, uh, please do get help of seniors to learn all these little tips and tricks. So I think with that, uh, I will stop here. And thank you so much. And I think more of these things we can learn uh, in the actual cadaver time. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bala. Uh, that was an excellent talk. Very comprehensive. We can take questions for both of us uh, right now. So before we get started, I'd like to ask Dr. Bala a question. So you said about positioning, how it is important so that you don't avoid like too much flexion or too much extension of fixing the patient in an upward gaze or downwards. And the downwards sometimes is really a problem because you can get dysphagias and all. What are your ways of assessing it in draw? Like you have positioned the patient. Do you have some like radiographic way uh, that yes. you can measure that angle uh, or just you're eyeballing it. How do you do that? Yeah. So two ways of doing it. 
uh, one is once you come to a final position, uh, you want to make sure that your cervical spine is parallel to the ground. That is number one. So I just stay back about a couple of feet away from the patient and make sure that whatever position you put, you, you put uh, the, uh, the spine uh, parallel. And then you look at that your gaze, the patient's eye is looking straight down, perpendicular. So this is one way of eyeballing it from the side. Second is I take an x-ray. I take an x-ray again to look at the same thing. Uh, I look at, uh, you know, how the cervical spine um, and, the, uh, and, the, and the cranium is. So these are the two things. I do not use any measures, though they have been described. They, I, I don't know how practically useful it is. Um, but whatever it is, I make sure that the patient is not in an extended position. Because the extended position is much, much worse than even if you get a slightly kyphotic position. At least the patient can see down where he's walking. But I've seen patients come with an extended position where they it, it causes a lot of strain of the subaxial spine. So either neutral or slightly flexed is better than having it extended. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions for Dr. Bala before we move? So some people kind of judge the uh, distance between the posterior part of the jaw, mandible, and the cervical spine. Again, I'm not sure how practical that is because for the patient's mouth is open because of the endotracheal tube. So sometimes it's like difficult. But, you know, I have also found that when you kind of do that chin tuck position, that's not a good position to do occipital cervical because, you know, if you get a double chin on the side like that, and then you try to fix somebody in this position, the patient, I mean, I have had one patient getting dysphagia because of that, because, you know, right. you try to fix the patient like in a chin tuck position to make sure that you don't see a double chin, at least like that, when you are fixing these patients in OC fusion. So with that, we'll move on to the next talk. I'll invite Dr. Mihir Bapat. Uh, he is on the phone. I have his presentation. Uh, sir, can you switch on your... Yeah. So I'll play your presentation. We can't hear you. So Dr. Mee's talk is on uh, biomechanics of the C1, C2. The surgical biomechanics of the craniovertebral junction will be discussed under the following four headings the transverse ligament, the odentoid integrity, the C1-C2 articulation problems, and the vertebral artery anatomy. In an intact C1 ring, the transverse ligament that is attached to the tubercles of the C1 lateral masses holds the odentoid against the anterior arch of the C1. When the lateral masses are fractured and the, odent and the transverse ligament is disconnected, it creates an unstable atlantoaxial joint. However, in a three-part or a four-part Jefferson's fracture, where the lateral masses are intact and the transverse ligament is intact, these patients can be considered stable and can be managed with a soft cervical collar. When the transverse ligament is disconnected, the odontoid tends to shift posteriorly towards the posterior tip of the foramen magnum, resultant in increase in the atlantodense interval and the odontoid encroaches on the space available for the cord, often creating or mimicking a basilar invagination because the tip moves closer to the posterior edge of the foramen magnum. If the transverse ligament is lax, as in pediatric patients, the atlantodense interval can be stretched up to 7 millimeters. However, this can be considered normal. But these patients are more prone to rotatory subluxations, as is commonly seen in the pediatric age group. The lesions that destroy the craniovertebral junctions, like trauma, tumor, or infections, create more unstable situations because of total disintegration of the craniovertebral junction. In this particular patient, in the supine position, the atlantodense interval was fairly reduced. However, in flexion, there was an instability resulting in increased atlantodense interval and a posterior fusion was resorted to. In fractures of the odontoid, particularly the type 2 odontoid fractures, these occur at the base of the transverse ligament, which is also the watershed zone. The fractured fragment and the anterior C1 arch 
almost always move together in flexion and extension. However, if the transverse ligament is fractured or disconnected, then the fractured fragment can impinge on the space available for the cord, resulting in myelopathy. In this particular patient, the tip of the odontoid was malformed, called as the os odontoidium. The atlantodense interval was increased because of a ligamentous laxity, creating a myelopathy, and this required reduction and posterior stabilization. This particular gentleman had a fall from a height of about 20 feet, a non-union non of the odentoid, which was about more than 15 years old. However, the atlantodense interval was reducible and it could be realigned, including, including a posterior stabilization procedure. The C1 lateral mass, therefore, is a very solid column of bone that offers a very strong purchase for the screws and it is possible to realign the craniovertebral junction using the strong fixations on the C1 and the C2 pars or pedicle. It is often possible to use C1 reduction screws and actually translate the atlantodense interval into a reduced position using these reduction screws. The contraindications for a lateral mass fixation, obviously, therefore, therefore would be a dysmorphism of the C1 lateral mass or a destruction of the C1 lateral mass and an abnormal vertebral artery anatomy that precludes the positioning of the screws. If one C1 lateral mass is destroyed, the other C1 lateral mass is often a very strong purchase and a unilateral fixation with posterior wiring often suffices in, in conferring a sufficient stability to your craniovertebral junction. If the C1 spacer is destroyed, then the C2 tends to settle into that space and the dense migrate, migrates upwards, creating a basilar invagination in a vertical plane. The, the cranium then settles into a kyphosis and the dense then progressively gets retroverted, creating more and more impingement on the cervicomedullary junction. And therefore, as the craniovertebral kyphosis increases, the cervicomedullary junction, which is normally about 140 degrees, would become more and more acute. When it reduces more than 110 degrees, it creates a clinical setting for a myelopathy. So the inclination of the C1 over the C2 is the deciding factor and causes a significantly settled craniovertebral junction over the dense. The treatment protocols therefore have changed from a posterior decompression procedure and stabilization procedures or odontoid exigence and posterior stabilization procedures towards the realignment procedures such as the joint jamming technique, the DCER, the anterior release and the posterior reduction techniques. So in the joint jamming technique, the basic principle is to reduce the vertical component of the basilar invagination. The joint is therefore distracted. A spacer is inserted into the C1-C2 joint. The C1-C2 joint is then stabilized using a screw and a plate technique. So this vertical reduction causes a significant improvement in the cervicomedullary angle though it may not be a perfect reduction and the reversal of myelopathy was found to be significant by Goel et al. The horizontal component of myelopathy, that is the rotation of kyphosis, is however not sort of provided by this particular technique. In all his cases, Dr. Goel resected the C2 ganglion without any problems and a meticulous hemostasis is often required to expose the complete morphology of the C1-C2 joint. So in this particular case, a basilar invagination was reduced, the joints were distracted, spacers were introduced in the joint, and a craniovertebral fixation posteriorly was enough to realign the joint using the joint jamming technique. However, there is no clear explanation as to how to put the screws when the C1 joint is almost vertical. 
the screws therefore tend to cross into the occipital cervical joints and can result in a little bit of neck pain this was explained by sarat et al by introducing the sagittal joint inclination angle when the joint is less than 100 degrees it is possible to do the joint jamming technique very easily between 100 and 160 degrees or more than 160 degrees the technique needs to be modified by rotating the cranium back into position and allowing a space for the introduction of the spacer so if it is less than 160 degrees you can use this particular thing by using a spacer between the cranium and the upward migration of the pars of the c2 and try to reduce the cranium over the joint the pseudo joint between the occiput and the c2 and this will give you a rotation of the kyphosis as well as reduction of the vertical basilar invagination Wong et al. proposed that if you want to really reduce a kyphosis, then the anteriorly contracted soft tissues have to be released. And therefore, a transoral release or a retropharyngeal release will facilitate the ro rotation of the cranium by a posterior instrumentation technique. So in this particular case, with a severe basilar invagination, an anterior release was done and then a posterior instrumentation was used to realign the craniovertebral junction now the vertebral artery anatomy is the most important deciding factor in placement of uh, screws in the craniovertebral junction and one should always do a vertebral artery angiogram a ct angiogram before planning the surgery on the craniovertebral junction the zone 2 of the vertebral artery between the C1, C2, the zone 3 above the C1 are the two important considerations in the planning. In this particular case, you can see that there are various vertebral artery anatomies that can, uh, anomalies which can preclude the positioning of the screws. These anomalies are found in about 5% of all cases and one should be worried to avoid a vertebral artery injury particularly in patients with congenital anomalies occipitalized c1 arch and 100 percent variation in vertebral artery anatomy was observed however most variation was above the c1 arch and only about 15 cases were in between the c1 and the c2 joint so one should be very very careful in uh, analyzing the course of the vertebral artery now if the vertebral artery is high riding superiorly naturally the thickness of your pars which would adequately take a 3.5 or a 4 mm screw that funnel is reduced and therefore a short screw would be preferred so Use, use of navigations usually is useful in circumventing a few of these anatomical variations. However, because the anatomy is difficult, one still has to be very careful in trying to maneuver a screw around the vertebral artery. So, uh, if you have a medially encroaching vertebral artery, again, one has to be very careful in introducing a screw and you can use an additional fixation on the c3 if the c2 par screw is extremely short c2 laminar screws are also used as salvage screws but you require special connectors because they fall out of line from your c1 and the c3 screws so you can put your c2 laminar screws and get an extremely good purchase on your c2 thick lamina now, this 11-year-old child presented with multiple strokes, convulsions, and you could see multiple infarcts because of an unstable atlantoaxial joint and vertebral artery anomalies. There were various tributaries which were crossing the C1-C2 joint, and therefore, a separate C1-C2 fixation could not be used in these particular cases. Uh, the occipitalized C1 arch allowed us to use the cranium, reduce the C1-C2 joint and fix 
the occipital cervical joint in a realigned position. In this particular patient of ankylosing spondylitis with a very, very restricted mouth opening and obese guy, there was an atlantoaxial dislocation. Now, the biomechanical con considerations were not paid attention to. An occipital cervical fixation was done in an unreduced position, which fell off in six months. The kyphosis increased at the, as they had done a posterior arch excision and a foramen magnum widening. So the basilar invagination increased and the cranium settled into a kyphosis. The anatomy of the C2 parts was extremely dysplastic. The C, uh, the vertebral artery was high riding. And therefore, there was a very narrow zone which was available for the use of uh, maneuvering the C1 arch over the C2. Uh, a C1 C2 osteotomy was done and a, a posterior joint jamming technique was used to distract the C1 C2 joint to whatever best possible extent uh, it was possible. The uh, odentoid tip was moved into a favorable position and a very rigid fixation of the cranium to the uh, upper cervical spine was used with a good result. In difficult anatomy, a 3D reconstructed model often use, is often used to plan the fixation points to study the anatomy of the vertebral artery and to avoid catastrophes intraoperatively. Thank you. It is uh, thank, you have, thank you, um, thank yeah. you, Doctor Meer. Uh, those are very difficult cases. Uh, can you hear us, Doctor Meer? Yes, so I can if, hear you. If, if there are any questions, you uh, uh, delegates, you can put them in chat, and I can ask Doctor Meer. I'll ask uh, two questions. One uh, is, what according to you is the difference in the biomechanical strength of these different constructs, like say transarticular screw, C one C two harms uh, technique. Uh, versus, you know, using laminar screws and par screws, like uh, what is your preference in terms of the choice given to you, considering that, you know, all types of screws are possible in a person? Uh, Sitesh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Can you, you hear, can me? hear you? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think, I think the choice is between a uh, 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 harms kind of a fixation, C1, C2 lateral mass versus a transarticular screw. That is the debate in most of the cases. So, really speaking, the fusion rates, if you see in both both the cases, are almost equal, and uh, really doesn't make a difference whether you use a transarticular screw or a C1 C2 lateral mass. Transarticular screw is a technically demanding procedure, and it needs to be learned quite uh, correctly. Uh, C1 C2 lateral mass is also demanding, but at the same time, it's it's a relatively easier procedure to do. If you know the anatomy, and that is why uh, uh, the the whole trend is uh, sort of shifting towards a C1 C2 lateral mass fixation, because it offers you uh, sort of a better control over the C1 C2 lateral masses. So basically, you are trying to say both are equal, but the anatomical constraints and the technique determine which choice you make. Yes, yes. In 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 the C1 C2 junction, yes. So uh, this, the second question I have, I don't see any questions till then. I have another question, which is related to how the load gets transferred from the skull to the cervical spine. You know, we know that in the thoracolumbar area, you have the anterior column and the posterior column. Uh, but how does these, how does the biomechanics change at the craniovertebral area in terms of weight transmission? Let's say you have like say tuberculosis where your odontoid is destroyed, would you want to reconstruct it with a cage or something? How does the biomechanics uh, in terms of load transmission changes? Yeah, so I think I think um, odontoid is um, just a sort of a peg which controls the C1, C2 rotations. Apart from that, the main weight-bearing pillars are always the lateral masses. So you have the load shifting from the occipital condyles into the C1, C2 lateral masses and going downwards. So if you have really erosions or fractures of the odontoid, all you have got to do is uh, stabilize the lateral masses. And in most cases, 
most of these problems would come under control. So it is always the C1C2 joint, as Dr. Do Goel says, in most of his presentations. Thank you. And, Thank you, Dr. Mihir. Uh, and moreover, moreover, I will add, actually, in CVJ area, the load transmission, this is a Y-shaped beam. So the load transmission is from the skull to the condyle to the lateral mass, and then it converges to the C2 body lower down. So it is a Y-shaped beam. That's why the peg that is dense doesn't have much uh, of the weight bearing thing. It is for basically for the rotation. It has a uh, participation and it gives us, uh, you know, stability in a sagittal plane. So that's a very important point, uh, which uh, Dr. Mihir and Dr. SK make is that the reconstruction is directed towards the facet joints. And this is kind of a recurring theme that you will see uh, in the next two or three hours. So we'll move on to the next talk which is by our, our president-elect, Dr. Srivastav, and he's going to tell us about algorithmic approach to the management of craniovertebral disorder. So yeah, you I can share it. your screen. Yeah, I will share. This... Uh... Can you disclose this uh, chat box, please? Yeah. 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 So I'm going to talk on uh, algorithmic approach to management of CVJ disorder. This is not true. So what should be an approach to a, to a CVJ case? Beware about the CVJ unique anatomy and biomechanics. There may be different etiology. You have to identify them. You must do the thorough clinical assessment and do essential investigations. Now, the, regarding this treatment, uh, everything has not to be operated. It should be a specific pathology directed, like in a case of tubercular AAD. So medication is important thing. You optimize the patient and all these syndromic uh, patients also, they have a lot of compromise on their respiratory and cardiac reserve. So in that case, that is to be improved. Nutrition has to be improved. And then comes the local treatment. Local treatment, basically, you want to align the column. And this malalignment may be in different pl plane. It may be in sagittal plane in form of subluxation or dislocation. It may be rotatory subluxation. It may be in vertical plane, that is bacillary invagination. No, so you will just discuss that CVJ, a unique anatomy, it is a Y-shaped beam where the C1 works as a small bushing. We also discuss about the congenital anomaly in the uh, vertebral artery. The incidence is almost uh, 5% unilateral and 11% bilateral. This is, these structures uh, uh, can fail if uh, there is a pathology. Even if you operate, there may be alignment failure uh, there may be further neural compression and there may be deterioration. Now, see on the left side, this fixation was done, but you can see it has failed. It has come out because it has not united. In another right side, uh, uh, the case which has been uploaded here, though the fixation has been done, but the clivus canal angle is significantly reduced. So that should not be the proper alignment. And some of these patients, they might deteriorate and might not improve. So most of the time, proper alignment leads to neural decompression. Meticulous fusion in biomechanically aligned column gives a long-lasting fruitful outcome. These patients usually present with the pain, neurological deficit, or deformity. There may be mechanical compression. It may be osseous compression because of the anomalous bony mass. There will be neural compression because of the tonsillar radiation, syringobulbia, or mylia. Instability is the main cause of uh, deficit because we know this area is capacious. So instability usually leads to deficit and the, we can have congenital AAD, tuberculosis common in our country and that might represent with the uh, neurological deficit. There are changes in the vascular and CSF dynamic in these cases and one should be able to identify what is the cause of signs and symptoms on that particular patient. There may be various uh, pathologies. It may be grouped into two, congenital or acquired. The congenital, it may be uh, associated other congenital anomalies. So there may be osseous, neural, vascular, and there may be connective tissue disorder. There may be missing bone. There may be abnormal assimilation, and there may be neural compression because of these. 
in acquired pathology we can have tuberculosis or pyogenic infection tumor cases inflammatory cases the rheumatoid is common and it can lead to instability trauma to this area can also lead to instability and sometimes they non union and degenerative arthritis actually this has been actually now picked up very well and now people uh, have been picked up because of having degenerative arthritis in oc1 or c1c2 area and earlier they used to just complain of pain and people never paid any attention to that usually the people who are actually lifting heavy weight on their uh, skull so this also should be picked up so the neural compression and instability is the main problem in uh, cvj pathology the issues of implant purchase is always going to be there and one should learn it properly and uh, poor bone is there for the fusion there is a lot of mobility so one has to do the meticulous uh, uh, fusion uh, procedure there it is important to identify the cause pathogenesis and resultant effect now these patients they can have high cranial nerve involvement there may be difficulty in deglutition swallowing there may be numbness they might be coming with a little bit of the vision problem there may be poor balance difficulty in walking tightness in the limb and we should be able to uh, know these things whether it is related to our uh, proximal or high compression the signs are usually there may be changes in the facial feature in this congenital and syndroping child there may be low hairline associated with the visible limb anomaly other features of syndrome may be there there may be a change in the functional or change functional finding in the higher cranial nerve uh, involvement there may be wasting of the muscles there may be altered reflexes in a quiet condition there will be spasm it may be painful it may be tender and all these patients might have upper motor neuron signs now beware of the late presentation uh, we know there is a steel's rule of thought that tells that there is a significant space there so usually patient present late and uh, we should not miss the stigmata of uh, uh, finding of congenital anomaly like this there may be low hairline uh, and there may be some deformity in the uh, cervical area there may be mild torticollis and we should be able to uh, suspect that this patient is having uh, cvj pathology now investigation we should always do the plain x ray and in this open mouth view is important where you see the alignment of c1 and c2 here in this case you can see there is a widened distance between the dense and the lateral mass you always ask for dynamic view where you can see whether it is getting reduced or not so in this case you can see it is getting nicely aligned so it is a reducible ad even after surgery you want to check and you should check with this whether the in dynamic view it is stable or not and it is an important baseline investigation mri is going to tell you about the site and extent of the neural compression you must try to know what is the cervical mendoty angle in that specific case normal it is 135 to 175 it is reduced when there is a compression or when there is a mal alignment you must assess the vertebral arch so always try to see the axial cut of the cervical spine and those small foramen gives you an idea about the status of the vertebral artery the ct is an important tool where you can see the osseous anomaly you can also have an idea about the anchor point and in post operative cases you can get an idea about the healing of the fusion mass so these are the three important radiological parameter you must pay attention to the clivus canal angle cervical medullary angle and how is the lower down or subaxial cervical lordosis this patient he has a normal clivus canal angle but you see there is a reduced uh, you know cervical medullary uh, angle here you can see because there was a soft tissue compression now what should be the treatment algorithm so any case of ad we first try to position it and give traction and there may be two things now it is either reduced or not reduced if it is reduced we say it is reducible ad if not then we say we level it as a irreducible ad now in reducible ad if it is stable you go for philadelphia collar and put the patient either on collar or hello brace or corset and many a times it might uh, uh, you know uh, be become stable and follow up uh, thing you find it is it is remaining uh, stable but if it is unstable you go for posterior fixation and fusion you can do either c1 c2 fixation or occipital cervical fixation in that specific case 
Now, this irreducible AD wants to try to release it as we do in peripheral joint. If they didn't, uh, you know, uh, delay the, uh, you know, a case which has come to you, you want to reduce it, it is stiff, you release and then you try to reduce the joint. Similarly, we can do this here also. You can release the tight soft tissue and you can get a good alignment. Now, this release can be done anterior where you can release through the extrapharyngeal approach or transoral approach. Then you will be able to reduce it, then turn the patient prone and you can do posterior fixation and fusion. Many times now people have started doing from the posterior side. So you do the release from posterior where you release the joint and you can burn even the anomalous bone and then go for posterior fixation and fusion. You must be aware also about the previously thought process which the older surgeon used to do. They used to think that this is irreducible AAD and then they used to go and do the transoral or the entire excision. Or sometimes they started doing posterior fixation and decompression. They started doing the fora mag magnum widening and posterior arch excision of C1. And at second stage, they used to think whether there is an improvement or not. If there was no improvement, then you used to uh, think of doing the second stage odontoid excision. But nowadays, with this release, uh, everything is getting aligned nicely and uh, we are able to do it uh, very effectively. Now, this can treated with conservative treatment like tuberculosis is the commonest example. You can see there is AAD in this young girl and with the initial traction it has fallen into place very well and then later on she was treated with the uh, brace and you can see the late follow-up actually dynamic view it is absolutely stable and uh, this got healed very nicely. Now, this is another case where uh, there was AAD because of tuberculosis, a very unstable uh, case. And here, occipital cervical fixation and fusion has been done. You can see practically everything. There is a pus. C1 is significantly destroyed. So in such situation, you cannot have any purchase on C1. Sometimes even not in C2 also. So in that case, you have to go from occiput to lower down. Now, in this case, we have purchase over the C2 and occiput to lower down till C3 fixation and fusion has been done. You can see here the graft has been shaped nicely and it has been fused nicely so that it can have a long lasting result. Now here, if you see this case, there is a significant reduced uh, cervical medullary angle. There is a soft tissue material which is causing compression. So here when we open this case, there was significant amount of pus granulation tissue that we uh, took out and then this was uh, uh, this procedure of occipital cervical fixation with the heart seal rectangle and subnumbar uh, was passed and you can see opis amount of graft has been put here. So this step is important. You should meticulously fuse these patients. If there is a reducible AD, you can do the transarticular fixation. Now here in this case, apart from transarticular tissue fixation, I have also added galleys fixation. So this construct is very strong and, um, you know, graft is also stabilized in that position. If it is partially reducible, then you can pass C1, C2 separate screw and then you fuse this area. Now here you can see I had used the reduction screw. So it has been nicely aligned and it has been fused. In irreducible AD, now this case when it came to me, he was having only one finger uh, breath op opening of the mouth. So here extra pharyngeal, uh, you know, release was done and uh, always uh, because it is slightly tangential approach unless you take very high incision and uh, try to uh, protect the soft tissue. You can see here specifically I have bent the tip of the cautery, insulate this whole cautery length and then try to release. You have to just cut all the tight uh, soft tissue structure and you will be able to reduce it nicely. Now here you can see my periosteum is there between C1 and C2. And this has reached in, uh, in this area. It has been realigned nicely and it has been fixed and fused. You can see there is a significant improvement in the alignment and this patient improved neurologically. So I will conclude craniovertebral anomalies can be treated efficiently. Address the etiopathology. Try to achieve the normal CCA and CMA. Meticulous neural decompression and fusion in biomechanically aligned position usually gives a long-lasting fruitful result. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Yeah, Chitit. You are you are un, you have unmuted yourself.
Sitish, Sitish, you are not audible. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you can hear. Me. Yes, yes. Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, yes. I would like to welcome our uh, uh, invited guest faculty, Dr. Abumi. He is also joined. Good. Hello, yeah, sir. Yeah, Dr. Abumi. Uh, he's not. So, uh, I'll ask one question to Dr. Srivastava about, you know, how you make a decision. I always like struggle between making a choice when somebody requires an anterior release. Like uh, you have a patient who is, uh, say, maybe not fully reducible, somewhere in between, has a very high joint uh, inclination. Uh, how do you make an like an object? Do you have kind of an objective way of assessing whether okay I can do the DCER or a posterior joint distraction technique oh, and without without doing an anterior release? Yeah. So here basically uh, this anterior procedure is uh, actually I would say very small procedure. They have to release the thing. Even if you have to do something from behind, it is better to release the tight soft tissue structure anteriorly. So even if there is a mal-aligned joint, I will be going for anterior release. From anterior side also, you can burr that area. Okay, many a time, if you see in the CT, there is an abnormal bend, you know, that Dr. Meir had shown one of the, like a dense which was deformed. And you see when, even if you release and you try to bring it, that bony part will be coming in your way. In that case, you can, in fact, burr that bony part from front also. Now, only this regarding the issue of joint alignment, if it is a vertical joint, how we are going to do that. Try to release from anteriorly all soft tissue and then add further release from the posterior side. There, once you align it, means if you have created the flivus canal angle nicely, even in the that joint, oblique joint, if you partly fuse it also, this is, in, this is going to work out nicely. Once you've created the alignment, then there is nothing to there will not be so only i would i will say only three things in cbj one is the clivus canal angle another is the cervical medullary angle and third is your strong, sound strong future and this will survive so so it it just means that you would rather do an anterior release if you have a doubt is that what yeah. you are yes to? yes Yes. So, Dr. Sharad Chandra, do you have another take on, on this question that I asked? Like, would you always try to do everything posterior with the joint manipulation or add something from the front? Dr. Sharad, can you hear? Or maybe Dr. Abumi can take that question if he can. Dr. Abumi, can you hear? You have to unmute. Good question. The hot question again. So ba basically, the the issue of irreducibility. I know that you use very powerful instrumentation from the back to correct oh, okay. uh, uh, dislocations, uh, even if they are not moving that much. So what is uh, what do you rely on the most? Your implants and traction, or some kind of a release in the joints? We can reduce, we can get uh, some motion by the traction or extension of force. Maybe most of the cases we can reduce. But uh, if patient had uh, bony union, the anterior, maybe we need anterior release. But uh, I, have, I don't have uh, many cases, only very small case. So most of the case I can do most from, only from posterior. Only from posterior. And would you say the success of your posterior corrections is dependent on like I know that you put cervical pedicle screws also like in the C3 and all to get a better purchase to reduce how how much uh, importance would you give to that kind of fixation because you can generate a lot more forces that way he has to so, unmute Dr. So, Abhul, sorry, you have to unmute okay yeah. Both of the post, uh, the occipital bone and also the cervical spine. If we need, we can uh, increase the fixation number uh, down to C2, C, not, not only C2, C3, C4, like that. 
Uh, most of the cases you can reduce. But uh, completely, if patient has a completely bony union of the anterior, maybe we need anterior decompression or anterior release fastly. Okay. Thank you, okay. Doctor. Can I answer your question? So, yeah, yeah. Can can you what is your take on it, Dr. Rudrapa? I would like to know how, what you think about it. See, you know, considering the Atlanta axial dislocation, there is no word called irreducibility. There is some way we can always reduce it. The posterior procedures have a greater strength as of today compared to what we used to do anteriorly. So, the, for example, the case Professor Shivas showed, you know, I would have done three ways of doing it. One, during the position after the, uh, the anesthesia and the, uh, the muscle relaxant, use the Gardner Wells traction or the Sugita frame or a Mayfield, pull traction, give much more traction under the IONM or watching the pulse and extend the neck, it releases to a certain extent. Second, you know, when you go inside, once you release the muzzle, you attempt the same pulling once again. Third, when you open the joint, take out the cartilage and put the spacer with a long arm. Spacer means, you know, uh, the uh, when to measure the spacer, you have the long arm once, uh, which like a Wang technique, you can pull and open the joint completely. Keeping the spaces in, you can distract some more and extend the neck. Even with that, if it's not happening, then you can use the DCR technique. And with the use of these methods, the anterior procedure is most often not required because it is time consuming. At the same time, you're doing the single procedure as a double procedure. And as yeah. Professor Abumi said, unless there is an anterior calcification or fusion of the C1-C2 joint calcifications, which happens sometime, during that time, it will not distract. There's the only way, only condition where you have to you know, open anteriorly. Thank, uh, thank you very much. It's a very interesting take. Uh, different takes on the same pathology. Uh, but uh, the principle remains the same that you want to align it uh, to the best possible way in correcting the kyphosis uh, and the cervicomedullary angle. There is another one question from the delegate about you know traction to determine reducibility. Uh, how, what is your like sequence of doing it, Dr. Srivastava? Are you doing it uh, over days, hours? Uh, no. How do you decide the weight? Yeah, so actually this is over days. It is not in hours as we do in traumatic, uh, you know, subluxation or dislocation. So here you put the patient on uh, traction and uh, you see the alignment of uh, C1, C2 region. And initially, you you also try to judge how is the angle of your dance. If there is a basilar invagination, you will try to pull it straight and then try to keep in extension. Now, though it becomes a tedious job, but it is close observation is extremely important because you have to monitor the patient. In that case, apart from the neurological examination, you should also see the occiput. And usually uh, in KM hospital, we used to keep the patients on the you know, foam so that there's, there's no occipital sore because you increase the weight. So initially uh, we used to put, we used to start in such cases, a very stiff cases. We start with the five kg and then you gradually increase over the time. And you see if there is the associated basilar invasion, it starts coming down. And so this, you are correcting the vertical displacement. And for the sagittal correction, you try to extend the neck further so that you are able to align uh, in the sagittal pain. In that case, you can also take the help of putting a, uh, you know, a pillow beneath the shoulder of the patient, shoulder and the lower part of the cervical spine, and then try to extend the neck. Sometimes it is, if it is too tedious for the patient, in that case, you can discontinue and go for uh, the release state. But even if you have planned, you know, uh, uh, release or anything, it is always better to stretch these soft tissue. So traction is going to have a, a different role in this pathology, where when you are stretching it gradually in the ward, the, there is a time taken for this gradual, you know, elongation of these soft tissue, or there may be some release because of this traction also, the softer one, not the very rigid one. But uh, there is a role of traction. See, what happens in surgery, during surgery, when we do acutely, we release this thing. We don't know what is going to uh, happen to the vessels. Okay, we, are, we don't know what is going to the 
uh, going to happen to the neural structure. Though we are going to use the neuromonitor, but it is always advisable to put the patient on traction initially. So thank you, Dr. Srinivasan, about the traction. Uh, from traction, we'll move on to uh, the I next stop. Uh, you have a, uh, yeah, Shriji. Yes, sir. So, yeah, uh, go ahead. So good presentations by the uh, teachers. So I have a query. So when we put up a spacer to distract the joint, so in if we see in the hindsight, we are also distracting the vertebral artery. So how to determine the size of the spacer? Like preoperatively, we get to know, or we put as a you know based on some calculations, we put the spacer size because we have to keep in mind that we are stretching the vertebral artery also, and most of the time they are anomalous. So how to correlate because there are incidences of vertebral artery injuries when you put up a spacer to distract the joint. So what is the consensus on that, sir? I would like to ask the, uh, the teacher. So I, I'll put that question to Dr. Uh, Rudrappa. Sir? Uh, see, strictly speaking, normally the course which vertebral artery takes, vertebral artery is not anomalous here. See, it's a misnomer, anomalous. It is a abnormal course it takes because of the bony and soft tissue pathology. So strictly speaking, if you see embryologically, the missing cells of the, you know, the uh, vessels forms earlier than the missing tissues of the soft tissue and the bony uh, uh, components. So the, if you see any origin of the, any organism, the blood vessels are usually will have a course and it takes abnormal course because the bone anomaly creates a secondary angulation here. So spacer length does not matter for the stretching of the vertebral arteries. Rarely ever. I have done, you know, significant amount of the CVJ. I have never had any problem related to vertebral artery. And nowadays I use the Doppler in every patient of the, every variety of the angulation of the CVJ. And I have now spacer up to 7 and 8 mm is also available. You know, till recently only 6 mm was available. Even up to 7 mm when I put, there is absolutely no change of pattern of the vertebral artery involvement. So you don't have to worry because it has elasticity. Second, because the course of itself will allow it to expand up to 1 to 1.5 centimeter without any problem. Can, you, add, uh, can I add one uh, more point? Yeah. Now here yes. if you see the course of vertebral artery, they make a loop. So they have significant amount of laxity also Correct. You know, when it is uh, uh, in, during its course. So I think this problem uh, one is not going to face. See, if disaster has to happen, it can happen anyway. But uh, I think this is uh, not going to happen, putting the spacer and vertebral. Unless you put the spacer very near to the vertebral artery and you are almost right. impinging, that might be the separate issue altogether. So okay, sir. thank you very thank much you. for want of time. We'll move on to the next talk by Dr. Agnivesh Tiku, who is going to tell us about traction and how to put the various uh, tongs uh, and mayfields and halos with which we give traction and positioning. So over to you, Dr. Agnivesh. You can uh, share your screen. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you, Shitish sir. Srivastav sir, Mihir sir and Satish sir for giving me this opportunity. In the interest of time, I will be restricting my talk only to the application of the cervical traction apparatus. Is my screen visible? Yes. Okay. So, we all have different set of instruments available for cervical skeletal traction or what we call as skull traction. We know that the basis of all this was the old Crutchfield tong, which was used by W.G. Crutchfield. There are some reports that a neurosurgeon, Hepburn, used it in Edmonton in 1920s. What he did was the ice tongs. He made a modification of ice tongs that he used to put in skull. And since there was no ratchet mechanism to lock it, he used to use the inner tube of the cycle tire to closely tighten it and with that he gave traction and this experience was based on the victims of world war one even in crushfield's report it is at one point referred to as edmonton extension tongs but the main credit is by the uh, wg crutchfield who developed these tongs 
these tongs evolved over next few years to get to the current situation where we use this it's now a elongated tong and under local anesthesia pin sites are selected usually these uh, this point is in line with mastoid because this corresponds to the facetal facet joint and you can directly give traction to this area two points are selected 11 cm from vertex they should be around 2 to 3 cm above the pinna and below the equator of skull the outer table is drilled with a guarded drill bit so in adults it was 4 mm and in children it was a 3 mm drill bit which used to come and we had to give local anesthesia make a stab incision and then we would drill the outer table with this drill and we would then place the crutch field tongue in place. The modification or the next generation of crutch field was Gardner Wells tongs, where you did not need to do this exercise of drilling because they had self drilling pins and it was a self loading pin wherein the pin would show you the correct amount of force applied and you did not do that exercise of drilling the skull and sort of putting in the tongs. You could directly apply these tongs. Now, there are reports that with these tongs, you can apply up to 140 pounds of weight. But if we are referring it to CVJ junction, it may be much less than that. And usual limit for a cervical was also one third of the body weight. And eventually, you would place this set of tongs over a horseshoe or a similar apparatus. And you have this pulley where your traction rope would go and you could suspend the weights from there. We are now using more of Mayfield uh, or Doro clamps. They are respective trademarks of their respective companies. And they have slight uh, difference in alignments and all of that. But more or less, they work on the point of three-point fixation. There are a lot of modifications of these clamps, which are used for skull surgeries. But for cervical, this three-point fixation is good. I have prepared a small video of how do we apply these tongs. So once the points are selected, we apply a tinge of betadine around it and we place a uh, mupinase ointment on the tip of the tongs. We have to avoid the temporal area because that is thin bone and the tong should be freely, this uh, uh, clamp should be freely mobile over the face. It should not be impinging on the nose or forehead or anywhere. Once you have put this in place, you need to tighten the the screws. So this shows you about what amount of tension you are giving on the screws or weight you are applying, pressure you are applying to the screws. Usually the maximum is around 80 pounds. In osteoporotic bones, we tend to keep it less to around 60. So the markers on these pins, which you can see here, show you the amount of force which you are applied. And once you have positioned the patient, this is how the patient is positioned. The head is stable. You lock the body. And you ensure that you have adequate tension on the spring-loaded pin even after the positioning also. And then once you turn the patient, uh, one has to hold the uh, Mayfield clamp. Many people prefer to use the clamp here only and hold the face. But I prefer holding it. Your assistant will remove the locking pin. It has to be, there are three locking places and you have to remove them one after other. And then you will log roll the patient. It's preferable that the surgeon keeps on holding the head of the patient because he is in charge and he is in command. And slowly you turn the patient, taking care of all the wires, tubes and all. And once you have turned the patient, you again unlock the rotational lock of this clamp, which is here. So this is the rotational lock. So you remove it and then the clamp becomes free again. And then there is a pin which you pull and it unlocks the ratchet mechanism and you can remove the pins and you apply some antibiotic ointment on the pin holes. Halo is a much versatile where you get much more liberty of choosing your pins. The advantage is that this can be converted into a halo vest it can be applied preoperatively as a part of a halo gravity or a halo traction. And intraoperatively, you can continue doing your surgery in the same frame. And you can 
then post op convert it to hello so this is the hello which is made of a carbon fiber we have indian ones also which are made of steel they usually are uh, as a complete ring because this uh, you have to get more thickness to let it be that strong where it does not distract so this is how you place the hello on forehead your pin sites have to be above elbows and you target the lateral third area of the eyebrow because that is where your frontal sinus is not there your frontal sinus is medial and you have these uh, epitrochlear nerves which are going from the inner one third of the orbit going cranially so once you have done that so there are temporary pins over in this frame which you can see here so these are the temporary pins so you put these pins through here and you this frame then gets locked onto the skull and your hands are free you don't need any other thing to hold the frame thereafter before positioning you have to have something below the neck even a like a good saline bottle so your head is suspended or you can use a head ring also if your case allows so this is how the pins would lock the frame onto the skull Using a light torch, you mark the insertion points which you have already decided on the preoperative CT. And in adults, we use four points. In children, because their skull is weaker, you have to use more pins. So you may use six to eight pins there. And through the same hole, you give the local anesthesia on the pin spots where it is you are going to insert the pins. Then you need to make a stab incision at the same place. So this is the torque wrench driver which comes. This is prefixed for adults to 8 inches. There is a screw behind it. You can loosen this screw and this torque would reduce. So this is because these pins of this particular halo are sort of uh, self uh, sort of tightening and they are to be torqued. They are not very sharp pins which would go into the skull like other systems. So they get locked at a particular torque. So once you place the pins, you have to put them diagonally in a normal uh, hello, you would like to place them at around 2 o'clock, 8 o'clock and then 10 o'clock and 4 o'clock and tighten them diagonally like 2 o'clock and uh, 8 o'clock will be tightened together. And then once you have tightened the pin, you put this stopper or the lock over there. In other, in some hellos, it is recommended that you tighten the pins and inspect regularly. But in this or most of the newer systems you just tighten it on day one just see if it has become loose or anywhere and then you do not tighten them at all and once you have placed these pins on the skull you cover them with the protective caps so this doesn't interfere you remove these temporary stoppers which are there and you apply this cranial traction apparatus lock it with the lock it with the screws and then you can use a s pin with a suspended traction weight to control it. So this is a child whom we had operated. So this halo was put preoperatively as a part of traction. And then we did the anterior release and then continued traction and then posterior surgery in a second setting. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Agnivesh. Excellent talk with very good uh, video demonstration of uh, different ways in which we get traction. Uh, I would like to, uh, before we take questions for Dr. Agnivesh, I'd like to invite uh, our organizing secretary, Dr. Vishal Kudnani, who is here, uh, to welcome all of you, all the delegates for this uh, for this course. So over to you, Vishal. He's also the faculty after some time, but uh, he can join in here. Shitish, thank you so much. Uh, I take this opportunity very quickly to welcome all the lovely faculty members from across the country and abroad to come and join us for this and make this a possible session today, which is the part one of the cadaveric session. And uh, I take this opportunity to also welcome all the delegates. And I really wish you all have a wishful learning. A special welcome to Professor Abumi, who despite his health has taken out time and spare time on this odd hours also to join us. Dr. Satish Sudrapa from Bangalore. Welcome on behalf of ASICON 2024. Mind you, delegates, uh, this is not the only cervical or craniovertebral junction learning during the conference these few hours plus during the cadaveric workshop that you will see on the 21st in Somaya hospital there are so much that has gone in before this session also through the global sessions uh, which will be available very soon online to be to view 
the recorded version of this is also going to be sent back to you to the, through the links but during the conference asicon there are seven long hours of cranio vertebral junction learning more than what you are learning today there are hands on workshop on various instrumentation techniques of cv junction there are sessions on cv junction there are sessions on ai and there is lot of microscopic technique workshop that is going to be helpful in cervical surgeries to develop your skills so with this without much ado i take this opportunity to welcome you all again to the maximum city of mumbai and the maximum conference of asicon 2024 welcome guys and cheers good vishal okay. best of luck and you're doing a great job so thank you vishal uh, so let's take questions for dr agnivesh uh, in the meantime um, if there are any questions you can ask in chat or raise your hand uh, here uh, it's kind of a basic thing uh, to do tractions but uh, if you don't do that well uh, you can land up in serious problems uh, during surgery so one question for you dr agnivesh in which cases of cranial vertebral problems would you prefer a gardner well traction over a mayfield tongs or would your choice always be mayfield tongs because the face is free and all that advantages that come with it so uh, if if the traction is required only intraoperatively and the mayfield is not available then in that case i would prefer a gardner well tong otherwise in mostly in all cases i nowadays end up using the mayfield only because it's more controlled intraoperatively you can change the direction of the traction you can do slight uh, uh, reduction maneuver if you have to do it's much more controlled than a gardner well tong if mayfield is not available then only my uh, this thing would be for a gardner well tong second is that Uh, these Gardner well tongs they are not very comfortable for preoperative inward traction because nowadays most of the Gardner well tong you get their pins are slightly uh, uh, inclined backwards and that sort of creates a problem when if the uh, tong you have to slightly move it creates a scraping effect on the skull and it causes lot of pain as compared to the older Crutchfield tongs which we used in a, my PG days. their pins were vertical and 90 degrees so you could vertic virtually sort of move the tong as you would move a mayfield clamp and uh, that would uh, sort of uh, avoid that preoperative pain so to sort of uh, uh, make it concise if i do not have a mayfield then i would prefer a gardner wells tong only because it's much more safer you have three point fixation rather than a two point fixation of a gardner well rotation can be better controlled but if you don't have a mayfield then my option will only be a gardner so just a quick you said about traction and the amount of traction that we can give uh, you said one third of the body weight of the patient so let me quickly ask uh, the faculty who is there dr shrivastav dr satish dr abhumi uh, dr sachin is also here with us dr amit what is your like take on the maximum amount of traction that you would be able to give would that change uh, would that depend only on the body weight or would it matter would a pathology matter where certain pathologies you are very careful versus some you would kind of go to extreme lengths to put uh, the weight on dr satish first so dr satish sorry i just want to correct i said that yeah. in sir in cranio vertebral junction you will probably not be using that correct. much high my it. weight so it would depend upon the level also so just we are expanding the topic of how much weight is weight right, right. right about one third ballpark is what i would also use in most situations but um, just to make it a little bit more granular dr satish what is your take on how much traction can can the cranio vertebral junction tolerate so it, you know as you clearly mentioned it depends on whether we are using it for uh, congenital pathology or is it a trauma or an infection obviously trauma and infection requires a lesser weight where because there will be pathology already and the reduction becomes much more easier whereas in a congenital it requires a larger amount of the traction you know normally you know from the basic from our student time you know i studied at nimhans where we used to put the patient on traction for months together thinking that it will not it will reduce but however in the present day we use about you know uh, per vertebrae 
it is about uh, 2 kgs per vertebra in the cervical region and maximum we go to 17 kgs and we will wait only for about 24 hours to see any visible change in the radiology and if there is no change in the radiology nor any clinical improvement you know we usually discon discontinue because further usually it will not you know improve at all so on an average if you take 2 kg for the occiput 2 for the c1 2 kg for uh, cervicals and a c2 normally we start with 6 to 8 kg go maximum to about 17 kgs in an uh, i mean to say up to 18 to 20 years old people and in adult we can go another up to 24 kgs with for 24 hours if there is no change we discontinue it because there's such a discomfort to the patient as well as for unnecessary anticipation in supine position. So, Dr. Abumi, what is your take on, on this, on congenital uh, anomalies uh, of the craniovertebral junction, amount of traction that you can give, the weight of the traction? How do you decide that? I usually use the Mayfield tongue. Mayfield is much better than Gardner or the type of Gardner because it's a more controllable the direction with the, uh, uh, the traction. So much easier to control the direction of the, uh, the traction. And uh, I don't remember how much I applied the traction force. Usually up to 20 kilograms like that. Maybe I thought so, but, depend, uh, in the case of uh, the trauma, but uh, usually not so much. Maybe so, 20, on, on, on Mayfield, uh, on Mayfield, how do you judge the weight? How to depend on the pathology. In the case of uh, the pathology and the age and the osteoporotic uh, uh, stage, like that. So I cannot say the. Uh, Correctly, so maybe we have to consider many, many factors. Yeah. Mm. Thank, thank yeah. you, Dr. Abumi. Yeah, uh, yeah. Actually, this is an important question which you have asked, <clears throat> and there may be varied answer to this. Uh, what it has been already discussed, it depends upon the pathology. And this traction is actually, uh, uh, this uh, should remain with us. It should not be discarded. It is not only the skull, skull traction, you know, or is character traction. Sometimes we use surface traction also, like sire traction. If you see the patient has a spasm, significant tenderness in TB spine, in that case, we just put sire traction and patient gets relief. And even there is an improvement of the alignment because you are not going to, uh, you know, have a, a significant weight in those patients. So surface traction plus skeletal traction. Skeletal traction, according to the pathology, you have to decide. Like, you know, it, it has been mentioned in the literature in uh, neglected uh, dislocations of the cervical spine. I'm talking about even the subaxial cervical spine. Significant amount of the weight has been put in neglected dislocation and there's nothing has happened because all these traction are the awake traction. Okay. So, so weight is according to the pathology and obviously as uh, uh, Dr. Satish mentioned, in congenital variety, you require more uh, amount of weight and Almost 10 to 20 kg, anything can be required and doesn't cause any problem. Unless your pin start coming out. So that is important. Your hold of the pin is extremely important. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today, we're going to discuss high cervical approach and how this approach gives you access to the cranial vertebral junction and how this approach serves as a substitute for a transoral approach, which was the conventional approach used initially. It's very important to understand the detailed anatomy of the cranial vertebral junction area because there are vital structures like subhandle gland, hypoglossal nerve, which are the patient uh, artery and vein, which needs to be handled while dealing with this particular approach. So uh, we know there's a transpinoid approach, there's a transoral approach, and there's a conventional subaxial cervical spine approach. The transnasal approach gives predominant access to the sphenoid. The transoral approach gives you direct access to the area of interest, that is a CVG junction. And the conventional trans cervical approach gives you access to the predominantly subaxial spine. And this approach we are all familiar with. The problem with the transoral approach is that you have to violate the oral cavity, which leads to the contamination of the operative field. And if you're planning to use instrumentation, then there's a high risk of infection. On top of that, if you get a dural tear, then there's a high chance of getting a meningitis. 
So that is the disadvantage of transferal approach vis-a-vis -vis high cervical approach, which is extrapharyngeal. So it doesn't involve the violation of oropharynx. The common indications are the irreducible AAD, the neglected odontoid fractures, the osodontidium, and unfavorable anatomy because of vertebral artery. And we're going to see these all cases how this approach can be used in these all cases. This approach was de devised by the McNabb and it was later modified by McAfee. What this approach entails is the conventional, it's like similar, the positioning is similar to the anti cervical approach where you extend the neck with the interscapular pillow. The advantage of extension is the mandible goes away from the, uh, it's kind of retracted. You need to take an incision just to center below the mandible. Again, the common facial layers are involved. We usually tend to go medial to the carotid sheet. Uh, uh, there is another approach which is described lateral to the carotid sheet, but it doesn't give a good midline access and so it's not very much commonly preferred. This approach gives you directly access, so I'm going to describe the atromedial approach. The structure which I encounter a platysma, uh, the sternocleidomastoid, uh, the submandible gland, uh, and we're going to see how these uh, structures are retracted. This is how the incisions are placed just below the two center, below the mandible. And uh, this is the interoperative field. This is the medial retractor. This is the lateral uh, mustard being placed. Uh, this is uh, the mandible. This is the caudal side. Once you take the incision, once you take down the platysma, you can see sternocleidomastoid mustard and submandible gland being exposed in the field. You need, may need to ligate a various vessel will come across and there's a, you need to have good dissection of the field so that the superior laryngeal nerve, which is responsible for high coordination as well as the proper deglutition is required because otherwise there's a high chance of aspiration because of anesthesia. Now the incision we already discussed, we need to cut open the platysma. Once you cut open the platysma, you will see the anterior border of the stenocleidomastoid mustard and the submandibular gland. It's important to retract the submandibular gland cephaloid so the facial artery and the vein is taken along with it. It also protects the marginal mandibular nerve branches which are also taken with this submandibular gland as you are working deep to the submandibular gland. Once you take the submandibular gland up, you get to see the digastric muscle with its sling. It's important to relieve this sling so the digastric muscle can be retracted cephaloid along with the hypoglossal nerve which is just below the digastric muscle. So once you take out the digastric muscle and hypoglossal nerve you get to go towards the uh, oropharynx and you can exploit the interval between the uh, carotid sheet and the oropharynx to approach the retropharyngeal space. This is how the cadaver diagram look, uh, the picture will look like. This is the digastric muscle belly which you can see here. Uh, it has been retracted cephaloidly. This is the hypoglossal now. This is the greater corner of hyoid. You can see the carotid vessel and its feeding branches, which could be a superior thyroid artery here. It's ascending pharyngeal artery. All these structures, uh, the vessels may need to ligate uh, sometime because they come in the field. The hypoglossal now is usually retracted cephaloid and you access the retropharyngeal space. This is an interoperative video and these are the various structures which are at the risk of uh, getting injury when you are approaching this area. So for uh, understanding the orientation, this is the mandible, so this is the cephalid part, this is the caudal part, this mustard is placed medially, this mustard is placed laterally. So you can see uh, that this is the uh, incision is taken just below the mandible to separator. You can see that the submandible gland is exposed after cutting open the platysma. It's important to create a good subplatysmal pouch to get a good exposure. Once you expose the sub, uh, the, uh, the submandible gland, you can retract the submandible gland upward so that the the marginal mandibular branches, the facial arteries, and the main neurovascular is retracted upwards along with it. Once you retract that, you can see the digastric muscle belly just it went, uh, under the retractor and he's retracting the pharyngeal wall. And this is how the retropharyngeal axis is made. This became easy because this was already dissected in my area. This is the cord, uh, this is the digastric muscle belly. Again, you can see that. And there's a stress token which you can see uh, just beneath it. This is the hypoglossal now. Again, uh, it will be seen. So this is the carotid artery along with its pulsation, which you can be visualized. This is the cord-like structure, which you can see just next to the arrow is the hypoglossal nerve. This is the anterior border of the cerebral and this is the retropharyngeal space. This is how we approach. There is another axis where you dissect a structure to the greater corner of hyoid and open, enter the superior constrictor muscle and go inside. This avoids the high structures at the wrist, but this, this gives a limited access, so not much preferred. Now, a few examples. This is a neglected old odontoid fracture, three month old patient presented very late. It was irreducible. We did a high cervical approach. This is a medial retractor, retracting the, uh, the pharynx. 
this is retaining the submandibular gland and the glossopharyngeal now uh, sorry the hypoglossal now and this retaining the carotid sheet and the uh, the stapedo mustard along with it this is the c1 arch we have cut upon the longus goli the anterolateral ligament exactly just below the c1 arch this is the odontoid which is seen just below the arch entire fibrosis was excised you can get a very good access to the uh, 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 odontoid by the, the, this access uh, and you can very well do the anterior release through this particular approach uh, you can see that the uh, periosteum being come easily moved across and this is the odontoid which is easily movable with this particular approach once you do a thorough release so you can get a very good visualization with this particular uh, approach if you do the uh, release thoroughly and this is what was done once we did a release uh, we uh, reduced the odontoid back to its position and fused from the back side another case 45 year old female with a significant uh, basilar invagination severe myelopathy non ambulatory you can see the basilar invagination mri showed a classical triad of basilar invagination syrinx formation arnold carey malformation the vertical facet which makes it difficult to access this area from the back side unfavorable anatomy in the form of first persistent intersegmental artery so it becomes very difficult to enter into these joints to reduce the basilar invagination without risking the vertebral artery so uh, we decided to go from the front this is the anterior again extrapharyngeal approach we are exposed uh, this is retracting the medial side this is retracting the carotid vessel and stern to the stud and lateral side and this long retractor is retracting the submandible line once you retract it it doesn't come you can see that the uh, serial dilators are passed we have passed the cages on the both side of the uh, odontoid this gets the whole odontoid down and you give a stability to the craniovertebral junction after doing a thorough release uh, this is the port of CT scan which shows the C1-C2 cage being placed and occipital cervical fusion being done. This is the post-operative CT which shows that the reduction and restoration of the CVG anatomy. Uh, this is the follow-up. The graft takes very well placed. You get a good stability. The whole uh, uh, etiology stops. You don't see a uh, Arnold Chiari or a syrinx. We are not done any decompression, neither for having magnetic decompression. Everything settled on its own moment. You give good stability to the craniovertebral junction complex. Uh, and patient could restore his, her movements completely back and myelopathy recovered. Another case, uh, high cervical uh, lordosis because of CVJ kyphosis, severe myelopathy. Patient had a gait disturbance, could not walk. It required a support. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the CT scan shows the there is a large osodontidium and it becomes very difficult to correct this retroodontide tail when there is an odontide and takes its place. So we need to excise the odontide which take, uh, uh, occupies the space where the odontide should be coming down. Unfavorable anatomy, again, notable artery coming in the way of instrumentation. Uh, so we decided to go from the front and uh, try to get this odontoid down and relieve this decompression. Uh, so we decided to go from the front. This is the interoperative video. Again, retracting the oropharynx subandrial gland. This is the C1 arch. Uh, we have cut upon the, all the tether structure which are forming uh, the anterior part. The longus coli muscle belly can be seen uh, there after cutting the, this thing. The odontoid was harvested after taking the odontoid, uh, the osodontidium was harvested after taking out the C1 arch in the midline. Uh, this is the interoperative video. Again, you can see the C1 arch has been burned in the midline. This is the C2 lateral mass. We have released all the adhesions around that particular area. We did a posterior occipital cervical fusion. The lordosis was restored. We put a graft from the backside. Uh, this is the anatomy which has been recovered. You can see the anterior C1 arch which is being burned in the midline. The graft is being placed. Uh, this is the post-op, uh, the pre-op and post-op CT scan. You can see the CVG anatomy restored. Clavis canal angle is restored. And this particular technique also helped us in devising our own technique of placing a cage and giving a stability to the CVG junction, which decreases the risk of uh, neurological deterioration while turning the patient prone position. Thank you for your patient listening. So uh, we'll move on to the next session and I'll hand over the proceedings to the next moderator, Dr. Manish Kothari. We'll, uh, Dr. Manish. Uh... Thank you, Shitesh. Uh, fantastic yes. this, uh, session. Uh, may I call upon, uh, I think all the panelists are here, Dr. Vishal, Dr. Satish, sir, uh, uh, Ajay, sir, and Sachin, Dr. Sachin. All, Dr. Ajay is yet to join, I guess. Uh, so we'll, uh, we are going to talk about the CV Junction instrumentation. It's uh, going to be an exciting session. Uh, can we first start uh, with Dr. Satish, sir? Sir, can you hear me? Sir, we can't hear you. 
Can you hear me? We can hear you now, yes. Can you see my slides? Yes, sir. Okay. Excellent. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for the ASSI for this opportunity. Uh, today, I will be speaking on C1 lateral mass screw technique. Uh, Kshitish has made my life easier because he has given a beautiful anatomical description, but I will repeat the same thing as he mentioned that we had to tell the anatomy before doing this. Okay. So the objective of this is to see the atlas anatomy, dissection related problems, and various entry points and the pitfalls. So as he mentioned, if you look at the anatomy of the atlas, the anterior posterior, the length of the C1 lateral mass is about 13 to 15 millimeter. The medial lateral is about 4 to 4.5 millimeter and cephalocaudal is about 4.73 millimeter. This shows that there's enough space to you know, put enough screw, even up to four millimeter screw can be inserted easily. Only thing is it is medial you know, laterally is angulated and your angulation should be looked in in a particular way that either you keep dead straight or medially to 10 degrees. The only thing you have to look at the vertebral artery position and the height of the posterior arch of the groove of the vertebral artery is when it is less than four millimeter, it'll know, four millimeter, then slightly it becomes difficult to insert this groove. The anterior relation of the C1 lateral mass is also very important. As Kshitis was mentioning, you know, if you see go death straight or slightly laterally, it will, you will hit the internal carotid artery and hypoglossal nerve. And this is the commonest thing. And usually this hypoglossal nerve problem, you will not anticipate immediately. The three to four months later, patient comes with a history of difficulty in swallowing. And also they will say that one side tongue is wasted and they will have a slurring of speech. So be aware of this hypoglossal nerve. So the challenges of the exposure, you know, for the C1 lateral mass screw is, you know, exposure related are upper border of the C1 arch, be careful with the vertebral artery. And C1, C2 Atlanta axial membrane is the, you know, use the cob to retract the muzzle, which reduces the venous plexus rupture when you are exposing. Don't use the cautery at all in these things. Venous bleeding is very crucial to expose the C1 lateral mass because there is a rich Batson fluxus. And when you're di dissecting, dissect it from medial to lateral angle. I'll show the video how to do it. And beware of vertebral artery injury, which can happen at the superior part of the C1 lateral mass, uh, the arch, or when you're exposing the lateral to C1 lateral mass between C1, C2 joint. And when you're creating the pilot hole, Avoid, you know, make sure when you, if there's a venous bleed or vertebral artery injury, if you keep a plug of uh, surgical or the gel foam or a muscle patch, it comes in your way and it can create more problem because it can get stuck in your the drill. So as far as possible, more cleaner you do the procedure without any hemostat, easier to drill the C1 lateral mass. So I will show you one by one here. <clears throat> So if you see here, I'm exposing the first, you know, the uh, the first video on the left side. When you are exposing, the, you can see the venous plexus. I'm using the monopolar. The I'm going more lateral to the left side. I'm using the heat of the monopolar, not touching the monopolar tip. So important here when you're dissecting any of the muscle tissue, this is a minimally invasive technique. You can clearly see there is a soft tissue component between every muscle and the bone in the periosteum. Do not use the tip to touch the bone or a periosteum. Go between the plane of the loose area of tissue. And in this, you can clearly see the venous plexus here, which is getting exposed without any problem. Dissection and use the cob to push it. So that's the first step of preventing the bleeding. The next step of the preventing bleeding is, you know, in, uh, identify the midline. There's a C2 arch and the midline you have to identify. There's a loose areolar tissue and between the loose areolar tissue and the dura, coagulate the venous plexus from medial to lateral and use the sharp scissors under microscope to cut it so that the whole exposure becomes met very meticulous and you will not have any problem of the venous plexus so that you need not, sorry. <clears throat> So, so you will not have any problem. You can hear, clearly see I'm dissecting using the, the hook 
to between the venous plexus and the dura there so that the bleeding becomes minimal you know whenever you're exposing and go up to laterally superior and inferior part of the venous plexus has to be coagulated and cut it to identify the joint and the joint will be exposed much more easily in such a way so here once you come to the lateral part you can clearly see i am exposing the joint surface the joint surface will be exposed and without any venous bleeding up to here i have not used any surgical or gel foam and use only dissector cob and monopolar and the bipolar arteries and using the plane between the loose area tissue and venous plexus to expose the whole point and once you do that sometime when you're dissecting the c2 ganglion you know you use once again the monopolar to cut it and sometime when you use that you had to go to the lateral part and when you're doing the medial part between the pars and the dura the venous bleeding happens in these patients so that venous bleeding can be controlled once again see here the venous bleeding happens from the medial you know angle of the joint and that one will be done with the bipolar cortex so from my perspective whole cv junction can be exposed without venous bleeding as long as you know the loose area tissue and how to expose it uh, the vertebral artery he has already mentioned you know the persistent first intersegmental artery has to be looked in if you don't look into that the pica you know the coagulation becomes abnormal and patient can have post operative cerebellar infarct or lateral metallic syndrome extra cranial pica origin also should be looked in and fenestration within the c1 arch has to be looked into these patients so you have to be very careful to see the anomalous artery for example sorry for the you know video is not here in this patient i'm using the doppler in fact the vertebral artery is within the joint i have cut the c2 ganglion here the joint is completely exposed when i am going medially there was the vertebral artery and unless use the doppler you cannot make out and the, if you use the monopolar you can injure that so you have to be extremely careful whenever you are doing this and the kshitish also mentioned about three ways of entering the c1 lateral mass the conventional method is to enter the lateral mass either with cutting the ganglion or without you know cutting the ganglion in a in a goel harms technique we cut the ganglion in a patients we you know harms technique where we use the lateral mass with the screws we need not cut it because the the rod will come above the ganglion whereas in case of the goel technique the plate sits on the ganglion and post operatively patient can have c2 neuralgia for that sake we had to cut it and also cutting the ganglion gives a panoramic view of the joint and it becomes much more easier for you the second technique is a posterior arch screw technique whenever there is a you know the lateral mass inferior part is not visible you can go through the lateral you know the c1 arch that is the second technique the third technique is a notching technique of lee and rue i will show each one of them in a goel technique the posterior surface the posterior surface of the lateral mass has to be looked in and put the screw 15 degree medial and 30 degree cephalot and in harms technique no need of angulation you can go dead straight and in hue technique once again a medial angle of 20 degree will be taken into consideration so the here you can see when you are not cutting the ganglion you know you can clearly see here the patient left side is the cranial end the right side is the leg end medially you can see the dura laterally c2 ganglion and c2 nerve root so what i am doing is taking the periosteum from the the uh, the c1 inferior arch inferior arch and pushing it down till i expose the joint and i have placed the retractor into the joint the uh, and then i am drilling using a 2 mm burr at the c1 lateral mass which is inferior to the joint on the superior to the on the superior to the c1 arch you can see venous plexus with vertebral artery and this is an angulation medially i am making an angle which is about 10 degree medial and 15 degree superior so that's how you can preserve this you know without cutting the ganglion you can see here double confirm the angle with the c arm so in case when there is ganglion excision is very easy you know i have exposed the complete ganglion cut the ganglion and you will have a complete panoramic view this is the joint and that is the hole you can create and without any problem look at the whole view here absolutely there is no venous bleeding at all and i have kept the whole area with no you know hemostat which will be much more useful in the posterior arch in tank technique 
if the you know you will be passing through the lateral mass the blunt dissection with a pen field should be done vertebral artery has to be pushed away and to be located always because ponticulus you know posterior has to be looked in and entry is you know zero degree medial and five degree cephalot and disadvantage if the vertebral artery is within the vicinity it will be dangerous and you will be clueless about the angulation of the c1 screw and venous bleeding is slightly higher in this because you will not be doing the depth in which you are passing through the C1 lateral, you know, C1 arch and ponticulus, if it is there, is disastrous. And always beware of the ponticulus. You know, it is very, very important to use the Doppler. In this patient, I'm using the Doppler. You can clearly hear the, in the noise of the vertebral artery when using the intraoperative Doppler. I use in every patient, whether I do this preoperative CT angio or not, I use the vertebral artery even in the normal anatomy and abnormal anatomy so that I'll get very good view of the vertebral artery and its position. So the notch technique is the lead technique where the notching is done on the undersurface of the posterior arch. Done in case of the posterior arch when it's overhanging the lower one third of the lateral mass. And it prevents C2 nerve irritation when you do that, especially when you use the goal plating. And once again, either you can use the 10 degree medial and 5 to 10 degree cephalad direction. <clears throat> the take home message is the conventional method is the paramount way for the lateral mass screw fixation. The key is in the dissection and controlling the venous bleeding and use always the, the soft tissue and the loose area tissue between the muscle layer and the venous plexus and between the venous plexus and the dura, there is a loose area tissue that there you have to enter from medial to laterally to coagulate the venous plexus. Consider the vertebral artery anomalies in all cases, irrespective of you have done angio or not. Slow meticulous surgery and the microscopic surgery and exposure is paramount in these things rather than doing, you know, directly with the naked exposure. It will be very cumbersome when you use the naked uh, eye. And do not use the, any hemostatic in and around the area of entry of the screw so that, you know, your drill use become much more useful. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, sir, for the excellent uh, talk. Uh, you actually highlighted the most important part was, uh, one was the beautiful exposure that you ex uh, uh, demonstrated. Holding the uh, venous bleeding prevention is better than actually trying to uh, uh, achieve hemostasis. And that was the most important part uh, uh, that you highlighted. Uh, most of us, uh, in fact, uh, the uh, in the preoperative planning, uh, preoperative CT angio is the most uh, has to be done for all these cases. As you uh, rightly pointed out, the first uh, intersegmental artery, persistent one, can be right under the C1 arch, right at the entry of the uh, uh, C1 lateral mass. So if you miss that, it's going to be a disaster. Sir, have you encountered any of these cases? Uh, yeah, yeah. Sir? Of course, yes. You know, the, you know, uh, I have so far I have injured eight patients with vertebral artery in my life. So right. you know, twice with uh, the drill, thrice with the monopolar, and two times when you are putting the transarticular screw fixation. Uh, luckily, I could get away with all these patients by two things: one, in a transarticular screw, I have inserted the screw and did a conventional angiogram post-operatively and at the end of three months to rule out AV fistulas or a pseudo aneurysm formation in these patients. But uh, the patients where I use the monopolar cutting is the worst thing because when you use the monopolar and the vertebral artery injures, the edge become rugged. And even if you re-suture, it will thrombos. I had a, an osteoblastoma one patient where I used the monopolar because I couldn't uh, identify the vertebral artery, which was uh, inside the uh, tumor itself. And I restitched it under microscope using 10 ohm monocryl uh, ethylon, but still I couldn't, you know, post operatively it was completely thrombosed. Luckily, the opposite side was taking over as a young patient, and all eight patients are surviving today. Nobody had, the, you know, any posterior circulation infarct. Luckily, the cross circulation in all these patients through PCOM, the anterior carotid and the vertebral circulation is very good because the brain is an important structure. Nature also has given enough support to this. But beware, when it happens in elderly people, it will be always dangerous. Do not do on the opposite side in an elderly patient. In a young patient, it will be very good because of the cross circulation. Correct, sir. Uh, if you are not able to pass a C1 lateral mass or 
uh, based on your pre-op planning? What are your parameters where you think that C1 lateral mass screw is going to be difficult? And how do you uh, prepare for that? So the only condition where the C1 lateral mass cannot be done in you know, is uh, patients with rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylosis, or a trauma. Otherwise, the C1 lateral mass is a much more a better done anatomical structure. Even, you know, rarely it will be congenitally absent, you know, except in some patients where you find the torticollis with the absence of lateral mass, where the occipital condyle can be utilized as a C1 lateral mass to you. It will get exposed as soon as the ganglion is removed. Occipital condyle come into picture, you can utilize that. Whereas in a patient with the trauma, infection, and a tumor, uh, and rheumatoid arthritis and ankylosing spondylosis, you cannot, you know, sometimes it will be involved, the end plates will be involved, it will be too small, at that time is the only condition I use the occipital condyle or occipital, occiput C2 uh, fixation, otherwise most often you will get the C1 lateral mass, at least one you, side you will get it. Thank you sir, thank you for the beautiful uh, videos that you demonstrated, really enjoyed watching it. Uh, may I have next speaker Dr. Amit Sharma? Uh, he's going to talk about C2 pars, pedicle, and laminar screws. Thank you, Manish. Uh, yeah. Let's continue. I, I had a question, Manish, if you don't mind, uh, yeah. with Dr. Udrapa. Can I, can I ask now? Please go ahead. Please go ahead. So, uh, like in some cases of uh, significant uh, non reducible AD, uh -huh. where the C1 is kind of you know, tilted to the front, and uh, oh, okay. how do you angle for the C1? Like, you know, uh, especially the uh, supra inferior angle. Correct. Correct. You know, these are the slightly challenging cases because uh, here three things you have to do. One, preoperative CT scan to identify the size of the lateral mass of the C1. Whenever you see in these kind of patient, the anterior part of the C1 will be bigger. The posterior part will be narrower. Very, very important. Second, you know, the entry point will be so narrow between the occiput and this, you had to cut the ganglion in this patient and enter and do not burr more than two millimeter. At that point, you put your K wire, take a C arm picture or use the navigation to see which direction you have to do because literally you're going inferiorly. When you're going inferiorly, the occipital uh, squama come in your view and you cannot you know, enter that angle. So unless you jack the space, do not enter the complete bicortical purchase of the C1 arch, the C1 lateral mass in these patients. Uh, and, and you have to jack it or use the wrong technique where the spacer with a long arm, we pull the occiput backwards and then insert the C1 lateral mass. And also use the preoperative 3D uh, model, models so that you will understand the anatomy very well in these patients, especially in spondyloptosis patients. Okay. Entry has to, you have to meticulously think which angle you have to put it. Otherwise, occiput comes in your view. Otherwise, you'll rupture through the lateral mass. Then your anchor will be lost. And in spondyl optosis, putting the C1 lateral mass screw is most important than the occipital stabilization or C2. Your reduction becomes much more easier. Thank you. Very much. Put, sir. Uh, uh, Dr. Amit, may I proceed with your talk? Yes, I'll proceed. So, uh, Dr. Udrapa spoke about C1. I'll be talking about C2. Uh, now, C2 being the most robust cervical vertebra, uh, it gives you a good uh, holding point for even for occipital cervical or C1, C2 construct. And uh, in case of posterior cervical subaxial instrumentation, it will give you a good uh, construct, you know, uh, to have your upper end of the instrument. So, in the past, I used to like do C3 to C5 lateral mass and C7 pedicle screw, but now I've stopped doing that and Majority of the time, I'll be going to the C2 to have that, you know, strong end-to-end -end construct with the C2 and C7 particle screw and uh, C4 and 5 uh, uh, lateral mass screw. So this is one of the, I think, most strongest uh, area where you can have a good hold of uh, of your implant. So looking at the anatomy of the C2, it has a it has a good body. There are big pedicles. There are thick lamina. Issue is that uh, there is a foramen transfer versorium on the lateral side from which the vertebral artery will uh, pass and uh, it will have all it can have all the anomalies which we have discussed already so you have to be careful now as a principle where wherever there is bone we can pass a screw and we would like to pass a screw with the maximum diameter and maximum length to have the strongest hold so uh, with that principle in mind we have three main areas of uh, passing the screws in the c2 so we can pass a 
स्पार्स क्रू वी कैन पास ए पेडिकल स्क्रू और वी कैन पास ए लेमिनर और ट्रांस लेमिनर स्क्रू एंड दिस इज हाउ दे विल लुक सो पार्स क्रू इज मोर और लेस गोइंग एंटीरियर टू पोस्टीरियर posterior to anterior rather the pedicle screw will be going uh, medial directed and uh, laminar screw will be um, going uh, in the lamina so yeah on this another one so is c2 pedicle screw is my main uh, uh, work workhorse where which i would like to use most of the time so it can be used for a c1 c2 or occipital cervical fusion and as i told you like uh, i am using it more and more nowadays for uh, my posterior cervical instrumentation also in the subaxial area so if c2 pedicle screw entry point will be at the midpoint of uh, the intersection of the uh, pars uh, uh, the the facet of uh, c2 and c3 if you extend a line from the midpoint above toward the c1 c2 joint and is midpoint of the lamina of uh, c2 this cross section on the on the lateral mass of the c2 uh, so that uh, will give you the uh, uh, entry point you can go just a tad inferior lateral to it so you can have that uh, superior and medial angulation uh, and about 30 to 35 degree of medial as well as superior angulation is required to pass the screw you have to be careful about the vertebral artery and it is recommended that you need to have a pre op ct ngo in uh, all the cases beforehand now uh, even after the best of the precautions you can still uh, have vertebral artery injuries and uh, um, it is recommended that if you have one side of vertebral artery is affected then you better uh, um, instrument that side first so that you are not kind of you know like damaging the other side of vertebral artery and if one side of vertebral artery is affected uh, intraoperatively then uh, you uh, better uh, um, um, you know like uh, abandon the procedure and go to maybe a, a trans laminar screw now good thing about c2 pedicle screw is that they will give the strongest hold and because they are going medially uh, so to some extent they are kind of trying to uh, avoid the vertebral artery but still there are chances especially in case of uh, posterior uh, uh, notching and uh, very high riding vertebral artery where uh, the the diameter of the pedicle can be very narrow and uh, you can actually go in, in the uh, foramen transversorum C2 pars screw. So there are different versions of the C2 pars or isthmus screw in the literature. So whenever you are passing a screw in the in the lateral mass of the C2 and it is not in the pedicle, then you know like literature has kind of you know like uh, called it a C2 pars screw. So there are various ways by which you can pass a C2 pars screw. So the most common way is like entry point is in the middle of the lateral mass of the C2, and um, your angulation is straight to the front. Now as Shiti has said that. if you want to avoid going into the foramen uh, transversorum your length will not be more than 14 to 16 mm um, but there are different versions which go like cranially and to some extent medially also where you can pass a size 20 screw as well c2 pass screws give strong hold they can go straight in if they stay shorter they are very safe but again a pre op ct ngo is recommended and uh, uh, for me they are they are like you know not even second option they are the third option after the transaminous screw because i will not get that strong hold uh, in the pars screw as uh, it uh, i will be getting with a pedicle screw or a transaminous screw so you can have a what what they call is superior pars screw which is going uh, from the little superior entry point uh, straight in or you can have an inferior pars screw which is going you know like uh, from the little lower entry point but uh, directed little cranially and this is how they will look so superior pars screw has more probability of avoiding the vertebral artery but if you are putting the inferior pars screw then your screw length will be less because you don't want to enter the foramen c2 laminar screw can be utilized in it's mostly used as a bail out procedure when you are not able to pass uh, the pedicle screw uh, whether they are anatomically not suitable or intraoperatively you had some difficulty in passing the pedicle screw so they can be passed bilaterally uh like you know as a choice uh when the things are not uh, suitable to start with or they can be passed unilaterally when you have uh, you were not able to pass pedicle screw or pars screw on the uh, one side and uh, you can just utilize the thick lamina now the entry point is at the junction of the lamina and the spinous process uh, so now one thing is we have to be careful if you are passing two uh, laminar screw they have to be staggered so one entry point of one screw will be higher up compared to the other one because otherwise they are they'll uh, cross each other and because you if you start 
start from the left side, you are actually passing the uh, right side laminar screw and vice versa. So you have the entry point need to be staggered if you are uh, planning to pass two laminar screws. So they are mostly bailout option. However, the biomechanical strength is good enough to kind of, you know, uh, uh, justify their use uh, in cases of, uh, uh, especially in the occipital cervical uh, instrumentation. They have more failure in subaxial instrumentation, but for the occipital cervical or C1C2 fixation, I think they are good enough. Again, for them also pre-op CT is recommended and we can easily pass it. Most of the time it's recommended that you pass a 3.5 mm screw only to leave that one mm margin on each side in a 5 to 5.5 mm thick uh, lamina and a size 26 or so of a length screw can be passed easily. Now, the what you want is uh, with a screw that uh, it has to be uh, enough, it has to be having enough biomechanical strength, it has to be safe. So biomechanical strength by different literature says different things, but more or less the C2 laminar and C2 pedicle screws are having, uh, you know, like same hole in the bone. Uh, compared to that, C2 power screw will have lesser hold. Uh, but again, it's not about uh, the the hold which we are getting. A biomechanical superiority may not be transmitted into uh, translated into the clinical uh, advantage. As long as hold is good enough and you have done a good job with the fusion, uh, I think uh, the job is well done. Now, in terms of the accuracy, the translaminar screw because we are able to see them at least from the outside uh, and with the pedicle sound. Uh, I mean, with the sound technique where we are passing that uh, instrument to check the integrity of the lamina and passing a Woodson uh, elevator underneath the lamina to make sure that there is no internal breaches. The accuracy has come to around 95 to 100% for the translaminar screws. Power screw accuracy is little less than that, but and the pedicle screw falls somewhere in between. Now in one of the uh, article, it, interestingly, they have mentioned that uh, there was no difference in terms of the parse and pedicle screw between the navigated and non-navigated uh, uh, techniques. Now, in terms of the safety, the translaminar screws are safest because um, uh, their accuracy is good and they are far away from the vertebral artery. Uh, pedicle screw, their accuracy is good, but they can have a medial breach and can irritate the uh, spinal cord. However, as Dr. Shivasta mentioned that we have the canal in this area is quite capacious and actually I also had a case, a subaxial fixation, where uh, postoperatively I found that my screw was going intraoperatively, it had a good hold, but it was, you know, like a, it was a grade three breach, uh, which was uh, not detected intraoperatively, but because the hold was good and the other side hold was uh, normal. So I kind of, you know, and patient did not have any post-op neuro deficit. I kind of just sat on it and uh, it turned out to be well at the end. Uh, power screws can injure the vertebral artery if they are too long and if, especially in, a, in an inferior power screw where uh, you are kind of directed toward the foramen transpersorium. Now C2 laminar screw, can have cortical breaches. They cannot be used. Uh, I mean, obviously, if you had to do a laminectomy procedure on the C2, and many times because they are not in the line, you have to use a connector to connect it with the rest of the instrumentation. So that's one of the problem which we face with the C2 laminar screw. C2 power screw strength is mediocre, and they can penetrate the vertebral foramen. So that's their peculiar problem. The C2 pedicle screw can have a medial or lateral breach, and you know, like uh, now in this particular article, the vertebral artery injury incidence is four to six percent, but I think it all depends on how meticulous you are during the surgery and uh, uh, how much pre-op workup you have done to avoid any kind of disaster. As Shiti has shown this picture, the safety kind of increases as you go away from that, uh, uh, you know, like transarticular screw toward the laminar screw. But again, it's uh, all about what, which procedure you are more comfortable with and uh, which kind of anatomy is uh, available for that particular patient to have the best instrumentation. A pre-op CT and UH must for all the cases. A significant percentage of the pedicle screw especially may not be suitable. Breaches are common, but a grade one or uh, 2A or 2B breach is not uh, you know, like um, a disaster and you can still get away with them. But neurological injuries are rare as I told you in my case where the, even with the grade three breach, uh, things were okay. And last but not the least, it's the fusion which will save you because the aim of the implant is just to hold the spine till the time fusion takes place. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amit, for this wonderful talk. Uh, just for the preoperative planning, so I always use the uh, CD of the, the CT scan, the ILOC on the system. I never use the plates to kind of uh, take measurements or decide 
what screw I'm going to use. Uh, you kind of realign the images as per your trajectory of the screw, especially the pass is slightly medial, so is the uh, pedicle. And the level where the vertebral artery comes in for your pedicle screw uh, to determine the diameter of the uh, C2 pedicle, that also will depend on what uh, axial level you are taking it as. So how do you do it, uh, uh, Dr. Amit? You are absolutely correct. You know, CT is one investigation where I will ask the patient to always bring a CD from the imaging center. And I'll put that CD and nowadays I'm using Horos uh, software. So um, uh, as you said, you know, like we had to, the the technician from the CT center would have given the cuts as per their, you know, like uh, their liking. But we would like to have those cuts taken at our uh, uh, desirable plane. So I always uh, upload the CD in my uh, Horos software and take the cuts as, as, per, as per the, you know, like uh, uh, planning. So yes, always. And even like, uh, even for a post patient, sometimes, you know, like uh, I would like to have the CD to assess the fusion, whether it has taken place or not, whether the screws are in, because they don't know what we are looking for, the the radiologist most of the time, yeah. unless you, like, you know, specify it to them. So yes, we, we have to Agreed evaluate point. it. So uh, 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 model of the story is always have a, a thin cut CD uh, for your evaluating your CT scans, take the appropriate uh, images uh, to measure, make your measurements. Uh, moving on to next talk, we have Dr. Vishal uh, to demonstrate uh, minimally invasive C1, C2 transarticular screw. He's an expert on it. May I have Vishal? Dr. Vishal is here. Hi. Hey, yeah, I'm here. So I'll share my screen if permitted. Yes, please. Is my screen visible? Yeah, visible, Dr. Vishal. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So, transarticular screw, I think uh, it's one of the most enigmatic um, uh, implant fixation for craniovertebral junction. And uh, most of us have known transarticular screw for the bad name that it has earned over years because of the problems that some surgeons have faced in the form of vertebral artery injury or the technical difficulties that are accompanied with this particular technique. However, transarticular screw to me, I think, is one of the most safest, simplest, easiest way of fixing uh, atlantoaxial instability, particularly in patients with a broad parse of C2 and a reducible atlantoaxial instability, which is actually the case in more than 80% of cases of AI with cervical myelopathy due to CV junction instability. And that's why this surgery can now be performed within like 30 minutes and both the screws can in be there and the fusion rate and the benefits of transarticular screw are, are, are so easy that, I mean, they cannot be overemphasized than what they actually are. Uh, so atlantoaxial dislocation, we all know uh, the, the symptoms can be varied. It can be mechanical like it happens in more than 80% of patients. They don't actually have a neurological finding to present with. And many of them are actually asymptomatic. They would just turn up with a mild neck pain in subaxial region and on a radiological investigation that you find that there is a atlantoaxial instability. But it is very important to catch them very, very early in the course of problem to fix them early and to prevent catastrophic symptomatic myelopathic symptoms in these patients, which invariably are, are irreversible by the time they set in. And to manage them, there are various ways of, uh, of fixation, fixing them in, involving the Harms and Goals technique, wiring and various other techniques. Magrel Neo technique of transarticular screw fixation gained weightage in 1983s, uh, where it, it came into existence and it has shown to be promising results in fixing the C1, C2s. Every technique has its own pros and cons. However, transarticular screw, which initially was described with a bone graft being held with the wiring technique, had very, very high fusion rates. Of course, there were downsides of wire loosening and very difficult technical difficulties of during particularly cases with high riding vertebral arteries. However, over years, because of the simplicity and very high fusion rates, it has become the gold standard of C1-C2 fixation, particularly in a certain subset of patients where there is a reducible atlantoaxial instability, not only because of the high fusion rates, but also because it has achieved the most solid fixation in the CV junction, even better than the segmental C1-C2 fixation techniques that are described already. So what is transarticular screw fixation? It is basically a screw that goes from the C2 lamina through the C2 pars into the C1 lateral mass, fixing the joint in three-dimensional manner because of the obliquity of the screws that goes in there, not only giving a flexion extension related stability, which is absolute, but also the rotational stability achieved by transarticular screw is absolute and far superior than any other comparable fixation technique in C1, C2 area. And it also ensures because the joint 
is gone it, it is fixed in a oblique manner it also ensures 100 percent fusion rate in most studies including ours that we have published over over the years already now Transarticular screw is one implantation technique where the preoperative planning, I think 90% of surgery of transarticular screw happens even before the surgeon actually washes in. And it actually has only three basic phases. And if, if you have if you have gone through all these three phases, even before your surgery actually starts, you would have finished this surgery well in advance. And it involves feasibility, whether it is possible to do it or not, reducibility of C1C2, whether C1C2 is reducible or not. And then whether the trajectory has been planned or not. If these three things, you have studied your, uh, your images in great detail, they can be ensured that it is feasible, it is reducible, and the trajectory of the implant is positioning and the implant inventory is planned very well in advance. The surgery per se will become very easy to perform intraoperatively. And the planning actually starts by ruling out the contraindications. Most of the surgeons have actually faced technical difficulties when they have attempted transarticular screw in patients where it was actually contraindicated or it was not feasible to do. So you start with the first thing that whether it's a irreducible AAD or it's a reducible one. If it's irreducible, please take away. You cannot do it in irreducible ones. In mal united ones, again, you cannot do a transarticular screw. It has to be a reducible one. In high riding vertebral artery, it is recommended at least for the beginners, please don't attempt any case of transarticular screw in patients with high riding vertebral artery. And if you see that the parse through which the screw is going to go is less than 3 millimeters in diameter, you please do not attempt a transarticular screw because the, the thinnest screw that is available, cannulated one through pass through the parse currently in the market is of 3.2 millimeters diameter. So the minimum diameter of the parse required to accommodate that screw has to be about 3.2 millimeters in diameter there. Again, for the ideal trajectory, any thoracic or cervicothoracic hump will prevent or preclude the insertion in the in an ideal trajectory. And that's why a thoracic kyphosis to begin with, please do not attempt a transarticular screw. You are going to meet a disaster of getting the screw inferiorly placed into the vertebral artery transaction there. Once you are ruled out, again, this is something that we have published also that the MPD or the minimum pass diameter should be more than 3 millimeters if you want to have an intraosseous placement of the transarticular screw in there. It's imperative to have true AP and true lateral images uh, when you are doing a transarticular screw so that the two cortices of the parse are seen to understand whether it is. Done or should be done is a reducible atlanto axial dislocation with more than 3.5 millimeters of parse at the at the diameter intersection of the parse there these are the cases where a, a wonderful transarticular screw can be done during surgery you should also be able to see that the reducibility quotient has to be there and this usually happens with a military tuck position where the chin goes back the neck goes straight and this also reduces the thoracic hump which is positional in nature and this has to be replicated during the positioning of the patient in prone position now, when it comes to reducibility, we often say that, or we often feel, assume that Atlanto axial dislocation is irreducible. However, uh, till date, most, most pre-operatively seemingly irreducible ones can actually become a reducible Atlanto axial dislocation if you apply all these maneuvers there by either using a wire on the C1 and pulling it back or giving a traction pre-operatively or even a C2 push technique or by doing an intraoperative distraction using PUKKA. As you can see in all these images that the seemingly assumptive irreducible C1, C2 dislocations uh, actually were reducible ones. Uh, the moment you put the, these patients under GA and put them prone and do these maneuvers uh, intraoperatively, even before your incision comes, you can actually reduce most of them, if not all. So even before you just shove away that transarticular is not possible, please try and see if you can always keep transarticular in your, in your, in your inventory because this can actually save a OC fusion into a segmental C1, C2 fusion, preserving the OC joint for, for further mobility there. Now, once you reduce this, uh, transarticular screw is a CM guided image. All these maneuvers will help you to reduce them. And it has to be done under CM guidance all the times while every step of your intra osseous drilling is happening there. And as we mentioned at the parse diameter, there are uh, so classical magral neoclassification mentioned about a fixed entry point. Whereas the, the way we have 
have been doing it is that there is no fixed entry point. It is actually the entry point is the retrograde projection of the exit point. So for us, the exit point is fixed. We always aim that the tip of the screw, the exit point is in zone one and zone two, which is the upper anterior, upper part of the anterior arch of C1. This is the point where the tip of the transarticular should always reach. And then retrograde projection of this through the midpoint of the parts, wherever it falls on lamina becomes the entry point. And that's why it is a tailor-made entry point rather than a fixed entry point in inverse to the Magrel Neos uh, uh, description of the entry point. So the entry point is never fixed, but the exit point is always fixed so that you can get an ideal trajectory and avoid any vertebral artery uh, perforation in these patients. Coming to the draping part, we all know that it's a percutaneous screw. So the draping should be all the way from mid of occiput to the T3 level should always be seen so that your percutaneous implants can go because the percutaneous guide wires and the screws actually go from the T1 point or T T1 or T2 spinous process and that's why the draping should be wide enough there. I always do this procedure under microscope and the inventory involves keeping the smallest possible cannulated screw, even the Herbert screws. So we have been doing this for years now and now uh, with, with expertise over years and the learning curve, we have been able to do the same with the help of 2.5 millimeter Herbert screw also, particularly in pediatric and dysplastic parts, we have been able to do this. However, I would recommend that please don't do it in your initial first 50 cases. Try to do it only when all the contraindications have been ruled out in all patients. The incision is a midline incision based on the C2 spinous process. As we go through the surgery, surgical steps, we will see. That's the trajectory pre-operatively we have to see that the exit point is fixed and the entry point is always, always a tailor-made. The dorsal surface of the pass is laterally. And this is, the these are the points which we see intraoperatively on the screen. And come out in the center of the... So that's the surface anatomy, how the screw goes. The incision is placed on the center of the C2 spinous process. The exposure is limited only to the C2 lamina and C2 pars. I never, never expose the O and C1 junction to avoid inadvertent OC1 fusion and never expose the C2-3 joint there. The incision is hardly three centimeters and because it's under microscope, the space between the C1 and C2 has to be felt and the cautery has to be kept very, very cautiously used so that you don't puncture the C1, C2 membrane there and also the dura which is so superficially placed there. Cautery always runs on the bone and goes all the way from the C2 spinous process to the C2 lamina. Once the C2 lamina is seen, then a blunt dissection with the bovi using a patty is done to walk on the surface, dorsal most surface of the C2 pars all the way into the joint there. I think that's the only part of the surgery that you have to be really extremely cautious that your cautery should not really go laterally. Otherwise, the vertebral artery foramen is very near there. So it's blunt dissection. Always your bovi runs only on the bone and between the C1, C2 goes all the way lateral to the C2 ganglion there. You always walk on the C2 lamina with the help of your patty and bipolar cautery. And this patty walks on the dorsal surface of the C2 pars and you actually enter into the joint all the way there to see the joint there. Once you're seeing the joint, the whole pars, the dorsal surface of the pars is already seen. And in the C arm, you can actually, through the exit point that you wish to achieve and the dorsal surface of the pars, your screw can actually be walking right in, in front of your vision there. So that's the whole pars that is visualized there. And once you visualize the whole pars, the entry point obviously can be retrogradely projected where your entry point is going to be. So this is one of the most difficult cases. The pars diameter is only 2.8 millimeter. And yet we were able to achieve a fixation with transarticular screw there. Both sides. This is the very, very important step I recommend is that always walk on the pars, the dorsal surface of the pars with the help of patty and enter into the joint with the help of your McDonald's or a blunt a uh, pen field retractor there. And once you've seen the joint, it is right in front of you on the dorsal surface and you can actually walk working on the most dorsal aspect of the parts there and your guide wire can, can run through this. Once you've seen this, you can actually burr the, burr the joint surface out there even before your guide wire can go in there. I generally tend to curate out the cartilage there. And visualizing the parts and the joint is the most important aspect of this surgery. 
and all this happens under CRM guidance. My guide wires walk. The entry point is then bird. The incision is at T1 for the guide wire. The guide wires then walk through yeah, from the sure. entry point right in front of your vision. Yes, sir. Yeah. And guide wires through pocket yeah, incision. I, I will send you, send you just tell me you. The help of a sleeve. Please. Land on the entry point and the guide wires then under CM yeah. guidance. Just touching the most dorsal surface. Yeah. At all points, the guide wire is kept under control under CM guidance. I will, I will, I will tell you Chetik also to send you, okay? Don't worry. Sure. Sure. Yeah, yeah, already started. Okay, but you are in you are in the next session. So there is at all points you can actually see the guide wire is walking right in front of you. You can actually see the guide wire passing through from C1 uh, from C2 all the way into the C1. And once your guide wire is there, just tap it. It is just like passing in a DHS screw. Once the guide wire is in there, you tap. It's a cannulated hand drill. Make sure your guide wire is under control because sometimes the guide wire can just walk across and anteriorly go and touch the hypoglossal nerve there. And on this walks the C2 screw. And all this again, as I mentioned, it's a CRM guided procedure. At all times, it is under CM control so that the guide wire just walks at the most dorsal surface of the C2 right in front of your vision. The exit point as we have targeted in zone 1 and 2. And then the graft is inserted in the joint and on the posterior surface. I always use the aloe graft which is morselized and kept on the surface on lay graft. And people who doubt this, that whether fusion happens or not, our studies have shown 100% fusion rate. Some of the case examples, before I just finish there, traumatic non-union odontoid, again done with a pure C1, C2 transarticular screw without any wiring technique with morselized allograft. Avulsion chip fracture of the lateral mass with transverse ligament rupture, again managed by a transarticular screw. Another case of uh, road traffic accident with subtle transverse ligament ruptures resulting into a reducible C1, C2 dislocation managed by transarticular screw. Wonderful fusion mass seen in there. Uh, reverse oblique odontoid fractures in elderly patients. Uh, transarticular screw comes very handy and you see the fusion rates are almost 100%, particularly in comminuted osteoporotic fractures in elderly patients. C1, C2 tuberculosis, again, in these patients, if the lateral mass of C1 is intact, you can really depend on this technique and it fuses like fire. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, inflammatory arthritis. In kids also, we have used this and it has shown wonderful results out there without any problem. Even in dysplastic an anatomies, now we have been using it, even in pediatric challenges. And now to an extent that in dysplastic patients and in pediatric patients, uh, even a 2.9 millimeter pars can accommodate a Herbert's group 2.7 millimeter. Some case examples, even in high riding vertebral artery. And now we have been using OC fusion where the C2 becomes a solid construct, where the C2 screw is the end point of the cervical fixation in patients with syndromic, like in this particular case, where there's anomalous C2 with AAD and BI, which became, which so-called irreducible became a reducible one. And the, you can see the transarticular screw, which is a solid construct there, so as to avoid any need to go down to C3, 4, and 5. Some case examples, uh, very similar to syndromic lipal fields and Arnold Chiaris. Thank you, Dr. Vishal. I think we are running a bit late. Thank you. Uh, if you permit, we can we uh, go ahead with the next talk? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vishal. Uh, Dr. Sudhir, sir, uh, is going to talk about wiring techniques. Uh, with all the new instrumentation techniques, the wiring techniques are still going to be your salvage and they are an important part uh, of your knowledge uh, base uh, when you're tackling C1, C2. On to you, uh, sir, Shiva, sir, sir. Yeah, I will say. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Uh, so, as mentioned, uh, bone grafting uh, and wiring technique. I will just uh, short play. Just a minute. If this part is actually not coming, I will just hold on. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about this uh, fusion technique in this occipital cervical uh, region and what are the tips. We must uh, uh, be aware about the realities that uh, 
this area is extremely mobile region full of ligaments and there is a poor bridging bone and there is a shallow joint and uh, chances of delayed union and non-union and implant failure are common if you have not done this fusion uh, properly. Uh, we know that as far as the bed is concerned, the proximal bony bed is the occiput, which is a thick cortical bone, and we must bury it to make it good osteogenic bone. There should be a bridging graft. So there is a gap between occiput and C2 or occiput and C1, and we should try to bridge the graft. Then only this is going to unite. So these points are important and one should take into consideration. Now, just putting the graph or throwing the graph in that area is not going to uh, solve the purpose. Actually, the graph which you are putting there, that should be stable enough to bridge that area. So try to increase the, uh, you know, fixation to this graph to that area, whatever way you are trained in. Now, there are different, uh, uh, you know, uh, elements. Uh, osteogenic bed uh, it starts from the occipital area. And uh, you can see this is a cortical area and you have to convert by drilling or burying this area. So OC joint is the, another area where one uh, likes to put the graft if you want to restrict from occiput to C1. The posterior C1 arch you can use as a bed and then C1, C2 joint. Lamina and spinous process of uh, C2 is uh, another area which uh, function as a good osteogenic bed. The bone graft uh, fibula has been uh, used uh, since long from old days, almost 1920 it has been mentioned, but the non-union rate was very high, it was almost 40%. The triple wire method of Bowman has been nicely described, actually people started putting uh, bone cement to stabilize this uh, uh, thing so that uh, it unites. Now I'm going to show you the graft bed preparation of occipital region. Now here I have already done the occipital cervical fixation and you can see this whole central area I, I have burned. And now you have to save the graft in such a way that it bridges the area and it gives a good uh, stability to the graft. I'm just uh, running this video. We can't hear you, sir. Shivasta, sir, we cannot hear you. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you now, sir. So, from the beginning, you were able to hear me or not? Hello. We couldn't hear you for the last 30 seconds, sir. Okay, when this video is started? Uh, before that, sir. Okay, okay. Okay, take care. I will, I will. So let me go to first uh, thing. So I will start from here. Uh, yeah. This yeah. part? It is okay. Uh, this is covered, sir. No, just before the video, sir. Just yeah. before the video. Okay. This I had covered. Yes, only the probably the video. Okay. So this I was telling that uh, I have done this occipital cervical fixation. The occipital area I have made uh, uh, raw by burying. And I harvested the graph from the iliac crest. I usually give this inverted Y-shaped uh, uh, structure to the graph. And I'm going to make a drill hole. And two drill holes will be made. And this arm of this inverted Y will be sitting on the uh, spinous process of the C2. I have already put the cancellous bone uh, in this bed. And on the top of it, I'm going to put this inverted uh, uh, you know, Y-shaped graph. And I'm going to tie it. Now, this is not going to move. And... Uh, Union is uh, 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 very sure in uh, such situations. 
Now, in tuberculosis, uh, there is a significant uh, destruction of the lateral mass, and you are not able to put any implant there because it is almost loose. Nothing is going to hold there. So, in this case, uh, there were a lot of pus. I drilled through it, uh, and almost you can see the my uh, probe was going front. There was no bone there. So, in this case, again, uh, we have done this occipital cervical uh, fusion, and uh, this is uh, the implant which is hard sealed rectangle and sublaminar wire. So you can pass the wire from the occiput and then again, the answer is good bony fusion. You can see there is a bridging bone graft from occiput to the lower down and uh, add extra cancellous bone and this ensures fusion. Another case of pediatric occipital cervical area where tuberculosis was again the pathology and here you can see the bridging of this has been done with the same thing, heart seed rectangle, sublaminar wire type of thing and this wire, the cut end of the wire, I have bent on this strut graph so that you give extra stability to this graph. Uh, and uh, the fusion almost you ensure that this is going to fuse. And so this is a stable column. Another case, significant destruction, uh, no bony structure to hold in the C1 and part of C2 area. But I could manage to pass C2 uh, pedicular screw. And uh, this inverted shape, again, this graph, I have shaped according to the space available in the bed and added a uh, few extra cancellous chips. And uh, such, uh, uh, you know, fusion, meticulous fusion is important in such situations. Now, I'm going to show the how to make a bed in the C1 and C2 area when you want to uh, fuse C1 and C2 only. Don't disturb uh, occiput in that area. So, burying of this C1 can see the posterior arch and burying of the lamina and then harvesting the uh, autogenous graft from the hydric crest almost like a same shape I have given make two holes and then make a corresponding hole in the spinous process of C2 and pass that vicryl which you have already passed uh, through that uh, graft this is the way you should pass Another hole has been made which will be fixed in the C1 posterior arch and tighten this. You can see it is quite away from the occiput. Put additional cancellous chips. Now, wiring technique, uh, this galley's fixation uh, is an age-old technique where the wire is passed beneath the posterior arch of the C1. It is actually turned on this uh, C2 spinous process just underneath and then you put a graft and tighten over this. So, this wiring technique is important and one should learn it. The many a times if you are not able to uh, have a screw fixation because of so many regions, these are the bailout technique and one should be aware about this, one should learn this technique. This is the Brooks wiring where this wire is passed beneath the C1 uh, posterior arch and also the lamina of C2 and it is uh, passed both the sides, passed both the sides. So, this is rotationally more stable. And uh, you can put bone graft in between and you can uh, have a good fixation and fusion. Uh, this diagram I have taken from the old days uh, literature where this, uh, how this uh, graft, strut graft has been tied with the wire from occiput to lower down. So these techniques have been used earlier also. Now also, uh, you know, sometime if you are not able to manage to have fixation, this is the bailout technique and one should be aware about that. I have just taken a small uh, video clips. Uh, this is... Uh, for occiput, how to pass the wire in the occiput. So you make drill hole, two drill hole, and in the center part, your either rod and the heart shield rectangle arm is going to go. You give a specific curvature to the wire. So this stainless steel wire pulls, you can just cut one and give this bent. Now, giving this bent is important so that once you try to insert from one side, it, it gets delivered on its own with a gentle manipulation. So, that should be the same. 
and you insert from one side and then you can see here here you can you can use k wire tip or you can have a skin hook and just engage that and this is the way this menu maneuver is important you bring it and so it's gently it comes out you have not to push it so this has been passed now for uh, c1 and here actually i am going to show the galley's one on it. So clear the soft tissue, you have to go soft periosteal, make a space there and here you see the size of this loop is different from uh, occiput and it uh, gets delivered very nicely. Now here either you can pass this loop one beneath the uh, spinous process of C2 or some mo modification you can also do. Here what I am trying to do I am inserting those cut end and then I will be inserting beneath. Otherwise, when you wish to put this loop beneath the C2 spinous process, you have to cut the entire spinous ligament. But here, this can be inserted without doing this and then it make it twist. So, this is the modification of this uh, galley's fixation. Now, this is for C2. No, C1, yeah, this is for the C1 uh, posterior arch. So, the previous one was for galley, this is for posterior arch. And once you pass it, lock it there so that it doesn't move when you are doing the procedure on other side. Now this is for C2. You can see now there is a transverse uh, limb of this bend is different from the upper because that is the usual breadth of the C2 lamina. So clear that area and this pass it. Gently with the little gentle manipulation, you can elevate it again, lock it. So, these were the small clippings uh, which I wanted to show. Now, this is the last case which I wish to show you. Now, here the 70, seven years male, which we operated for this AAD, and uh, he was fine. This was our planning, and we did occipital cervical fixation and fusion. This was the child, he recovered neurologically. Uh, he had a fall and he again came back and see the prominence of the implant here, swelling. So, and he started developing neurological deficit. Uh, you can see the plate has come out and you can see the CT is just so much of the distance here. It has again uh, started having displacement. And so here again, the bailout technique is wiring. So, this part is away from uh, occiput. This screw I took out and then we made a hole in the occiput and we can put past the wire. So this was the planning. From one side, uh, the central hole, I passed the wire and another side, we pass the another uh, wire in the occiput. And uh, this is important, a simple instrument uh, which you require, you just require a needle holder and uh, stainless steel wire, you make a loop shaped and give a curvature in such a way that it gets released through that hole nicely. So you can see passing the wire from this, this part and this part, central part in the one side. So wire on the left side and the central part. And then you can see a lot of bone graft we put again. This is the way uh, it got aligned again. And you can see the wire passing to the occiput and he improved neurologically. So, <clears throat> I will conclude the proper fixation of the occipital cervical region, proper osteogenic bed preparation in occiput and atlanto axial region, laying down and stable bridging of good quality cancellous or cortico cancellous graft almost ensures sound occipital cervical fusion. I thank you very much for your kind attention. I will stop sharing.
Thank you, sir, uh, for the beautiful uh, demonstration. Uh, any questions uh, from any of the faculty? Uh, so you've uh, uh, very nicely uh, uh, explained that the preparation of the bed is the most important part of uh, uh, laying down the graph. You've shown how the edge shape, uh, the uh, the notch of the C2 is to be made. You drill the wires and you uh, secure the uh, graph with the help of the uh, wires also. So uh, any uh, difficulties you've had, sir, passing the occipital uh, uh, wires? No. Actually, how you bent the tip, you should suppose your uh, uh, two holes are quite apart. So you have to make a larger uh, uh, diameter, uh, you know, that bent. So according to the distance between two holes, you have to make that loop. And when you are making the loop, bend the wire just uh, three to four centimeters so that insertion also becomes very easy. Right, sir. So if there are two tables uh, in the, and there's a cancellous area in between, I'm assuming it is going to be very easy. But if the entire occiput area is a bit uh, cortical or sclerotic, so does that pose any question and or it does not matter? No, actually, good cortical uh, bone is at your advantage because you are you are making hole uh, through the both the tables. Okay, you are not making hole through one table, both the mm -hmm. tables. And so you, this fixation, see, in all uh, you know, this infective pathology, the posterior bone, the, the cortical bone is a good quality bone. And in fact, purchase of the implant on this good quality bone is better as compared to the screws. So it is a, actually it is not the uh, you know a screw which holds the bone. It is the bone which holds the screw. Rather, this wire na, it it holds the bone nicely. So I think cortical bone is a good quality bone and uh, the, it gives uh, better uh, and stable fixes. Right. Uh, we don't have. Uh, thank you, sir, uh, for that uh, excellent insight in occipital uh, cervical wiring. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, giving me this opportunity. So I'll be showing a few of uh, the videos of uh, cervical pedicle screw insertions in uh, the lower cervical spine. As we all know, uh, the most important uh, uh, measurements that are important for uh, putting a cervical pedicle screw in the lower cervical spine are uh, the transverse pedicle angles and the inner pedicle width. So the transverse pedicle angle uh, varies from around 46 degrees at C3 and uh, around uh, 43 degrees at C6, uh, decreases to around 36 degrees at C7. Similarly, the inner pedicle width uh, uh, is somewhere around 2.6 uh, mm in uh, C3, increases to around 2.9 mm in C6 and uh, to about 4.1 mm in C7. Um, I always uh, tell my residents to have a set of these uh, cadaveric uh, bones rather than uh, just the saw bone models. Here you can uh, know the int intricate uh, details of uh, the anatomy of the cervical pedicle. Also, I insist them to uh, actually backtrack uh, the trajectory of uh, each of uh, the pedicle screws on the lateral mass. Uh, an exercise uh, something like this uh, would be useful where uh, we can backtrack the ideal placement of uh, the uh, cervical pedicle screw. So we usually want to place it along the actual axis of the pedicle. So in the axial plane, it comes uh, to somewhere around that point on uh, the lateral mass. Uh, in, the, uh, trans in the sagittal plane, obviously it will be in the center and the intersection gives us the entry point there. So now this entry point is quite lateral on uh, uh, the lateral mass and uh, to put a screw at around 50 degrees uh, from here would be quite cumbersome requiring um, uh, separate stab insertion. So what uh, Professor Abumi has done is uh, he's lessened the uh, uh, transverse angulation. Uh, uh, so that uh, the entry point uh, comes a bit more medially there and uh, the angulation also decreases to around uh, 30 degrees. However, this angulation is uh, less than the actual pedicle angle. So there is a chance of the proximal medial cortex actually deflecting the screw laterally. So what we have done is we have uh, chosen a slightly more medial entry and uh, directly drill through the uh, proximal medial cortex so that the chances of lateral perforation uh, decreases a bit. So this is what uh, I was telling you about uh, the proximal medial cortex. Once uh, the pilot hole is made and even though it is intact, while you are putting the screw, the proximal medial cortex tends to push it and uh, uh, the lateral perforation uh, results. 
uh, whereas if you drill the proximal medial cortex and thin it out, you can easily put the screw into the body. So our entry point is somewhere uh, uh, just medial to that of uh, Professor Abumi, uh, just uh, one to two mm below the articular margin along the waist of uh, the lateral mass and at the uh, bisection of uh, the lateral mass. So we go at an angle of around uh, 30, 35 degrees. Uh, we usually use this matchstick bar. This is a diamond tip bar uh, with a reducible sleeve so that it gives around uh, uh, 25 to 26 mm of uh, length to directly go into the vertebral body through this uh, uh, drill. So this is one of our uh, initial videos where we used to uh, uh, put the screws before uh, laminectomy, especially in uh, patients who had uh, no altered uh, cervical anatomy like uh, young patients with trauma. Uh, here you can see that uh, the exposure is the most important thing uh, and uh, the placement of your uh, retractors that should not come in the way of uh, uh, the medial angulation of uh, your drill here. You can see that uh, the medial uh, cortex uh, bone dust is coming there. So you, you keep feeling the uh, bone there with uh, the um, drill and then uh, uh, with the feel of the bone, you uh, keep going in. So once you have crossed the uh, posterior wall of the body, that should be enough for uh, putting the screw. So we check that uh, with uh, the ballpoint tip and uh, as well as uh, with the C arm. And once we are satisfied, uh, use the uh, 3.5 mm uh, screw uh, insertion. So here you can see the angulation is again important. And if you start uh, feeling that uh, the hold of uh, the screw is decreasing after you have uh, gone through the pedicle, then the chances of lateral perforation are there. So it's important that you get a good hold uh, even while you are uh, completely inserting the screw till the base of it. Um, now, this is a case where uh, I just wanted to show you because uh, uh, we have done it after uh, doing the laminectomy. This is a trauma case again uh, where we have put a C5 to C7 uh, cervical medical screws. The positioning is uh, important. Uh, um, it's not necessary that uh, we have to position it in neutral position. If uh, the situation demands for decompression and uh, even for putting screws, you can position it uh, in the uh, flexion position and after the screws are put and decompression is done, while you are putting the rod, you can actually uh, bring the neck to the neutral position. Uh, this video, I just wanted to show you to know the importance of uh, the axial pressure we exert. Hey, here again, you can see the placement of the retractors. It doesn't uh, uh, come in the way of medial angulation. Now, this, this is a uh, trauma case where uh, the cervical spine is unstable. Now you can see the amount of axial pressure uh, uh, that is given for making a pilot hole. It is quite minimal with this uh, drilling technique and compare this to a, a axial pressure you would give uh, if you use a, uh, a pedicle owl or uh, some other blunt probe to get into the uh, vertebral body in the cervical spine. That That is uh, quite uh, a bit of pressure that will be there. So this is one important thing I wanted to make you understand. Now, in this case, uh, I'll be showing the C5 and C6 uh, pedicle screws. Uh, uh, this is a recording from uh, the uh, microscope here. This is the cranial end, this is the caudal end. You can uh, just see the C5 pedicle being angulated now. Uh, this is the uh, joint of C4, C5. You, you can palpate the cranial wall, the medial wall, and the inferior wall uh, once you have done a laminectomy. And just for uh, complete visualization here, we are just clearing the, uh, the medial aspect there. So once uh, you can feel the medial cortex, you can actually uh, know the angulation of uh, the pedicle as well. Uh, once we have cleared here, you can have a clear vision there. So you can see the medial wall there, the angulation here, and you can uh, do the backtracking of the trajectory you want. And it's not necessary that you see the whole anatomy here of the lateral mass, even if it is a degenerative one, it doesn't matter. You can easily go through the uh, lateral mass into the pedicle there. So this is almost like visual and uh, tactile uh, navigation that you can have. So once you are into the body and uh, you're happy with the, the hole there with the ball tip, so you can insert the screw there. So uh, the 
next video is uh, here uh, we had a lateral perforation you can carefully see how the paraspinal muscles uh, are pushing our drill there so if you see here yeah it's coming so the drill is getting straightened there you can appreciate that and we have a lateral perforation there we know that so once you have a lateral perforation uh, we keep this uh, uh, probe on the medial aspect of uh, the pedicle and then drill it uh, very close to that uh, to get into the body there so this gives us a good uh, medial angulation and once you are uh, again happy with the hole there you can start putting the screws there so you can uh, take the uh, cm either while you are uh, uh, drilling or uh, with the ball tip probe and then uh, obviously after place, placement of the screws uh, before you put in the rods there. Uh, this is the CT of post-operative CT of the same patient. You can see the reduction achieved. You can see that uh, the C5 uh, uh, pedicle screw is slightly lateral there. You can appreciate it in the x-rays also. Now, uh, the C6 left-sided screw, as uh, we were uh, noticing, we had a uh, lateral perforation. You can clearly see the track here. So we had gone into the vertebral foramen, you can clearly see here. So uh, thanks to our uh, diamond temper, it doesn't pull out uh, the soft tissue so that we did not have any uh, vertebral artery injury. So it is so easy to have a vertebral artery injury there. So the most important point uh, uh, we feel is uh, the countering of uh, the proximal medial cortex to prevent uh, the lateral perforation. So you can either do this uh, uh, by graded uh, taps there so that it thins out gradually and you can put the screw there. And also use uh, you know, sharp turrets which will uh, decrease the proximal medial cortex thickness and you can insert the screw quite well. Or use a uh, diamond dipper which will uh, decrease the uh, medial cortex there. The another uh, uh, technique is to use the cannulated screws where the K wire will prevent the lateral uh, deflection of uh, the screw while putting the screw there. So I think with this, um, I would uh, stop here. These are few of uh, the theories uh, if you want to read about our technique. And uh, obviously, like uh, I would again uh, thank the organizers for uh, giving me this opportunity. So, thank you. We don't have Dr. Upendra here today. Uh, we'll just take quick questions from the Master of Cervical Pedicle Screws, uh, Dr. Abumi. Uh, are you around? Abumi, sir. All right. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, I think we'll go ahead with the talk. Uh, next talk, we'll invite him again. <clears throat> Uh, so, uh, I'll be presenting on the uh, odontoid screw fixation, anterior odontoid screw fixation. So, anterior odontoid screw is a very elegant uh, technique. Uh, it uh, the, the prime uh, interest in the screw is uh, that it can uh, save uh, the movement at C1 and C2 joint. Uh, uh, but you have to be careful where you use it. So it was first described in uh, by Bolas in 1982. It provides immediate stabilization, direct osteosynthesis uh, instead of uh, you waiting for fusion and uh, a segmental fusion, and uh, also preserves the rotation of the, and movements of the atlanto axial joint. It is an anat anatomical synthesis. So before you uh, look at the screw, you have to obviously know the anatomy of the C2. So there is a watershed area between uh, the odontoid and the vertebral body. That's where uh, uh, somewhere in this area at the level of the uh, uh, articular facets. <clears throat> and uh, so uh, type two odontoid uh, type two uh, fractures are the one which are amenable for odontoid screws. Uh, now Gower uh, uh, described three different types uh, where. Uh, uh, you can use a uh, where you cannot use that uh, odontoid screw primarily because we were seeing some fail, uh, failure of the odontoid screws and that's when the classification came in. So there's a type A, uh, which is a horizontal one, a type B, which is a, a forward oblique one and a type C, which is a reverse oblique one. So if you just uh, kind of use uh, common sense, the type C is almost parallel to the trajectory of the odontoid screw and hence it should not be uh, used in a type C. It's a contraindication to use in a type C. It is safe to use in a type A and type B. Uh, so as I said, contraindications are in type C. 
uh, if there is a gross uh, uh, transverse atlantal ligament injury when there is going to be a delayed C1 and C2 instability, your od odontoid screw is not going to prevent that. It is just going to heal the C1 and C2. But having said that, to have a transverse atlantal ligament injury and odontoid uh, uh, fracture type 2 is very rare. Uh, uh, third uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, is the trajectory based, the technique based. If the patient is barrel chested, then you may not be able to get the trajectory required. We'll talk about it in the subsequent slides. If the bone is too osteoporotic or it is too sclerotic, they both may be a relative contraindications because you may or may not be able to achieve and drill it. So that will come to it later. If the bone defect is very large, generally you see large bone defect at the fracture defect. If uh, the uh, presentation of the patient is late, there is resorption of the bone and there is fibrous healing in that area that is going on. So if it is more than 3 mm add, or it is very old, then uh, you may not be able to achieve direct osteosynthesis, same principles as you would use uh, uh, in a, a long bone uh, fracture. So selection of implant, various types of screws are available. You can use partially threaded ones. Uh, you can use uh, the Herbert screws or you can use uh, differential, screw, differential thread screws also. Uh, having said that, you must keep a posterior C1, C2 uh, segmental instrumentation if in case you are not able to achieve a good reduction or a good fixation, you should be able to flip the patient and do a posterior C1, C2 fixation. Position is supine like in ACDF. Uh, head should be absolutely stable. You cannot afford to have the patient, uh, the head uh, turning side to side. Uh, I generally prefer a Mayfield clamp or you can also use uh, some form of tongs with, along with traction, just minimum traction to give the, uh, reduce the fracture and stabilize the head. Don't use too much weight if you're using traction. Uh, keep a gag in the mouth uh, <clears throat> to allow an open mouth view of the uh, Siam. And uh, many anesthetists for spine by default use these armor tubes. You see these, these are the armor tubes, there are rings uh, in them. Uh, the, please tell them before and not to use uh, the armor tubes <clears throat> because that will prevent your uh, AP imaging. Uh, so use a simple uh, tube or rarely you can also use a North Pole tube uh, which goes through the nose. <clears throat> so uh, this is, uh, uh, I'm looking at the trajectory now. So I've positioned the patient on, this is an, a case of an angst point. I've positioned the patient on Mayfield clamps. Uh, he also had a subaxial C45 dislocation. So this is what the uh, position that I achieved uh, with the neuro monitoring, he had deficit. And now I'm uh, trying to look at the trajectory. So you see that metal piece here. So that kind of gives me that the chest is not going to come in my way uh, of the trajectory because the instrumentations are long, the guide wires are long. You need a very long uh, uh, area above the chest up till the ziphy sternum, you should be able to uh, kind of uh, uh, get access uh, and have room for uh, your, uh, inst uh, your uh, instruments. So uh, next is you have to achieve reduction on the positioning itself. Do not uh, uh, wait. Uh, you cannot achieve reduction or it is difficult to achieve gross, uh, uh, reduce a gross uh, uh, displacement uh, uh, after while you're passing the screw. So all efforts should be made to reduce the screw on positioning itself and fix that position and make sure you strap the patient and it does not move. Some movements can happen. In this case, I was doing the case, there was some retro displacement of the uh, uh, odontoid, but if there are ways to manage it, we'll come with it later. Uh, well, with regards to the setup, uh, if you are a right-handed person, you use the right-sided approach. If you're a left-handed person, you use the left-sided approach, same for ACDF. Uh, I always use uh, two uh, C-arms, one for AP and one for lateral. I don't recommend doing this screw with a single CM, it's very tedious. Uh, I've never done it. I don't recommend uh, doing that also. Uh, in a lesser setup, you may uh, may want to attempt it, but it's, uh, I would rather not attempt it. <clears throat> so uh, the lateral image, if you see the uh, CM, this one is uh, tilted horizontally. It's not coming from below or above. It is tilted horizontally, and the CM is coming in this direction. And the AP image is uh, coming from the opposite side. So you are free completely on this side. Yeah, you may or may not be able to get the microscope in, so keep loops and uh, headlights uh, handy. Uh, <clears throat> but most of the uh, technique is actually under CM, so microscope is not of uh, major advantage here. <clears throat> Next, uh, <clears throat> once you get the trajectory, 
uh, you do a standard ACDF approach at around C4, C5 level, push the OMO higher down, you did not cut it because you're going cranial. Once you land on the C4, 5 disc, you just walk yourself up up to the C2, 3 disc. You see this right angle is a long uh, Langen back, long and a broad one that goes right and sits right up to uh, the C1 arch because you need to lift that re entire retropharynx uh, slightly upwards so your instruments can reach directly at the C2, 3 disc. Uh, you need to have a good, strong assistant to continuously maintain that. Uh, now, uh, regarding the entry point, uh, <clears throat> you can take either the anterior lift, which is just at the anterior uh, anterior inferior corner uh, of the C2. And there are other techniques uh, called as the end plate technique, which goes, burrs the disc about 2 or 3 mm and enters around 4 mm from inside the disc. If you see the C2 has um, a slight uh, lipping uh, at the anterior inferior border. So it does not uh, necessarily damage the C23 disc. And this also has been described uh, uh, in literature. Uh, why this has been described is because you get a more vertical, uh, you get a more vertical trajectory. Uh, if you take a very anterior uh, trajectory, then uh, uh, you may not end up at the tip of the odontoid. You may end up somewhere uh, at the posterior uh, cortex. <clears throat> Uh, regarding uh, the entry, so uh, you can nibble uh, the slight, uh, the anterior lip. It is safe to uh, nibble that part, or you can drill it as you want. And uh, there are, you can either use two screws of 3.5 mm, or you can use a single screw of 4 mm. Most of the Indian population, you can use a single 4 mm screw. It is difficult to have two uh, screws in most of the Indian uh, population. Uh, uh, accordingly, you uh, uh, kind of adjust your trajectory. If you're using two, then you use two parasitical entries. If you're using one, then you use a single midline entry and try to stay as straight as possible. So in this case, you get the trajectory. That's the entry point. You're uh, drilling that area and you're trying to enter the posterior corner of the dome of the, uh, the uh, superior part of the orontoid. Uh, now, uh, next is the sagittal plane, as we said, you are trying to aim into the posterior half of the uh, uh, tip of the odontoid and uh, you try to get a bicortical purchase. Now, this part in the elderly is going to be uh, sometimes very sclerotic or completely hollow that you have to decide on CT scan and take a call uh, what you can achieve. Uh, if it is uh, too sclerotic, then you can still drill it, your hole will be good. But if it is completely hollow and there is not much bone, then you will have to aim to engage the posterior cortex here. In the AP view, you want to be dead midline right in the center, right at the tip. Uh, tip. Try not to go to the sides for a single screw. Uh, when drilling, uh, I use the oscillating drill attachment. There are uh, three attachments in the drill. There's a forward, there's a reverse, and there's an oscillating drill. I prefer oscillating uh, because it uh, reduces the chance of entangling the, ensnaring the tissues uh, around the uh, wire. Although you are using the guide, wire, the guide drill here, but an oscillating drill is uh, uh, a safer way of preventing soft tissue injury. Uh, when you are drilling, <clears throat> make sure you don't penetrate the odontoid tip. So this is the odontoid tip here. You make sure you don't penetrate that because right behind is your pons. If you injure the pons, then it's going to be a disaster. Now, uh, uh, regarding the reduction, if you see that in this case, I don't have 100% reduction. There is a step here. There is a retro displacement, posterior displacement of the tip. So uh, you can just gently put your finger once you pass the wire in, uh, uh, caudal to the fracture, somewhere here is the fracture, your wire is just reaching the fracture. And once you are uh, reaching the fracture, you press uh, the C2 body posteriorly to align with the C2 odontoid. These minor movements you can do, but gross adjustments are difficult uh, intraoperatively. And then you pass the wire in the posterior half of the odontoid. Uh, then you drill it uh, uh, with a cannulated drill. Again, make sure wire migration is the most important step. Uh, if you are drilling too aggressively, if there is a bend in the wire or the wire has already penetrated the cortex, then it is very likely that you are going to uh, push the wire further inside. That should not happen. This part of the uh, surgery should have maximum shoots. Every millimeter by millimeter, you have to go. 
Hmm. Once you have that, the length uh, measurement is most important. Uh, allow, depending on the defect, allow for uh, a correction of as the fracture collapses. There's going to be some uh, uh, loss of length. So if you measure, say, around 44, you take around 42 or something like that. Otherwise, your screw will be a bit longer. Uh, so most of these devices have a measuring device that gives you the uh, length. Or you can put a second wire, as in this case, of the same length and take a measurement. And accounting for the defect measured on the CT, you calculate uh, and from, from the uh, get the final length. If you put too long a screw, then you will not get the compression effect. If you put too short a screw, then your threads may not uh, uh, pass the fracture. So your screw length has to be exact. Uh, so this is, uh, I'm going to skip the exposure part. Yeah, so this is a, uh, uh, a case where you put the odontoid screw. This fellow also had a subaxial fracture. <clears throat> so uh, there are some studies regarding uh, one screw versus two screws. Uh, so, uh, uh, a single four mm screw or two three or two uh, three point five mm, they have uh, uh, they have the same strength. Uh, but if you can always part uh, pass two screws. One study from India it said in two thirds of the case uh, of the cases, uh, two screws are not possible. Uh, Post op care is routine. You mobilize the same day. It's a very quick surgery. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, 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 just looking at some meta analysis, there was a non union rate of around 9 to 7 percent. Uh, these are the cutout rates of around 5 percent, uh, malposition of around 5 percent, and you can still have loosening. So, loosening is again uh, more likely if your screw length is wrong or if the fracture is very old and there is a large defect. Uh, uh, people have studied navigation versus two fluoroscopes. Uh, I don't know how uh, navigation uh, and there is no difference, but uh, I would still rely on two fluoroscopes because navigation, uh, uh, if the your uh, tracker moves, then you can go grossly wrong. So uh, I would still say two fluoroscopes are far better than navigation in this particular case. Uh, as I said, if the tip is very sclerotic and very small, then you may not be able to achieve. Or if the odontoid is completely hollow, you'll have to make sure that your threads engage the posterior cortex. Otherwise, uh, there's not going to be much hold in the hollow uh, uh, bone. Sometimes the C1 and C2 is already fused. So your, uh, the stress on the C1, C2 is going to be uh, uh, very high. Uh, <clears throat> in that case, you can either use uh, an anterior transarticular screw uh, if you don't really pick it up, or sometimes uh, 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 you can even put a uh, three screws, including transarticular and the odontoid. Uh, in this case, the screw was slightly uh, going off lateral, but the hold was good and there was a good uh, clinical uh, outcome, but still aimed right to be in the center. So to summarize, selection is the key. You have to make sure that the fracture pattern is correct, patient uh, uh, morphology is correct, and the implants are correct. Overall, this is a very elegant and a beautiful technique. It should be part of the automatic. Thank you. Right. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, can I ask you a question? Uh, uh, sure. Normally, we usually we try to get holes into the posterior superior cortex, you know, to get a good purchasing power into the a yes, far sir. away fragment. Yes, and, uh, and you specifically mentioned can not to puncture the posterior cortex. Yes, sir. Uh, there's a pawns. I mean, we, we have been doing it uh, often. Then uh, I never came across. I mean, you'll have to see to it that your wire doesn't migrate too far, or you know, and you have to be a bit precise about the length that we should always yeah. be. Yeah. yeah. So, as you rightly said, the length is okay. very important. Your length has to be correct. If you're too long or too short, uh, then it may not uh, achieve the desired results. Yeah. Uh, okay. Is Dr. Abumi uh, uh, here? Abumi, sir, are you around? I think it's my talk next. Yes, sir. Right. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, okay, we'll go uh, move on to the next uh, talk. Uh, Dr. Ajay sir is going to talk on uh, computer navigation on CV instrumentation. Uh, Ganga Hospital has a beautiful uh, uh, the uh, the intraop CT navigation, and we uh, expect some beautiful pictures on this talk. On to you, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. My talk would be on computer navigation in uh, CVJ instrumentation. I mean, you have heard about various instrumentation techniques over the uh, course of the lecture today. I'll just give you a brief overview of what is computer navigation and how it will be useful in CVJ instrumentation. 
See, basically, navigation is a process of accurately ascertaining one's position in planning and following a route. We are all well used to navigation in the use of uh, navigating a car or using a Google navigation for using uh, for knowing the directions. In spine surgery, computer navigation describes a group of technologies that merge the pre-operative or intraoperative images with three-dimensional visualization of surgical instruments in real time. What does it mean is that you have an image acquisition. It could be either a fluoro or a CT based. You have got a processing system and then you have an intraoperative navigation system. Therefore, when you take navigation systems, there is imaging one component, which could be two dimensional or a three dimensional. It could be fluoro based or a CT based. And you have got a navigation technology, which is two dimensional or three dimensionally. And both are merged together to have a generations of navigation. The first generation of navigation that came was a pre-operative CT based. Therefore, you have to register during the process of operation. It used to be cumbersome. Therefore, the second and the third generation are automatic registration. And it could be either a fluoro based, which could be either a two dimensional or a three dimensional, or a CT based, which could be either, which is usually a three dimensional system. Basically, the current generation of navigation system, there is an automatic registration. How does the navigation work? You have an image acquiring system that is either the CT or the fluoro. You have a workstation. You have the patient on the operating table and a camera which uses infrared rays. Therefore, all of them should be in line. And then it will be easy for the machine to register and we know where we are operating from. This is the setup. We have an Aero CT based navigation system. We've got a CT machine. You have the work workstation, the camera. And the patient in a cervical spine, ideally it should be positioned with a Mayfield clamp because you want a rigid system. When compared to the lumbar area or the thoracic area, the cervical spine and the cervical occipital cervical junction is more mobile area. The chances of error being high, it would be better to position the patient on a Mayfield clamp. And once you expose, you attach a mirror or a minimally invasive refractive array, which has got the diodes which are attached, these small balls, they reflect the infrared rays. And this is fixed to a stable segment that is usually the spinous process. In the lumbar spine, you can fix it to the iliac crest. Whereas there are alternative options. Sometimes you may fix it just to the body with plaster, but however, the errors are very high. It is okay for you to know whether you have done an adequate amount of decompression, but to manage your screw, to plan your screw, the error could be significantly higher or it is not recommended by the manufacturer. You can also fix it to the Mayfield clamp. Here also the chance of error could be there. The most important thing is that the mirror which is attached to the patient and the CT machine or the image acquiring machine, both should be in line with the navigation camera. And then only when you acquire the image, it is transferred from the image to the software and the navigation. Everything can be done quite without any problems of error or registration error. Then you do the registration process. The image is acquired by the CT scan or the image intensifier. It's transferred automatically to the workstation. Because it's an automatic registration process, that is what the advantage of intraoperative navigation is about. The navigation probe is then placed on a known anatomical landmark. Like for example, if you are doing an open surgery, you place it on the spinous process. And it should be shown in the image that you are exactly placing at the same, same site. That means to say that it is there is no problem with the navigation, the errors, there is no error, and then you can plan to proceed on to do the procedure by planning the screw, which is still, it is the most common use of navigation in cervical spine surgery. You can use it to do osteotomies and things like that. You can plan your pedicle screws, entry size, trajectory, screw size and length, and you can also pass your screw under navigation. The use of navigation has been well versed, well published in the thoracic spine and the lumbar spine. <laughs> but in the occipital cervical junction, the basic problem of use of navigation is the mobility. When compared to the thoracic and the lumbar area, the occipital cervical junction is much more mobile. Therefore, there is always a higher chances of error creeping in during the process of when you are doing the navigated guided screw insertion. There are certain tips and tricks that we should adopt to, to have a safer outcome. Uh, navigation in spine, you can get the image display in multiple forms. 
simultaneously basically you get coronal and sagittal images therefore even with the high riding iota high high riding vertebral artery you can plan your screw to miss the high riding article a vertebral artery and to put a par screw or a, a transarticular screw uh, much more safely uh, earlier we used to use isoc navigation that is the fluoro based navigation system the problem is as you can see the image quality is not that clear not that great and whenever there is significant malformations significant deformity they are not very ideal situations whereas a ct based navigation or even a oom based which is basically uses a flat panel detector therefore it uses fluoro images it rotates about 360 degrees and and helps you to get a better image is usually ideal when you go for occipital cervical junctional navigation systems you can use navigation to look for reconstruction for stabilization to plan your decompression as the next speaker is going to sachin is going to speak you can plan your decompression of the foramen magnum to know the adequacy of decompression you can also that one other advantage of navigation is the fact intraoperative navigation you can scan intraoperatively again and see the adequacy of your reduction adequacy of your fixation accuracy of your placement of screws everything can be looked at i'll go through few of the case example a type 2 odontoid uh patient presented late as you can see following position when you are navigating you can see that the position of the reduction is quite good why it is important what we have noticed is that when you have stabilized this you have done the navigation done the instrumentation we don't fuse them and when the fracture unites at the period of around one year we tend to remove the instrumentation off lekar you can look at the adequacy of your reduction uh, when you are doing navigation it's not only helps you to plan your screws pass your screws which can also be safely done through a open technique it is uh, because basically the dissection wise the protection of the soft tissue protection of the neurovascular structure still remains the same therefore the only advantage of navigation is that you can pass your screws much more comfortably as mentioned again in a type 2 odontoid fractures in ankylosing spondylitis it helps you to know whether you are achieved adequate reduction before you plan your screws and helps you to plan your screws we we have also used it in c1 burst fractures uh, wherein we have reconstructed the arch by passing through across the burst fracture stabilized it and uh, obviated a need for occipital cervical or c1 c2 fixation this is a case example of a patient who came with a neuric 4 to neuric 5 myelopathy status post foramen magnum decompression actually he had deteriorated therefore uh, in this case scenario we used navigation to plan the odontoid resection therefore where you can fix the mirror in these situations the mirror can be fixed either to the uh, mayfield or as i mentioned earlier you can stick it to the body it is not as accurate because here we do not need accuracy but we have to get an idea that we have done a adequate amount of uh, resection as you can see this is the post scanning and you can see that post scanning that you have done a adequate amount of resection of the odontoid and that's where the navigation can help you during an anterior surgery and then the patient was turned over to have adequate occipital and as you can see the deformity is very very complex it helps you to plan your screws even in very narrow pedicular area and actually the advantage of navigation is the fact that it makes your instrumentation uh, really much more easier therefore you don't have to worry too much about planning the instrumentation looking at the ct scan planning it the size of the screw here everything can be done intraoperatively with very less effort and that's where the advantage of navigation does set come in and other example is the fact that you can do intraoperative scanning to know that whether you are screw placed and whether you are achieved the reduction whether you are reduced the joint everything can be done by using a intraoperative navigation systems but as i mentioned earlier the tips and tricks are very very important because in the cervical spine is morely mobile uh, it's always better to fix the dra or the diffractive array very near to the construct is better to use the stable fixation point usually the spinous process below is the area of fixation like for example you are doing occipital cervical you can use c4 or c5 always use power instruments so that the movement that happens of the cervical spine becomes less you make the pilot holes don't try to put the screw because i mark the screw in c2 or c1 i don't go ahead and put the screw i mark the screw in all the c1 right side left side c2 right side left side and then tend to go on to do the occipital one because the occipital condyle is relatively stable it is it's fixed to the skull less chances of intersegmental movement therefore 
it's always important that you do your job over the cervical spine and then move to the occiput so that the chances of error. And it's other much more important thing is that when you are doing navigation, keep on intermittently checking, check the accuracy. Place the probe over a known point and see whether the accuracy is still there. If there is a doubt, you may have to rescan. To conclude, navigation is not a gimmick. It helps a lot. It makes a difficult part of the procedure, like putting screws subcortical and makes it much, much easier for you. Therefore, you are concentrate on doing the main part of the job. It has significant value to the armamentarium of spine surgeon. But as I mentioned earlier, the technical expertise, not knowing to know how to do it freehand, always is essential, especially in occipital cervical area, where just because you know navigation, you cannot put a screw without doing adequate uh, dissection. Protecting the neurovascular structures is very, very essential. Therefore, your expertise really matters. It is a useful agent, but not a substitute for your surgical skills and probably reduces the complications, make the surgical duration much lesser. Thank you for the patient here. Thank you, sir. Beautiful pictures. We'll take questions in the chat box due to lack of time. Thank uh, you. It's really sad we can't take questions on these uh, topics. Uh, next, we'll have Dr. Sachin Borkar uh, uh, talk on foramen magnum uh, decompression. Uh, we have a pre-recorded talk. I am Dr. Sachin Borkar and I shall be talking about foramen magnum decompression indications and technique. Foramen magnum decompression is needed in a variety of conditions. The anterior part of the foramen magnum is actually the basion, the base of the skull. The posterior margin is the opisthion. See carefully, this is the posterior aspect. It is actually the foramen magnum rim. The posterior foramen magnum decompression will cover almost 120 degree of this circle. So indications, the foremost indication is gyri malformation in which the cerebral tonsils are herniated into the spinal canal. The other indications are the, the congenital craniovertebral junction anomalies. Uh, when you are manipulating the joints, you may need uh, to decompress the foramen magnum before you are aligning. The effective foramen magnum area for the cord is decreased in this case. So we need to do foramen magnum decompression as well in addition to the joint manipulation. And then there are conditions like syndromes, like a chondroplasia, mucopolysaccharidosis, who has foramen magnum stenosis as a component without any instability. And in such cases also, when the patient is presenting with myelopathy, you may have to decompress foramen magnum. So the position is standard prone. Mild flexion is sufficient. Incision is standard midline. So I prefer an incision which is slightly above the ion. Uh, because at in carry malformation, you have to do a duroplasty for which uh, a local pericranium can be harvested if the incision is above the ion. And the lower down, uh, it may extend up to C2 or C3. C1 and the foramen magnum rib should be adequately exposed. Regarding exposure of the C1 posterior arch, it is preferable if the tonsils are herniating uh, till that level. And it has to be done on a low cautery setting and you should be extremely careful uh, beyond 1 to 1.5 centimeter on either side because the vertebral artery uh, will loop over the superior surface of atlas in that region. So you need to be careful there. 3 by 3 centimeter suboccipital craniotomy is done. And once that foramen magnum uh, bony decompression is done, then you have, you have to remove this occipital ligament, which is a thick extradural band cranial side and this is the this is a cv junction anomaly so we already put the screws below and uh, this is three by three centimeter craniotomy which we are planning using a midas rex ma drill uh, we drill the initial bone at times there are venous channels in this bone and this bone is quite thick so you have to gradually drill without and uh, the drill should be used like a paintbrush so that uh, you do not injure the dura. This is what I was telling the venous sinuses. You have to carefully irrigate, apply bone wax, and uh, then it will stop and then proceed uh, with your further drilling. Remember that this bone here is quite thick and you may have to drill layer by layer 
so I'm checking it with the uh, periosteal elevator. Uh, further clearing the soft tissue, and this is the foramen magnum, the deepest part uh we are taking out this is an occipitalized atlas so you can see that the c1 is also attached the posterior arch to the occiput and this is also being drilled careful superiosteal dissection first then the drilling and this is done on both the sides and now it is quite mobile so it is being held with an alice forcep and we are trying to remove this you can see it now the bony decompression has been done then this extradural constricting band which i was telling this is called as the posterior atlant occipital membrane this is frequently very much hypertrophied in cv junction anomaly and this is the last bit of that extradural band we are gradually dividing it So we are not opening the dura, we are just dividing this band and peeling this off from the dura. You will realize that this also provides a lot of decompression to the cord. So as you can see now, if you can appreciate that they, you can move, see the tonsils moving uh, below this dura because we have adequately decompressed. So dural opening, uh, usually in CV junction anomaly, it's not needed or carry malformation is the only uh, thing for which you are doing for an anion decompression, then you may have to open the dura and do an augmentation duraplasty along with uh, the tonsillar shrinking or resection. The dura is usually open in a Y-shaped manner. So this is the Y which you have to create. So the Y limbs above and the midline uh, vertical limb below this is a small video we already did a three by three centimeter suboccipital craniotomy and now this is the caudal area and this is the cranial area and you can see we are opening the dura the vertical midline limb and then the this is the csf coming out taking the tagging sutures now see the adhesions between the tonsil and the cord these are the arachnoid adhesions. We are trying to divide it by sharp dissection. This is the tonsil, fourth ventricular floor, the obex, which is the which was plugged initially by the tonsils, and now it is opening up. You have to sharply divide this adhesions because this is this is what is causing tonsil not to ascend. And these are the pica, the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. And we have to be careful not to damage it. Once that is done, you may uh, shrink the tonsil with bipolar coagulation. And if needed, you can also do a subpile tonsillar resection, as has been done in this case. So I am using a CUSA for doing the subpile tonsillar resection and uh, we will do this mechanical reduction of the tonsils so that further chances of uh, adhesion and plugging are avoided this is done on the other side as well you have to now close the dura and do an augmentation dura plasty so that there is a more space for the cord as well as the posterior fossa we usually take a locally harvested pericranial graft from the, above the ion and then it is closed with a 4 OPDS. Avoid blood seepage uh, dura. So to conclude that FMD is a very useful procedure in a DCV junction in a variety of condition. Careful handling of the drill is a must that it should be uh, gently used without damaging the dura. And it is important to release all extradural constricting band, including the posterior atlant occipital membrane. Adding intradural work in carry one malformation with syrinx is advisable. Uh, as per various studies, uh, you can do an arachnoid adhesiolysis, tonsillar resection, augmentation duraplasty, as uh, may be needed in a particular case. Thank you for your time.
Thank you, Dr. Sachin, for the excellent talk. Uh, can we have some very quick questions? They're running a bit late. Dr. So, Shidish? Yeah. I, I have one question for Dr. Abumi. Abu, Dr. Abumi is the next speaker as well. Uh, is it there? So, about, about this computer navigated pedicle screw insertion in the cervical spine, uh, what, what do you do at your institution? I know that you are a big proponent of doing uh, freehand screws, but you know, you are the inventor of those screws. What do you recommend to the general people uh, when they are going to do cervical pedicle screws? Uh, should they be using computer navigation? Unmute. So, sorry, you're, in, uh, you're muted. Dr. Abumi, unmute yourself. So I yeah, don't have you. computer navigation system, so I don't use it. I always do manually. But uh, I think that sometimes I visit other hospital, big hospital, I use uh, navigation system, in the, especially in the case with uh, severe deformity. And the uh, correction of cervical kyphosis, uh, just kyphosis is not so difficult, just a two-dimensional uh, deformity. But uh, with a rotational deformity with scoliosis, I think it's very useful to use the navigation system for cervical deformities. So usually, thank you, thank you, Dr. Yes. Abumi. So I have another question for Dr. S uh, Sachin. Uh, it's about this um, controversy, right? Uh, you know, some surgeons say that you don't ever have to do foramen magnum decompression, and this Chiari itself is, uh, you know, some some open the dura, some don't. Uh, what is the general consensus where people are leaning towards? Is it like just fusion? Was it, would it be sufficient? Or uh, you really have to do the uh, full, full deal? Where does your Actually, philosophy more lean in? And then we can take an opinion from Dr. Rudrappa also, who's the other neurosurgeon here. Actually, uh, in uh, without any manifest CV junction uh, instability, we are just doing a foramen magnum decompression. If there is any instability which is manifest uh, or there is any facetal malalignment, then only uh, uh, means as of now, we are uh, we are doing the only foramen magnum decompression. But if there is instability, obviously, Dr. Goyal is saying that uh, you should fix in all cases. And actually, carry is uh, a sort of... Uh, but uh, there are not many studies uh, which uh, supports this other than his own study. So, in fact, till the time we have the literature, we are also conducting a study in which we are studying it in both arms, whether uh, decompression and fixation in two randomized sort of study. So, till the time we are getting a result on that study and we also get data from other institutes, we are going ahead with for our magnum decompression. It's working well in our hands. And uh, this is ha has been the quite a hotly debated topic of late, but most of the people are yet not convinced in fully shifting only to fixation and not doing decompression. Thank you, Dr. Sachin. Chitesh, you. You know, as you asked, you know, there is uh, two ways of doing FMD. One is, as you said, people don't open the dura and some people open the dura. Uh, if you look at uh, the, if there is a foramen only carry malformation without syrinx, uh, then doing only the craniotomy of a small around the rim is more than sufficient. But if there is a syrinx, is usually related to, we call slush and slash theory, where the CSF in the cranial content is they having a higher pressure compared to the spinal canal. And through the, the Virco Robin space, the fluid enters into the spinal cord. So whenever there is a syrinx, it is always better to open foramen of Lushka and Majendi. You had to see the flow of CSF across the cranial cavity to the spinal canal freely. And many a times I have seen a cobweb membrane at the obex. Obex is the end of the foramen of Majendi. And unless you remove that, you know, the CSF flow between the spinal canal and the cranial cavity will not become uniform. So ultimate aim to prevent the further progression of the syrinx is by seeing a clear flow of CSF between the cranial cavity to the spinal cavity. For that, we have to enlarge the foramen magnum, take out the, the bands, the soft tissue bands, 
and the cobweb formation around the obex. Till then, the syrinx will not improve. And many patients will come back even after the foramen magnum decompression alone, bony, uh, after five to six years with the increase in the syrinx. So with syrinx, open the dura. Without syrinx, no need to open the dura. That is the simplest way of telling. Uh, with this, uh, we'll end the session. Thank you, everyone, for being here. It was a very exciting session. Uh, we move on to the next session based on CV junction uh, uh, deformities. I'll hand over the session to Dr. Umesh Srikanta. On to you, sir. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Manish uh, Shitij, uh, ASSI team. And, uh, you know, I've been given the honor of uh, moderating this star-studded star -studded team. Uh, and in the beginning, I think, uh, you know, the, let me in invite uh, Dr. Rabumi, who is already ready with his talk because we are running late of time. I'll not uh, further delay the proceedings. Professor Rabumi, over to you. He's going to be talking on realignment of CV junction deformities using an all-posterior approach. Sir, over to you. Hello, good, good evening. Uh, Sapporo is now in the midwinter, so outside my home is like this. And uh, thank you very much for this invitation. My talk is the, the alignment of the cranial vital junction deformity using all possible approach. And uh, we have many causes of the cranial vital anomalies, deformities. Congenital anomaly, including OC assimilation, atlantaxial assimilation, also don't tell them and combined combination. Also, inflammatory disorder, post-traumatic tumor, and other conditions make a deformity at the OC junction. Yet, uh, we have two good indicators for evaluation of the deformity. One is Wackenheim Cribus canal line. This is a line between the posterior surface of the cribus and the posterior margin of the tenus. And the next is uh, the CMA. Cervical medullary angle. This is very useful for evaluation of radiological uh, 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 condition. And the normal ablation of CMA is 163 degrees. The most cause of, most mostly cause of the combined deformity of flexion at OC1 C2 until translation of C1 OC2 and the vertical flexion of uh, subluxation of the death. And uh, uh, called the vaginal invagination may cause uh, uh, compression of spinal cords at the anterior aspect. So, anterior as aspect of nerve is compressed. So, we need anterior decompression for this condition. So, the direct anterior decompression includes transoral approach or multiple splitting approach. Dr. Alan Crocker from England. He likes until approach very well. And uh, I sometimes we sometimes discussed with the indication. But the uh, disadvantage of direct until decompression is include insufficient bed for bone graft, difficult internal fixation, and requiring additional posterior fixation. No. So this figure shows uh, the reaction of the or see the junction deformity. That, now that we put the plate or knot on the occipital bone and connect to the screw in, inside into the cervical pedicle, see, usually in C2. If we tighten the knot, and the uh, relation between load and the plate and the screw becomes perpendicular. And this course provide extensional force and uh, uh, the distortion force. So we can expect uh, the question of flexion deformity and the vertical subluxation by extensional force. If we need further reduction of vertical subluxation can be obtained by application of distortion force if we need. We published this uh, concept in 1999 on journal spine. Yeah, this is one case I did in Kathmandu, Nepal. Uh, almost uh, 10 years ago. This patient has also told them. The motion is very small at OC1, C2, but very rigid, but a little bit of motion we can expect, we can see. So I think, I thought, must be at the reducible. So I did uh, two screw into the C2 and two screw into the C3, bigger screw and the correct the deformity like this. We can get a good reduction and a good improvement of nerve disturbance. 
This is uh, recent to my case. This patient had a uh, congenital anomaly, including with uh, C1 assimilation, OC2 and C3T1 union. Yeah, motion at OC junction is very small, but you can see this patient had a joint at C1C2. Joint C1C2. So this must be reducing, must be reduced result. So I, but this patient had uh, some congenital anomaly at uh, the artery and abnormal condition of C1C2. Yeah, you can see C1 is the fused to octal bone. So screw insertion is not so easy. So you can, this is a real video, in, uh, interrupted video like this. The, I, I always uh, sit at the cranial portion of the patient. So this is uh, uh, the ostal bone fused with C1. This is a C2, C3 segment. So I'm looking for insertion point of C2 pedicle screw. It's a huge C2 and C3 lamina. They are very unstable at C2, C1, C2. So, so make a screw insertion hole and put the probe like this and insert the top and the screw. Sometimes C2 screw uh, can it, uh, penetrate the anterior, anterior of the, the C2 vertebral body. And then this is a C2 screw, bigger screw. But the uh, right side, I skip the C2 bigger screw because of the abnormal uh, condition of the vertebral artery. I insert only C3 on the right side. I'm taking a bone from the C2 and C3 area. And I put the plate and bend the, the nodes, expecting a reduction. And uh, much screw, at least three screw must be inserted. And after the tightening of the nut, we can expect reduction. And this is the, the bone from the area. No, no. So this is the result. You can see good reduction. You can see uh, the good reduction about the uh, diameter of the nerve like this. So this patient had a good improvement of the nerve, nerve function. Yeah, this is a uh, case of rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah, this is a severe deformity of in vaginal invalidation and the fraction deformity. Fraction deformity was not so severe. But we insert the screw to C2 and reduce it. Yeah, this is the result of uh, uh, radical result of uh, vaginal invalidation. The preoperatively patient had uh, 3.3 centimeter millimeter from the, the macri line and tip of the bottom back. This improves. Increase four millimeter, so you can you got three uh, seven millimeter reduction of vaginal impregnation. This is OC two angle, OC OC two angle improved almost a ten degree per and like this. So this is a cervical midline angle per and per operatively. We got twenty degree of improvement of CM angle. Also, you can see, yeah, you can see good result of shim angle like this. You can see the improvement of the collection of vaginal invagination and the flexion deformity and atlantic dislocation, anti atlantic dislocation on, on axis. Uh, some patient, some doctor in afraid uh, worry about the anterior support. But you can see, yeah, in this case, you can see joint space has improved, it's, uh, uh, large, in large. But uh, axial loads, the preoperatively shifted 
until of the spine. But after the surgery, after the correction of the deformity, axial load transferred to the posterior. So most of the axial load from the skull and the affected the bone and the implants can support. So we, we don't need bone graft into the OC or the Atlantic shell joint. But uh, sometimes patients had a reducible case, reducible deformity like this. This is a case from uh, the Professor Wang from uh, Beijing University Sad Hospital. He did uh, say that the very good anterior release. This is a case with a severe craniobatial junction uh, anomaly like this. This is uh, the small patients. Before surgery, they release anterior by anterior approach. And uh, after the, uh, anterior, anterior release, they do skull traction and uh, posterior fixation by using uh, instrumentation like this. They got a good reduction for this patient. But uh, this case type of the case is not so often. I I don't I I don't uh, I'd like to say uh, regarding the occipital anchor, multiple screw near the midline must be uh, required. Bicortical patches is recommended. The bicortical uh, patches is much stronger than in cortical. But uh, in the cranial cervical function, if patient had, uh, especially in the congenital deformity, patient sometimes had abnormal condition of uh, vertebral artery like this. We have to be careful. So pre-operative evaluation of vertebral artery condition by MR angiography or CT angiography. Sometimes patients have a abnormal condition of risk of circle like this. In this case, the one side of a posterior communicating artery was, uh, communicating artery was uh, uh, locked. So the, sometimes if we, if we injure the vertebral artery both sides, really disaster, disaster, really disaster for this condition. If patient had um, uh, only one side vertebral artery usually harmless to the brain. But uh, if patient, we have, we injured bilaterally, so in some case, it's a terrible condition, terrible. Like this. this is very risky for uh, the two sides of vertebral artery injury. This is not a surgical case. In this case, this patient had uh, rheumatoid arthritis and a very severe condition at OC junction. In the preoperative, we tried uh, angiography like this. If we applied, uh, patient uh, applied uh, extension of force, one side of one side of the vertebral tree was occluded. This is the table. So we stopped the surgery for this patient. We need spinal cord neuromotoring and vertebral tree can be uh, monitored by intraoperative confirmation of vertebral tree for using ultrasound, ultrasound Doppler. Ultrasound Doppler is very useful to hear the vertebral artery flow, the intraoperative. Intra yeah, this is a case of uh, uh, surveyed surgery of OCD junctions. Yeah, this is the Doppler system, the ultrasound Doppler system. Okay. Can you see the sound of the Doppler? Yeah. Vertebral artery flow? Okay. We can see the location of the vertebral artery. And also, we can see the flow of the vertebral artery. In conclusion, I'd like to say uh, correction of deformity as a cranial vertebral junction provides sufficient neurological improvement. Most of the cranial vertebral junction deformity can be reduced by single posterior approach. Screw inserted into the C2 and subaxial pedicles are useful fixation anchor for cranial vertebral deconstruction. We, the also report this concept many years ago, 1999, on Janus Spine. So I'd like to say, indirect decomposition by the home decoration at the Ocranial Bar Junction provides good reconstruction, good but, uh, neurological improvement. In many cases, we don't need until direct anterior decompression.
Sanki boy ateş. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Rabumi, for that crisp and uh, detailed, uh, you know, talk. Uh, it was very informative. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Shitij. Uh, Dr. Shitij, you want to put across the question to Professor Rabumi? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so those these are those special screws that have a particular design. Those screws are not always like you know we don't have those kind of screws. So is there any alternative we can use, like say a monoaxial reduction screw, which will work the same way? I think it uh, monoaxial is much better than polyaxial for production, but uh, the company don't like to use uh, make a uh, monoaxial screw. So recently I used polyaxial screw, but polyaxial is also acceptable to use for reduction. So the same thing will work with polyaxial also. Polyaxial is also not the no same. Monoaxial is much stronger than polyaxial. Much stronger, mm -hmm. but we don't uh, have those doctor. kind of screws. Huh? Yeah, Pro Professor Rabumi, uh, uh, so we are going to listen from Dr. Uh, Sarath following this that, you know, uh, he's going to put a cage in the C1, C2 and achieve the same uh, reduction for all these things. So what is your concept about this? Because we saw in most of your cases that you don't distract the C1, C2 joint. So where, what is the difference? Suggestion. What is the difference between, uh, you know, the two techniques? So how would you say whether a cage is required in which particular case and when is it not required? You are to, uh, talking about the cage? Yes, yes, please. The C1, C2 joint? Yes. No, I don't use the cage. But uh, after yeah. reduction, after the correction of the deformity, and um, the axial load moved to the posterior. So anterior support is not so important. So and the uh, grafted bone is the posterior, and also implant in the posterior, that supports the axial load. So I think in the mo mo most of the case, we don't need until support after reduction. Okay, okay, all right. So I think yeah, we have, we'll take one to... last question from Dr. Ashok and uh, I think we'll move on to the next talk, please. Dr. Ashok, yeah. Yeah, Professor Abumir, a nice talk. Uh, we use a different technique, which I'll be showing it later, where uh, we use an under contour plate, you know, which is, more like uh, like in a cobra shape, a little away from the occiput. So we first fix the C1 and C2 with an under contour plate. We press that uh, C2 uh, other plate onto the occiput. So that automatically pushes almost the same mechanism onto mm -hmm. the, like as anteriorly as possible under the basium. So, so first we put the screw, correct the uh, tighter screw. And the next step to push the uh, plate. plate the Bend the plate onto the occiput so that indirectly pushes the C2 more anteriorly. I think that also we can get the same result. Thank you. Yep. Umesh, I, I have one uh, question and uh, kind of a different concept is uh, yeah, please, 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 the wonderful presentation. Uh, the Atlantaxial dislocation and basal and invagination pathology is changing its concept that it is now the whole pathology happens at C1, C2 level. And we are unnecessarily adding the occiput as additional anchor. So especially with the modern day where one movement of the head should be available to the patient because with the C1, C2, we prevent the rotation. Flexion extension also will prevent with occipital involvement. So many of us are using the C1, C2 cage and everything to prevent the additional occipital anchoring and reduce at C1, C2 level. That's why now many, including the spinal optosis, are treated at C1, C2 level, preserving the occiput and occipital C1 junction as an intact one. And your comment, I would love to listen to that. Okay. I think the, in the most of the case, I, I do only C1, C2 fixation. But my case, the fixation is not very limited. So if C1, C1 is sometimes fused or no, almost no motion at all C1, so sacrifice of C1 joint is not so uh, important, not so uh, harmful for the patient. So in the case, if C1 is fused to the occipital bone or uh, almost no motion, the preservation of the C1 or C1 joint is not so important. And the next, the, most of the patient is old, more than about uh, 50 or 50, 60 degrees in Japan. So mm -hmm. on C1, 
fixation and C1 C2, or C2 fixation and C1 C2 fixation is not so different, I think. So, and uh, I, I'd like to say C2 screw fixation provides very uh, strong anchor. So, it's, it's, I think it is a very good for reduction. Okay, because okay. we treat mainly congenital compared to what you do in the West, rheumatoid and ankylosing spondylosis. So I think that will be the difference. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. I think because of lack of time, we'll move on to the next talk. It gives me great honor to welcome and introduce Professor Sarat Chandra. You know, it doesn't require an introduction per, introduction per se. So, sir, please, uh, over to you. you. He's going to be talking on his brainchild, the evolution, the concept and technique of DCR. Sir, over to you. Am I audible? Yes, yes. You have to all log uh, so My video is already there. So in case it's not there, I'll play from my end. Sir, you can play it at your end. Okay, just give me a minute. Just a minute. Because I was, was hoping it will do. Yeah. So until then, I think Dr. Sachin has a question. So uh, in the case of an occipitalized C1, if the C1 lateral mass is good enough, if there is a good space, and the vertebral artery is not in the way. So would anybody, or what is the take on the of the panel uh, of putting a C1 lateral mass screw rather than going and fixing it to them with an occipital plate? It Professor Abuni. It is accepted. Yeah, yes. So, but how many times or what are the freak, how many times would you be able to do that? Will we be able to do it in many cases, or it's only a small percentage? And no, no. Very few patients will have that. Uh, ox, you know, the C1 condyle submerging with the occipital mm -hmm. condyle. The, actually, in fact, in such patients, the size of the C1 uh, lateral mass is bigger than normally what you find. This is true. Very good, and you can get a beautiful bicortical purchase. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. I think Dr. Sharat is ready with his uh, presentation. Sir, over to you. So thank you very much for this opportunity. I'll just play a video of two very severe basilar invaginations because we deal with extremely complex cases. And these are the cases I believe you cannot tackle it until you apply the, uh, the technology of DCR. So let me just play the videos. It has an audio. The case is clear of the patient. Is the audio audible? Yes. Ex yes. Extension yes. and extension view. CT scan with serial reconstruction. 3D CT with angiogram. MRI is showing severe compression. This slide briefly explains the concept of pseudo joint. So the surgery which was done was a DCR technique, which stands for distraction, compression, extension, and reduction, where the spacers are used as pivots to reduce both the plant axial dislocation and the residual bacilli invagination. DCR is indicated in cases which are congenital, where the C1 is hospitalized, especially those associated with severe bacilli invagination and atlanto axial dislocation. We prefer a three-point fixation, which includes occiput, C2 or C3, and C3 or C4. These are some of our brief publications. DCR makes a plumb line correction, as it can be seen here. We even demonstrated in our studies. Surgery is performed with the patient prone on horseshoe. Generally, I don't prefer a traction, but if at all traction is required, we can place the patient in a carnival's traction, more for stabilization rather than for the use of traction with perhaps two kilograms of weight. We perform a standard exposure from occiput to C4. The following video shows exposure of the left joint, where we are drilling a bit of C1 arch to create more space, and we are exposing the left C2 ganglia. In this case, we were able to preserve the C2 ganglion, and this shows exposure of the left side joint. Now we are exposing the right side. We are now performing the foramen magnum drilling. 
In this case, it can be seen that the foramen magnum was very deep and we drill about 2 to 2.5 centimeters. It's important to also remove the fibrotic bands to release uh, the cord posteriorly adequately. Here I'm showing the exposure of the right side joint. As you can see, I prefer using a variable impedance bipolar, uh, especially from Sutter, which allows me to very nicely and adequately coagulate all the venous plexus. So it's very important for us to disarticulate the joints completely. So here we're disarticulating the joint on the left side. And in this case, I prefer to use a periosteal elevator and turn it right angle. And following this, we do joint remodeling and denuding the articular cartilage using a diamond drill. Once the joint is ready, we are introducing the spacer. So since the, uh, the basilar invagination and aid is very severe here, I start off with a spacer which is 11 millimeters on the left side and 10 millimeters on the right side to allow me correction, which is on uh, the coronal sections. So these are the special spaces which have been designed by us, which are biconvex spaces, which allow the spaces to be converted into pivots while performing the technique of DCR. So now both the spaces are in C2. Here we make uh, place lateral mass screws in C3 and C2 power screw. So as to allow us to provide C3 uh, three point fixation. The following diagram shows the universal reducer, which we are de developing in collaboration with Petronix. Uh, it consists of uh, a reduction system, which has a C2 translator system, as well as a cable wire reduction, which is made of braided stainless steel, which is much more stronger than the usual titanium cable. And it is attached to a special tensioner device. In this case, we have used only a wire compression as the posterior listhesis of C2 was not significant. So in this technique, we are first placing a temporary occipital plate. In this case, I prefer to place two occipital plates in order to provide me a long length traction of the wire. Now we take the specially prepared braided stainless steel cable, which is glued around the C2 spine and then passed along the holes of the occipital uh, plates. Now this is then passed to a provisional crimp. And now we use the special cable tensioner. So when we tighten the cable, this leads to compression. That is very good impaction between OC1 and C2 and the spaces get impacted very nicely. Continued compression leads to extension at the OC1 and C2 joint as it can be seen here. So here the spacers, both the spacers, they act like pivots leading to a complete reduction of basal invagination and AAD. The specially designed nature of the spacers allow adequate reduction. Now in this case, uh, using 10 and 11 millimeter spacers, we were not able to achieve enough reduction, which was expected, but I always start off with the smaller size spacers and then slowly increase the height of the spacers. So now, I remove the earlier spacers and now I'm using the final size spacers, which are 18 millimeters on the left side and 16 millimeters on the right side. Generally, the large size spacers are very difficult to introduce. So I use a special rail loading technique using the periosteal elevator. So we have to understand that increasing the height of spacer provides us the additional lever advantage. So in case we are not able to achieve optimum reduction, by increasing the height of spaces, we will be able to provide that additional advantage, which will allow us to reduce both the AD and BI satisfactorily. So the left spacer is now in C2, and now we are introducing the right side spacer. And you can see how the spacers are hammered inside. And now we repeat the cable compression again, as shown earlier, and this again, you can see will lead to moments of compression followed by extension at the OC1 joints. And this time we have achieved adequate reduction as it can be seen on the worm image. Also note the adequate correction of cervical hyperlosis. Now you can compare this with pre-op scans and there has been a very good and a significant reduction. 
At this point, we fashion the rods in order to perform the standard three-point fixation, which includes an occipital uh, cervical fixation. Placing adequate bone graft mixed with hydroxyapatite ensures good bone effusion. Post-operative CT scan shows very good reduction. This is another short example just to show the use of a C2 translator. So this is an eight-year-old boy with severe spastic quadriparesis, short neck. And in this case, you can see that there was a severe bacillary invagination AAD, presence of a pseudo joint, and there is also a backward movement or a listhesis of C2, which leads to severe angulation of the dense backwards. So the patient also had a posterior fossa dermoid and we reported such rare instances in neurosurgery way back. So we have to understand that when the bacillary invagination and AD become severe, there is also an additional motion of backward listhesis of C2 or OC1. And in such cases, we prefer to use the C2 translator so we place the standard occipital uh, plate. The spaces are already in C2. In this case, you can see we're providing a special C2 uh, clamp, which I generally prefer using it in pediatric patients in order uh, to prevent the Y from slipping. And now we place the C2 translator with the pivot on the occipital plate. A screw is now passed through the hole. And now we can see that we are providing simultaneous movement uh, reduction with the cable tensioner as well as the screwdriver. So the cable tensioner provides compression and extension, whereas the screwdriver here pushes the C2 forward, leading us to a very optimal uh, reduction of uh, the listhesis between uh, OC1 and C2. This is a 3D worm image. And we have designed the special spaces which could be connected to a rod by a connecting rod, which we have placed in this case. And you can see it's a very satisfactory reduction. The dermoid was also removed in the same city. Both patients improved in the spasticity and power and were walking at three minutes. Thank you very much. So thank, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Sarah. Thank you so much. Any questions? Uh, any questions if uh, any faculty wants or delegates want to put across to Professor Sharat? So meanwhile, uh, Professor Sharat, I'll start off with the questionnaire. So uh, in many cases, we see that the once we put the cage in, the reduction or the extension maneuver that we do on C2 becomes more and more tougher, more and more difficult. And the bigger the cage, the more difficult is this maneuver. So what are your tips? Of course, you use a cable graft in order to push, pull the C2 up, but but sometimes we have noticed that even with that, it is difficult to reduce uh, the the B, the AAD after we are put in the cage, but without the cage, it, it, it reduces nicely. So what are your tips and tricks in so such situations? So excellent question. I'm so happy you asked it. So now I compare my technique with cervical arthroplasty. The most important part of the surgery is preparing the joints. It's very important that you completely disarticulate the joints. For that purpose, you have to do complete dissection. You have to put periosteal elevators simultaneously in both the joints and then turn them around. So by the time you're placing the screw, both the joints have to be totally loose. So if you see most of my procedure, 80, 90% of the joint uh, procedure is only disarticulating the joint. Now, after that, once you put the spacer and reduce it, it is, it's over in just a couple of minutes. It doesn't take much time at all. So that is the key. You need to disarticulate the joints completely till they are loose. And that takes some time. That really takes some time. And you can do it bloodlessly. There is absolutely no blood. You just need to know how to do it properly. Yeah. So there's a question. One more question. Thank you so much for answering that. There's a question by Dr. Shitej. Uh, do you want to put it across, Shitej? Or... So yeah, wh wh why why can't we do like the joint disarticulation first? Do the universal reduction device before putting in the cage? Is that primarily to get the vertical reduction, or let's say can that be replaced by putting the patient in traction after the joint release and then do the cage? Okay, so that's again a very good question. 
So you have to understand, if you don't put in the cage, when you use the cable compression, it's going to further exaggerate the basilar invagination. The reason basilar invagination gets corrected is you put a cage there which acts like a pivot. It's very similar to Archimedes trying to lift the earth when you put a pebble and then use that rod in order to lift the globe. So you put the spacer there and then you start compression. Then you find that there is a movement in the opposite direction on the other side of the pivot, which leads to a very optimal reduction of basilar invagination. And not only basilar invagination, it also reduces the residual atlanto axial dislocation. So putting the cage not only reduces basilar invagination, it reduces the atlanto axial dislocation also. The only thing which cannot be reduced is the backward translation. So that is found in a very, very severe case of craniovertebral junction anomalies where there is a retrolysthesis. So even if you correct, there still will, will be retrolysthesis of the C2 over C1 or OC1. And that's the reason we have introduced the concept of C2 translator where you put a screw and then you push the C2 forward. So if you don't have a C2 translator, even if you try to push with your hands the C2 quite a lot, you'll be able to correct it. So that additional element of translation in a horizontal direction was introduced by us. So this concept of retrolysthesis, which is present between OC1 and C2, has been for the first time described by us. Otherwise, it was not known. People used to think that it's only distraction which has to be correct, which has to be corrected. So there's Thank one more question. You. Maybe I could read it if you don't mind. So yes, how sir, please, please. How do you compare your technique versus anterior retropharyngeal release followed by posterior fixation? So I have never done an anterior retropharyngeal release. I have absolutely no criticism to, to those techniques. I believe that each of these techniques have their own value. For instance, you know, the technique described by Dr. Patkar, which is a ventral procedure I mean, you do, that's excellent. But for bacillary imaginations, like the ones I've shown you, there is no other technique which is going to work. That's the reason I've shown such extreme cases. You need to release the joints. You need to put a spacer of an optimal height. You need to correct it. That's the reason I've shown such extreme cases. They'll work fine. I mean, if you have minor, by be a basilar invagination, AAD, they'll work fine. But once it goes to a beyond a certain limit, you just cannot do it with any other technique except through this technique, what we have described. I completely Thank agree you so much. That. Uh, Mahesh, I completely agree with Sharad's this thing because uh, basilar imagination, the way he showed that cases, the translation of the C2, which happens with the cage fixing in, you know, it, whatever we push from the posteriorly, the C2, it will not come unless you have something distracted between C2 and occiput. And that's what is a DCR technique which does. I used to do it anteriorly capsule release, anteriorly go in, put the, um, the uh, reamers, and open it and then go posteriorly. Ultimately, in AAD and the listhesis of the lumbar spine and spondyloptosis is release, release, release. Joint has to be released. After releasing, you have to keep some fulcrum in the anteriorly to pull it backwards. I think, you know, Sarah's technique is wonderful only when the basal imagination of that high degree with congenital anomalies. Uh, as he said, you know, the, the anything less than that can also be useful without doing that. That's right, Satish. It's 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 you can do it with any degree of basilar imagination. Right. But yeah. the thing is, yes, if it is a mild basilar, you could do it anteriorly also, you could do it through a release also. But the advantage is if you stick to this one technique, I have never done any other technique, but I have been confidently been able to reduce. And more I have done more than 350 cases and more than 1000 cases of CV junction. So more I do these techniques, you know, more you start learning That's about possible. it, more confident you get. There's a grading, you know, it's a spectrum. You start with the simple cases and then you keep on going through the complex cases. And as and when you keep on doing it, you keep on getting more and more convinced about it. The The problem with this is that the size of the cage, which you are mentioning, that height is not available commercially. It's no, available, it's available. In the one, yeah, it's available in the one which you have designed and that's now available commercially. Mm -hmm. So, Because the maximum I have used is about 8 to 10 millimeter. So that's, that. another, that's another thing, Satish. You know, a lot of people had a lot of concern Correct. that if you put such high spaces, would it lead to any stretching of the cord? Now, we did a study. No, it will not. It will, yeah, the... we, did, we did a study of MEPs in more than 50 patients. Mm -hmm. We found that even when we put a 20 millimeter size of spaces, the MP, MEPs actually improved. So the only thing is you have to do it in a graded manner. Graded you have manner. to do it in a manner by which you disarticulate completely. 
And if it is a very severe bassinet, don't go for complete correction at one step. You could do it in a graded slot. Start with smaller size cages and slowly grade it up, or slowly jack it up to higher sizes spacers. It is exactly like spondyloptosis of the lumbar spine. Bilateral simultaneous symmetrical reduction has to be achieved. If you do only unilaterally, it creates a problem. So bilaterally symmetrical, you know, reduces these kind of spondyloptosis. Yeah, thank you so much, sir. I am. I understand that it's a very wonderful discussion, and we would like to discuss more. But for want of time, let's move on to the next topic. Thank you so much, Dr. Sharat. Uh, right. Next topic is by Dr. Satish. Uh, Rudrapa Sosa, he is going to be talk on going to be talking on uh, revision and of failed uh, CV junction fixations. Over to you, Dr. Satish. Uh, Dr. Satish, you, are, you can unmute here, please. Yeah. Can you see the slides? Can you see the slides? Yeah, yeah, yeah slides are visible. Go ahead. Thank you. So, uh, as uh, uh, we have seen the beautiful discussion by uh, Professor Abumi and uh, Sharath, is a wonderful case presentations. And, uh, you know, by doing more and more cases, you will also see many cases where you had to revise or somebody else has done, you had to, you know, your own cases are somebody else's cases to be revision. You know, why the revision happens in CV junction and what are the problems I'll be discussing in this presentation. The principle of CVJ junction surgery is always the fourfolded. One is we have to get the fantastic reduction of the joint. And with joint reduction, we get the adequate decompression, which can be direct or indirect. And once we do the reduction and decompression, we had to stabilize the joint. You know, especially after stabilization, you had to get the bony fusion to sustain it for the longer time. So if any of these principles is failed, whether you reduce the reduction is lesser or you are not decompressed enough, either by direct or indirect way, or you're not provided the stable fixation after the first two procedure, you know, steps or your bony fusion has not happened, it can create a failed principle of, you know, the failed principles leads to failures in CVJ. So any patient with a failed one will always come back with initial improvement in his neurological status worsening the myelopathy. And, you know, it can be, it is mainly due to, once again, the canal compromise, the lack of decompression. So the lack of decompression, once again, you can assess whether it's a mobile, decomp you know, the mobility still persists or it is still immobile. So if it is immobile, that means you already put the bone graft, which is or a plating, which is fused very well, but there is an anterior compression, there is a bony fusion, then you can do direct compression like, you know, either receive an arch excision or odontotectomy can do. But if there is a mobility in spite of your implant and the bone, which is pseudoarthrosis, there is an implant failure. Then once again, you can redo the whole step from posteriorly, either by doing the indirect decompression plus grafting in these patients. So redo fixation is the key in these patients. So the problem of redo is manifold. So it is very easy to say we can redo the things. The problem starts from the exposure point of view. So the exposure will be a lot of scarring of the muscle and the venous structures, you will not be knowing the plane in which you are entering. Sometimes the bone graft is so big, it would have healed in multiple direction. Exposure becomes many difficult. And the dura, vertebral artery injuries are very common. Always better to use IOM and Doppler in these patients because the anatomy becomes haywire. The loss of anatomical landmark, once again, because the bony fusions, whatever the bony gra bone graft you put in, can also relate to anatomical landmark loss. Always use the navigation. And if there is a difficult, you know, implant removal is also key, especially when the cage is abnormally placed and cage is coming backward and is already partially fused because the tooth holding anteriorly. You cannot remove it very well. And sometimes the distraction also will not be enough in these patients. So the larger or additional screw or alternate technique you have to know. And whenever there's a bone mass formation, you have to use the scalp, bone scalper or blurring to be done. And there are a lot of times there'll be CSF leak or wound dehiscence in these patients, proper closure is mandatory. So these are the problem, we always face it. So always make sure you use the microscope, 
use every technology available to you and get well versed with all the equipment which is there with you in these patients. The common causes of failure is poor joint preparation. You know, as every when the previous speaker said, joint, joint, joint. How much you prepare well, how much you align it, how much you distract it, how much you reduce it is the key to prevent the failure. So you had to get the good alignment before grafting. So good alignment and grafting is mandatory to prevent the failure. Fixation done with the C1 arch removal is practiced widely, but do not do it as far as possible because as shown by Sharath, as shown by many people that you can use the C1 as another anchor, you know, using the cable construct or anything, you can pull it back, joint alignment become one, you know, very good. And also it adds the additional surface for bony fusion. Do not remove the C1 arch unless really required. And also removing the C1 arch, give the pseudo feeling that the spinal cord is, you know, the canal is widened, but it's actually pseudo feeling because the pressure is more anterior in on most of these Atlanta axial dislocation or AADs. And occipital 3C3 fixations are done, you know, without, you know, sometime without using the C1 as an anchor. That is also one of the problem because the C1 continue to fall forward. The C2 continuously come backward when you have occipital C2 fixation without an anchoring C1 in some way, either posterior way or anterior lateral mass fixation is mandatory to prevent the failure. Inadequate bony preparation, as Professor you know, uh, told, um, that you had to take out all the soft tissue, drill, get the bony bleeding, and then use enough of ILA graft to get the good fusion. Ultimately, fusion, fusion, fusion is important. And all of these factors leads, you know, if not done well, leads to pseudoarthrosis and poor anchoring and causes the failure. The first surgery is always the best surgery. Second surgery is always is a second surgery in CV junction. So how do you plan, whether anterior or posterior? So once again, you have to redo all your imaging techniques, CT, MR, radiograph, angiogram in these patients to understand the real anatomy because this, you know, the redo things will be much more worse than the initial one. And also get the dynamic radiograph, both CT, X-ray, as well as MRI to see any compression anteriorly and also the bony anatomy, how you can look in and prepare a three-dimensional bony uh, uh, modules so that you will understand better. And as I mentioned, if it is an immobile AAD, you know, use the traction, see whether it's moving, you know, or if it's moving, do the posterior approach once again. Or if it's not moving, then you can do transoral approach or C1 you know, arch removal, you can do it. If it's a mobile AD, posterior approaches redo the whole thing, it is doable in these patients. So you can see whenever you do the redo, all these approaches, you should be versatile. Be versatile with the Goel technique and harm technique, transarticular technique, even the harms technique. And also the transarticular bilateral technique, you had to be versatile. You should have done enough of these cases before you accept the failed aid, you know, CV junction patients uh, in your surgical practice. So I will show you a few cases here. Here is a you know, 67 year old lady school teacher. She was operated elsewhere where they have done a beautiful fusion, simple with a wire technique with occiput to C2 and a large bone graft was done. And you can see in the CT, it is completely fused posteriorly. So beautifully fused, you rarely get this kind of a fusion in these patients. Patient was doing very well for two years and later on started having a myelopathy and she was wheelchair bound. So what do you do in this patient? The dynamic picture shows no you know, mobility and CT shows complete bony fusion. And to do the MRI, you had to take out the wire to see the component, how much compression on the uh, cord. So clearly see, once we remove the, we remove the wire, it is a simple technique, opened a small one, cut it and removed it, did an MRI, which shows a significant compression at cervical medullary junction. There is a persistent myelomalacia in this patient. There is a bacillar invagination also persists in this patient. So here it is a stable fusion, but there is a, you know, compression persist. In this patient, a beautiful transoral odontotectomy, you know, is a simple best way for that patient. And most of these patients do well. See, this is the patient preoperatively on the left side. And I did the transoral excision. Rarely we do transoral excision in the present day, but this is the classical case where you can do. And the patient started doing even a treadmill by herself. So that is the beauty in which how to decide you know, surgery for these patients. Here is the end of the patient. Here, the surgeon is completely missed his in the biomechanics 
of the CV junction pathology. He has learned in a cadaver lab how to put the cage and he has unilaterally fused without you know, putting any uh, thought process of uh, reduction. Here, one cage has been put in without reduction. And this patient came back once again with the myelopathy. Here, if you see, the MRI shows the persistent and also they've done transoral excision in this patient. So they put posteriorly one cage and transorally, instead of removing the odontoid, he's removed the inferior part of the clipple field anomaly of C2, thinking that it has reduced. In fact, patient worsened post, you know, posterior, you know, postoperatively. She was all right for two months, worsened posteriorly. And in the, such patients, here completely, you know, it is a method biomechanics problem, adequate training of the surgeon. And here you can see when we put the traction, absolutely no reduction at all. And what we have wanted, the patient didn't want one more posterior surgery. Then we had to literally convince them that, you know, the pathology is still anterior. And first I did once again, transoral procedure and removed the whole posterior and anterior uh, odontoidectomy is done. And posteriorly, we re refixed, you know, a patient and patient started walking from the wheelchair to able to do all the activity. This is yet another patient, you know, cervical myelopathy with the bacillary invagination. Once again, here, you can see the amount of a screw which is used here. The lamina screw is used and the occipital plate is used without reducing the AD at all in this patient. And the joint is still remaining, you know, the uh, joint is aligned. But however, the bacillary invagination is significant in this patient. And this patient, we had to redo the whole procedure where you know um, we did the, the goal um, procedure and patient did very well because the alignment of the C1-C2 joint very well in these patients. So we have, you know, in the present day, as I mentioned, transcell surgery has become rarity. We have published a paper where exactly we had to do the, you know, transoral procedure and one knowing this procedure is mandatory to do, you know, whenever there is a redo procedures. And here is yet another patient, you know, similarly, uh, this is by Sushil Patkar, who keeps telling that most of these things can be done anteriorly. But, you know, any patients where there's a posterior mass is involved and a severe bacillar invagination, only anterior is a you know, difficult procedure. And most of the you know, cases which can be do doable are the one which can be reducible even from the posterior approach. I still think extrapharyngeal approaches are useful in mild to moderate bacillary invaginations, but the severe invagination requires either circumferential approach or completely posterior jacking technique, goel technique or DCR technique of Sharat. So here's another patient where it is patient was operated long ago, nearly about 15 years ago by me itself, where we did a trans you know, uh, oral procedure and the patient had a posterior fusion, but came back with a secondary invagination because the posterior rod constructs, which we used to use contour rod, will never have that slides over a period of days. But you can see here, the bone graft is so well fused, but there is a secondary invagination. The, the residual body, it just slides upwards. In such patients, once again, we had to remove the you know, implant posteriorly. We did the you know, uh, MRI, which shows persistent uh, CV junction uh, uh, pathology at craniovertebral junction. And here we did, the, you know, though there is a post stable posterior fixation, mobility is seen post-removal, and we had to do posterior fixation with one anterior one endarctectomy. In this patient, we did, I did transoral approach, uh, uh, surgery, followed by occipital cervical fusion, and we jacked the whole thing between C2 and the occiput in this position so that there's a wide gap available and patient recovered completely in this patient. Here is yet another patient where the AD with the myelopathy here is done by somebody else. Once again, the cage is so small. The cage, you know, is the one of the doctors. This is operated elsewhere where the goal technique is used, but the cage is so small it has not you know, jacked up the joint. Joint has not come back. There is a persistent myelopathy in this patient. Uh, this patient is still thinking whether to undergo our surgery or not. The opposite side, they have not put a cage or the plate. Uh, they, only one side, there is a cage in this patient. Here is you know, another patient where there is a Atlanta axial dislocation with you know, uh, where there is a compression at C1, C2 level. 
And here, I thought there is a good reduction in flexion extension MRI. We thought we'll put a transarticular screw fixation, cable grafting, and I did the transarticular screw fixation, Sontag technique, and patient did very well for about one year. A year later, came back to me with a worsening myelopathy and a, you know, the 62-year-old gentleman. And when I repeated this CT scan, you can clearly see I failed completely uh, by doing one. Here, uh, the, jo the joint is not, uh, you know, we are not used the lag screw. Second, the cable which has been used, we put a graft, the graft got resolved. When the graft resolves, the whole thing collapses further and the cable by itself is acting as a compressive element. In this patient, is yet to be operated. You know, in this patient, I had to redo the whole procedure with taking out the uh, the transarticular screw and a cable, and we had to redo with either the Goyle technique or the Harms cage technique. So, in this way, multiple things, your own patient or somebody else's patient can come in, knowing all techniques in the you know, CV junction is mandatory. So, the take-home message is, First surgery is the best surgery in CVJ. You know, make sure your understanding of the anatomy very well in these patients. Do all the, you know, uh, CT scans, understand the anatomy very well and get to know all the, you know, uh, surgeries, principles in, and adapt to that. Joint reduction is mandatory and a paramount. Knowledge about the anterior transfer surgery is also important in these patients. Beware of various fixation technique. C1 arch excision rarely needed if joint is reduced. Meticulous exposure of venous sinusoids is very important. I <coughs> in a Doppler probe navigation helps in revision surgeries. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Satish. Uh, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful talk. I think due to lack of time, we'll just take either one comment or question uh, if anybody is willing to take that. Yes, Professor Sharat. Yeah, please. Satish, excellent presentation. Mm -hmm. I've got only two comments. Mm -hmm. First of all, I think it's very important to dissipate the message right. that you cannot do fixation without adequate reduction. Right. I now have more than 70 to 80 cases. I have to exactly see, but it's close to 80 cases mm -hmm. where people have just done in situ fixations and then referred them to the higher center. Correct. So there has to be a message which has to be conveyed that please do not touch these cases until you are confident of reducing it and then putting an implant. That's the message which I wanted to deliver. I completely agree. And, and second thing is, Satish, I, I agree. I don't, I have never put a, uh, I have never put a traction for the past almost 15 to 16, 17 years. So I don't think there is any role of traction as of now. You can easily make out the only irreducible AD which I feel is when there is a bone fusion. Correct. In those cases also, if there is a joint fusion, we can release the joints. The ventral fusion is the only thing which will need a transoral procedure. But we have totally stopped putting tractions. No, I, I, I agree with you. I do rarely use it, but I use it for two reasons. One, to understand myself, is there still any movement persist? As I showed you the first case where the elderly lady, there's a big bony fusion which has happened perfectly posteriorly. And if there is a small movement, I cannot do transferal surgery. I have to go back, take out that complete bone and redo the whole thing. If there is, if there is no movement, Still, we can get away in some patient, elderly people, patients with a pulmonary problem, just a simple transfer surgery. Transfer surgery is a simple surgery, according to me. Straight extradural pathology. In such patient, I will not produce further instability in such patients. That is the only reason I use, and I use it only for a few hours, less than you know, 24 hours. After that, 100%, I'll never use it. Just for my confirmation. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for that uh, clarification. Uh, so let's move on to the next topic. The next topic, uh, Dr. Ashok Rathod is here. So he's going to give us a different yeah. perspective fr and from an anterior point of view, is uh, going to talk about the role of anterior release in CV junction surgeries. Dr. Ashok, over to you. Yeah. yeah can I share the screen? Yeah, please start, uh, Dr. Ashok. It's over to you. Yeah. Please start. Oh. Dr. Ashok, we can't still see your yeah, screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Can you see the screen? Yeah. N not yet. Mm. 
Okay, it is it is visible now. Yes. Okay. Okay, shall I start? Yeah. Uh, you can hear my voice. Yeah, okay. clearly, clearly. Yeah, 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 please sure. go ahead. Okay. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So my topic is Wang's transfer release, and what I'm going to talk uh, today is basically in a fixed areas. I think we have been talking since last half an hour. So let me just run through the basic anatomy of CV junction. This is C2, and you uh, you have C1 uh, sitting over C2, and this is the C1 C2 joint there. And you have a beautiful funnel shaped uh, cervical medullary cord there. In a fixed AD, usually a, more, um, a variant of clipal field where you have C2 and C3 fused, and you have an occipitalized atlas, and there is a great lot of mm, mobility between this upper complex and, and the lower fuse complex. And the whole of the C2 dome gets attenuated. There, as you can see it here, it, the C1 C2 joint, which is supposed to be on top of C2 now goes on to the anteriorly. So when you take the X-ray here, <clears throat> what we see here make out is basically C2 and C3 is fused. And if you see this occipital atlas, which is better appreciated on, which is better appreciated on a CT, this is, just one second, yeah. So this is C1 atlas which is uh, dislocated, in fact, what we can call it as a spondyloptosis lying in front of C2 there and pushing uh, the dense more into the foramen magnum, uh, giving an acute uh, cervical medullary angle and compressing the cervical medullary cord, as you can see it in uh, midline cuts of the MRIs there. So these are all extreme cases. And these extreme cases, we call them irreducible only after uh, giving a heavy traction almost amounting to one third of body weight under any anesthesia on the operation day. We don't give any pre op traction. But then a majority of them, more than 90% of these congenital AADs, are usually turn out to be a fixed or irreducible AADs. But the reason here is basically two or three. Like as you can see, like one of the main reasons is this longest coli, which is attached onto the anterior arch and pulling the C1 down and keeping it there and pushing uh, C2 more into retroversion. And this attenuated uh, dome of C2 and the dislocated position gives rise to C1, C2 capsular contracture there. And these two important structures, the capsular contracture and the contracted longus coli, let us see if we can release it through the transfer release in these extreme cases and get some mobility, and then we can allow for fixing there. And use some maneuver to distract it anteriorly, and whether can we restore the normal anatomy. We had tried earlier, long back, only posterior manipulation, but a major, uh, at the majority of them, even published by the other authors also, usually gives rise to a suboptimal reduction, a very often what we call it a spurious reduction. And, this also gives rise to the suboptimal or incomplete neurological recovery because of the persistent tenting anteriorly of the cervical medullary cord. And then in 2006, uh, Wang's paper uh, was published as Professor Abumi and also mentioned about him. And then we started this uh, uh, transural release for this fixed AADs by our team, our mentor, Dr. Lairi Shitej, myself. And I was able to carry forward this. We published this in European Spine, uh, like, uh, like about 15 cases is this. We usually do it in the same sitting, but in two stages, the anterior and the posterior, where uh, a lot of preoperative workup is also done, requires an ANT and a dental checkup, uh, a good mouth opening, a good oral hygiene. We usually start with bitarin gargle almost about uh, three days prior and after each meal. Then study the angiogram, that for an, an like anomalies, and then uh, on table first in supine position, uh, give a heavy traction almost amounting to one third of the body weight. Give a generous head high position. Observe for uh, ten to fifteen minutes. If it is reduced even partially, if it is uh, come uh, to a certain level, 
Yes, sir. then we consider it to be a reducible and then go ahead with only posterior there. But if it is uh, not moving, then we label it as an irreducible and go ahead with a transoral release. There. So we scrub the part with beta, with beta scrub, but the oral cavity scrub only with the Savlon solution, clean it with a saline. The next step, what we do is pass an infant feeding tube, take it out. Dr. Ashok, your voice is not audible. Dr. Ashok, I think some, some internet connectivity, I think your, your screen has frozen. Can you hear us, Dr. Ashok? Dr. Ashok, can you hear us? Uh, okay, I think he is logged off. Yeah. Uh, we'll just wait for him to join. And in, in the meantime, uh, 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 can we have some uh, inputs from uh, Dr. Satish? Dr. Satish, uh, so what is the role, like you also showed uh, uh, a transoral approach in a revision case, but what is, do you have any indications where, uh, you know, where your transoral approach or an anterior release is required primarily before going posterior? Dr. Satish. Yeah, sir, can you take that question, Dr. Srivastava, please? So, uh, in fact, all these discussion I were I was listening. Uh, see, anterior procedure is a very small procedure, and uh, you have to just open and release that thing. You are not going to take out anything unless there is a bony mass and you plan to burr out. Otherwise, it is a soft tissue release, which is soft tissue which is so significantly contracted. The moment you put your knife or your cautery, it gives way. You, you get sudden uh, feel of the you know giving way. It is so because patient is on traction. The moment you start releasing, it start getting uh, you know uh, reduced. And uh, uh, regarding this transoral surgery, uh, we had a patient where there is a submucous oral fibrosis, and his mouth opening was negligible. In that case, we started doing retropharyngeal as we as we do ACDF. We started doing uh, using that approach. There was no need of any transoral. And even the you know the, in Hans place people used to do tracheostomy and do the thing, so we started doing the ACD, ACDF approach and that uh, and you release the thing. It was so simple that after that case I stopped doing any transfer. You know all these releases I started doing with the retropharyngeal approach and see if you go by the pathology the tight structure is there which is not allowing you to get reduced. So why not to address the pathology? Just release, add this small procedure. And most important in the CVJ is your getting the proper reduction. Proper reduction may be different for different people. My criteria is you have to have a normal clivus canal angle. If you have not achieved the normal clivus canal angle, it means you have not reduced it properly. Okay? Even in okay. Uh, 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 Goel's technique, I have some seen some cases where the if the translation used to be there, it is to used to remain a little bit towards the uh, foramen. Okay, so I think achieving the normal clivus canal angle should be the goal. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Ashok uh, is he able to connect? So can we just move on to the next talk, uh, Shitij? Can we just play the next talk? I think uh, once Dr. Ashok joins back. Once yes. his connection is restored, maybe we can get back to him. So the next talk is going to be uh, on uh, vertebral artery injuries. And I have sent a pre-recorded talk uh, regarding that. So, yeah. Hello, everyone. At the outset, I would like to thank the entire organizing team of BSS for giving me this opportunity to present. Uh, my topic is vertebral artery injury. And, and as it has been rightly told in the heading of my topic, uh, it's, it's, it's a cause for panic 
uh, vertebral artery injuries can be a catastrophic event and can be potentially life-threatening if it happens during the surgery. And, and the second part is all we need to know about it. And, and the most important thing that we know about, we want to know about it is the anatomy and how to prevent vertebral artery injuries. And a little bit, I'll be also dealing about how to manage them if, if the unfortunate event happens. Though vertebral artery has been uh, divided into four segments from its origin, the vertebral artery at the CV junction is divided by Goel et al. into three segments. So the V1 segment is the is one of the most important segments because it is between C3 and C2 and this is where the vertebral artery ascends from the C3 transverse foramina and it varies uh, to, a, to a significant extent uh, in, in a supramedial curve in order to form what we call some it sometimes as the high riding vertebral artery. Once it's exit from the C2 transverse foramina, the vertebral artery po courses posterior uh, laterally as well as then anteromedially in order to enter the C1 transverse process. And this loop is slightly away from the C1-C2 C1-C2 joint, which helps us to do any intra-articular manipulation. And once it comes from the C1 transverse foramina, again it courses posterior medially. And then again, anteromedially to enter the dura, which is again around 1.5 centimeters lateral to the midline. So as we know, vertebral arteries are one of the most, uh, you know, the variations and anomalies are quite predominant. It's around two to three percent in the normal population. Twenty percent of patients in CV junction anomaly can have this, as well as sixty-six percent of patients with occipitalized C1 can have vertebral artery anomalies. Coming to no vertebral artery anomalies in normal subjects, of course, there are several, uh, you know, different ones which I'm not going to detail. Most of these usually entail one of the branches or the vertebral artery itself coursing below the C1 transverse arch, posterior arch which obviously comes in the way of putting in a C1 uh, uh, lateral mass screw and we should be very very careful. The most common variation that happens is the hypoplastic vertebral artery which often has been defined. There is no consensus but it has been defined as a diameter of less than 2.2 millimeters. In such, it's important to know which one is the dominant vertebral artery which is the non-dominant vertebral artery which is the hypoplastic or aplastic vertebral artery which will help us decide uh, and plan during the surgery. Uh, of course we should always be we should always be aware of what are the types of vertebral artery anomalies or variations that can happen in the setting of occipitalization. And even in this case, fortunately, most of these vertebral arteries actually enter one of the foramen, uh, osseous foramen in the occipital bone itself, and they do not come in the way of the surgery at all. But we have to be careful about these type 1 and type 2, around 30-35% of the cases where the vertebral artery can go below the posterior arch of C1 and across the fused C1 lateral mass. And again, they can sometimes they can have a medial entry into the dura where we can, you know, they are prone to injury while of the dissection itself. I was already mentioning about high riding vertebral artery, any internal height less than two millimeters or as much height less than five millimeters qualifies as an high riding vertebral artery. And there are several different uh, classifications that have come in. This is one of the most accepted ones where uh, obviously on a rough note, if the vertebral artery cave crosses the half of the C2 pedicle, then it means that it can interfere or the chances of vertebral artery injuries are higher while putting a C2 pedicle screw. Whereas as long as it is in the lateral half of the C2 pedicle, the chances of injury are higher. But of course, uh, if vertebral artery injury happens, what is the next step? It can be, as I already mentioned, it can be a catastrophic iatrogenic complications. And there are several, even if we are able to manage these intraoperatively in some way, we are able to come out of it. Uh, you know, there are several serious consequences that can happen, which includes fistula, pseudo aneurysms. And obviously, you know, one of the more serious ones are several ischemia, posterior fossa infarct, a pica infarct, or, uh, you know, even death in, if, the, if it involves the brainstem. So, vertebral artery injury can happen at several different stages during exposure between occipital and C1, as I have told, uh, you know, if we dissect it too laterally on the superior margin of the C1 posterior arch, again, it can enter the vertebral artery crew. It should be very careful. It should not dissect more than 1.5 centimeters beyond the midline on the superior border of the C1 lateral mass. Further dissection, if it is required, it has to be on the inferior margin of the C1 arch in order to reach the C1-C2 uh, C1-C2 joint. And the second point where we can actually injure is the, where it exits from the C2 transverse foramina, where again, too much dissection this dissection superolaterally can cause, uh, especially if you are using a monopolar, can cause injury to the vertebral artery. Again, it's important here to go to the to the inferior margin of the lateral border of the C2 lateral mass as well as, and then go superomedially tracing the parts 
in order to identify the trajectory of the screw that is required. Um, during screw insertion also the vertebral artery can get injured. Obviously, this is, happens deeper inside the bone which will not be visualized superficially. Uh, this should be avoided, ideally should be avoided with, op with appropriate preoperative evaluation, choosing which is the correct type of screw in that particular case to be used and of course in borderline cases using a 3D navigation like like in like as shown here uh, can help significantly in reducing the incidence of vertebral artery injuries obviously the treatment goals of vertebral artery injury are to achieve control of the hemorrhage obviously the first and the primary primary uh, objective once the bleeding is there uh, at the same time as much as possible and it's very at most important to prevent acute central nervous ischemia and prevent post-operative complications such as embolism and pseudo aneurysms and this can be achieved in three different ways one is primary repair the second one is a bypass, the vertebral artery bypass, uh, an extradural to intradural bypass surgery, or uh, in some cases, whenever, whenever, whenever it is not possible or it's not going to cause any significant uh, uh, consequence, sacrifice the vertebral artery. The general measures, as has been rightly told, we should not panic. We should send for a vascular surgeon, communicate with our anesthesia team, advise, you know, arrange for adequate blood products, ensure that the head is in neutral position so that the contralateral vertebral artery, which is not injured, is not uh, is not compressed due to the rotation of the bow, rotation of the head. Um, you know, of course, digital pressure, large pieces of hemostatic agents and, uh, you know, cotinoids can be used in order to pack and achieve hemostasis and define what is the what is the area of injury, whether any proximal and distal control can be achieved immediately or whether any temporary clip can be post placed in order to achieve uh, significant control of the bleeding uh, intraoperatively. So this is just a brief uh, flow chart which shows, uh, you know, how to manage intraoperative vertebral artery injury during exposure. Obviously, it is important in either, any case to determine whether it's the dominant vertebral artery or the non-dominant or a co-dominant vertebral artery. And the second point is whether any proximal and distal control of the vertebral artery segment is achievable. Uh, if it is a non-dominant or a co-dominant vertebral artery we, and with a good retrograde flow, we can always sacrifice or tamponate that particular artery. If there is no retrograde flow or if the injury has happened in a dominant vertebral artery and if primary repair is possible, it should always be attempted. If primary repair is not possible, we should achieve control of the hemorrhage and immediately come out, in, immediately an endovascular repair or a bypass has to be planned uh, to prevent any further kind of uh, cerebral ischemia. Uh, if it happens during screw insertion, again, the same question we need to answer, whether it's a dominant or a non-dominant. Obviously, the issue arises if it is a dominant vertebral artery. We have to change the trajectory and we have to put an alternate screw if possible. Uh, and we have to use a bone wax to control that bleeding that is there. Is usually pretty much easy to control uh, a bleeding if it has happened uh, within the, uh, you know, while inserting the screw or while, while putting in the, while doing the tapping. Uh, we should always do in these cases post-op angiogram to see what is the nature of injury, whether it's a complete block, whether there is a pseudoneurism that is formed, and of course we should plan for an endovascular repair or a bypass as, as has been planned. Even if it is a non-dominant or a co-dominant vertebral artery, and if it is a, you know, if we, are, if we are able to achieve tamponade and, you know, hemostatic agents and we are able to put the screw in the same trajectory, we should always do a post-operative angiogram, uh, you know, to rule out any kind of a pseudoneurysm. Sometimes intimal injury can cause thrombosis and this thrombus can embolize, uh, you know, into the intracranial uh, and cause significant, uh, again, uh, embolic uh, infarcts in the posterior fossa. So there are general post-operative measures that we should take care. We should always have close post-operative monitoring, look for lateralizing signs as has been listed over there. Uh, antiplatelet therapy is very, very important as has been shown that if it is not started, if there is a tenfold higher risk of uh, thromboembolic events, post-operative, post-vertebral uh, artery injury, we should restrict neck movements. Uh, of course, you know, BSA, as I already mentioned. Uh, to conclude, there are several different things that we should in, uh, that, that we should take care of while treating vertebral artery. There are four A's. We should know the anatomy in detail. We should assess the, the pathoanatomy whenever we are doing a surgery. Of course, during exposure and during screw placement, we should avoid vertebral artery injuries. And if it happens, I've already discussed what is the action that needs to be taken. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Dr. Ashok is back. Uh, Dr. Ashok? Could you put? Yeah. So, can you just continue? Please continue your talk. If uh, there are no issues at your hand, please, please uh, continue the talk. Doctor Ashok, uh, can you unmute yourself?
Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, now I can hear you. Please continue. Okay, I think we... Yeah, I think it was here somewhere. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, okay. So once we decide this is irreducible and we go ahead with a transferal release there. So we scrub the part, we scrub the oral cavity with Savlon and saline. And the first thing what we do is we pass uh, an infant feeding tube. Yeah, uh, uh, through the nose, take it out through the oral cavity. We suture the uvula or to the infant feeding tube, and then we pull it out. So your the cover uvula gets attracted. We prepare the, we drape the parts. This is the head end, and as you can see, this catheter is basically that uvula pulling out uh, this this thread, and that's the mouth gag. We take a vertical incision after infiltration there. And if this is the bony alignment, this is how the incision goes. And there's the bony anatomy. This is where the, the longus coli is there. We not only incise it, we excise a part of the longus coli, both the longus coli. And then we go ahead and incise the C1C2 joint capsule. As you can see here, uh, that's the tight uh, longus coli. We excise a part of the longus coli, both sides. And then we incise the C1C2 capsule till the lateral border there. And then we use <clears throat> a periosteum elevator into the C1C2 joints on both the sides. We distract it upper niche. Yeah. We use a blend pukas. We use it like a horizontal and a vertical manner to even distract it further. And the amount of mobility we get it, as you can see it here. And the last option in a picture is while pressing it from the posterior aspect, like as you can see it, <clears throat> at the moment I'm pressing it from the cetospinous process. So we are we are creating a fixed AD into, uh, in fact, the hypermobile AD. The steps which I follow is that we always cut the longus coli from the C1 posterior arch. We cut the C1C2 capsule till the lateral border, enter C1C2 joints and mobilize them with the help of pukas and periosteum elevator. After these two compulsory steps, yes, if we still feel the release appears to be inadequate, then we go ahead with excision of the arch of the atlas. This will allow the dents to come forward when they manipulate it from behind. There and then we suture it, uh, suture the uh, posterior pharyngeal mucosa with a 30 vicyl. Uh, the throat is packed with diluted and soaked saline betadine gauze. There, we very carefully turn this patient because uh, now these patients have become like an hypermobile AAD. Uh, we usually use, like as we were discussing with Professor Abumi, we use an under contoured rod or an under contoured plate, like a cobra hood molding. And when you press this onto the occiput, like you can see here, like in the first picture, uh, there is still some residual atlantoaxial subluxation. But when you press it onto the occiput, we get an absolutely uh, subvasion reduction, as you can see it on these CT scans and a beautiful funnel shaped uh, cervical medullary canal. These are extreme cases. And then we do a bone grafting as like already been discussed often. So besides at these 15 cases which were reported in the European spine channel, we added almost another 14, 15 cases, total around 29, 30 cases. And these are all extreme aid is what we were talking about till now. And the advantage of this is that these are absolutely very short procedure, hardly lasting for about from 20 to 40 minutes. Then, with almost a negligible blood loss, hardly 10, 15 cc's. And it's a direct approach releasing those tight structures rather than uh, manipulating all from behind and trying to get all these maneuvers there. I think a little adding this a small step of anterior transfer release in this uh, irreducible type, we can achieve an excellent mobility, excellent to the sense. This fixed AADs almost becomes like a hypermobile AADs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ashok, and uh, uh, you know, thank you for joining back in.
I think there was a brief uh, interruption uh, due to some probably some network issue. So, are there any questions yes, uh, for the anterior uh, release? Uh, any comments or questions? So, if there are nothing, then we will proceed to the next talk. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Arjun is ready with his next talk. I I would invite Dr. Arjun Dhavle uh, to present his talk. Uh, he's going to be talking on special considerations for pediatric CV junction fixation. Uh, Dr. Arjun, over to you. You can please start. Yes, you shared your screen. We can see your screen. Please proceed. So, thank you very much for this invitation. And I'm going to be talking about uh, pediatric CVJ. So this is a three-year-old child with Down syndrome. And uh, you can see that there is atlantic actual instability. So the question really is, how do you manage it? What are the diagnostic challenges? What are the surgical challenges? You know, what are going to be the results and what can be the complications here? So I wanted to define this and uh, really these are the questions. And, uh, you know, we've looked at this in children below five years. And uh, it's actually more difficult in younger children than in adults. There is uh, little literature on this, you know, in smaller children. And uh, of course, you need uh, the IONM and good pediatric anesthesia. And also, you have to have a good variety of implants available. Uh, so basically, there are issues with uh, you know, understanding because the child is small, so it's very difficult to get a history. You're getting MRIs, etc. requires sedation. You know, there are often syndromic associations here. So this is a one-year-old nine month child with Marcus syndrome with difficulty in walking, you know, hypertonia, grade three, hyperreflexia, and uh, exaggerated reflexes. And we had to have X-rays, a dynamic MRI, you know, you can see on the X-ray, the issue which is here. And that's the MRI showing on flexion that there is an increase in the instability and the compression and this has been looked at you know in uh, syndromic children looking at basically uh, at flexion extension mri you know, surgical challenges here are the exposure you know in small children of course you have to do a little lesser exposure than what you do in adults uh, the incidence of anomalous vertebral arteries uh, is more common and then the fixation anchors which are more difficult VA injuries can happen, you know, they, they can happen uh, during the exposure year or during instrumentation. And it's also important to maintain meticulous hemostasis because there's a small child and the blood loss cannot be as much as would be permitted, you know, an adult. So you have to really have uh, a watch on how much blood you're losing. So we wanted to look at the results in smaller children below five years, especially. And, uh, you know, we actually had, we did uh, pre-operative planning with this uh, MPRCT and the Horos. This uh, study has been published, you know, which me and uh, Nene, we looked at uh, this in 25 children. And it's basically the use of the free software uh, with the use. Now, basically, there are the images which you can just see on the CT. And then there is the packs, you know, which allows you to kind of look at it. But the non-orthogonal reconstructional is actually what is most important when you're planning your trajectories. And that is, uh, you know, definitely advisable in small children because you won't get a second chance. And also, you're looking at the volume rendering, you know, looking at the DICOM data and uh, looking at the pathoanatomy and the fixation anchor planning. So this is a child, who, you know, with a syndrome uh, who had a lysis of C2. And you can see that lysis of C2 and then basically had to be fixed with hooks because there was no other alternative. So what are the types of surgeries you can do? You can do a C1, C2 transarticular surgery. You can do lateral mass, you know, pedicle screws, laminar screws. And you can do occipital cervical fusion. And uh, you need to have the anchors available. Marceline tape is an important thing to keep available you know, if you can't get the screws. And... Uh, you have to be careful about the hooks. 
So now right. union is something that uh, is important, especially in smaller kids. The neurological recovery, you know, what's happening? Are the children improving? And what are the complications you can encounter? Non-union implant failure, neurological worsening. So when we looked at Uh, you know, this, we found that uh, we had a larger number of congenital and syndromic patients and many of them underwent occipital cervical fixation. So these are the results. We had implant failures, non-unions, neurological worsening. And uh, in some cases, fixation below C3 was also required. And this is a four-year-old child with Down syndrome, non-walker, okay, and actually had a flexion extension X-ray. During the flexion X-ray, the radiologist technician actually hyperflexed. You can see the deterioration which happened after that. This is the child's MRI, you know, MRI showing the C1, C2 instability. That's the preoperative planning of the trajectories, and that's the fixation, transarticular screws. Mm -hmm. And uh, this patient basically had a good five-year follow-up. You know, this is the child at five years. So, so this is another child, four-year-old child with Marcus syndrome, with difficulty walking since six months, grade three power. And uh, again, a transarticular screw fixation was done. However, this child started to have a loosening of the screw, you know, on one side. Child was still able to stand neurologically improved. And this is that two years. You can see that one of the screws actually has uh, inferiorly migrated. There is a suboptimal reduction, but the child is still ambulatory. You know, so we are observing, but uh, it is likely that this child may require uh, revision. There's another patient, a little older patient with a dysplasia who had a C1, C2 instability. Here again, there is a very anomalous vertebral artery. You can see there's no trajectory for a pedicle screw on the left. And here again, then a lamina screw was used. That's the fixation. This is another child, very small, one year and eight months, you know, where it was not possible to get a suitable uh, bony fixation. So only marceline tape was used distally. However, this patient required revision later you know, and uh, distal ex extension. And you can see that is the atlas cable, which is used. This is a five-year-old child with atlantoaxial instability who had a unilateral fixation, but then had a fall and had a worsening postoperatively. That's the MRI. This patient had to have a OC fixation along with uh, C2 laminar and C2 power screw. And that's the follow-up. So sometimes, you know, you can have rare syndrome. So like this was a child who actually presented to us with a, a posterior circulation stroke and had a undiagnosed dysplasia. And we actually had to wait after the stroke and then do a fixation. We had to avoid here a pedicle screw because there was already a, a you know, vertebral artery stretch. So that was a preoperative planning and then the fixation with a laminar screw on one side. And this is a patient where, you know, a patient had operated and then there was a loss of reduction. And uh, subsequently, then me and Chitij revised this case. And we did what Dr. Rathur just described. So we removed the screws uh, and the plate at the back first. Then we flipped the patient again. And anteriorly, we did a transoral release. And then we did a posterior fixation. And that's the outcome. The take-home message, you have to have a high index of suspicion. CBA junction amalgamation. Children are more difficult to treat. And you have to have alternative fixation. And uh, But it is to be done when it needs to be done and you just have to do it appropriately. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Arjun, for showing those complex as well as uh, challenging cases. Uh, so uh, what is the youngest age? Uh, what would you you would recommend that probably a transarticular screw or any kind of a screw-based construct can be used in the pediatric age group? That is number one. Uh, uh, number two is, is there any special type of screw that you use or it's the our regular 3.5 mm diameter screw? So okay, can you just shed some light on these two questions? So the 3.5 is a is a good screw. You know, there are some, the, some of the companies have now come up with the 3 mm screws, you know, which are good sometimes for the smaller laminae, etc. Uh, the decision is taken on a case-to-case -case basis. Uh, it is based on the pre-order planning, you know, and basically what 
trajectory is going to be allowed what is the fixation that is going to be permitted in that patient um you know and uh, of course if you just can't do anything else then you have to have that at least cable and uh, that is a sort of bailout option great so any comments or uh, uh, any questions from uh, other faculty yeah dr ashok please yeah uh, especially those children who are less than 3 years even the isthmus diameter is hardly sometimes even 2.7 mm screws are difficult to accommodate the uh, last few cases i have done only k wiring technique used even a threaded k wires but uh, and to prevent it from migrating proximally or migrating behind pulling out then what i do is bend the wire and use a c1 uh, a c2 wiring around you no know, wire so it doesn't migrate like if you allow me i can just show this you know so that like in case we don't have to put a screw i mean can i share the screen if you want uh, i think we'll have one yes, more probably. talk left uh, probably uh, yeah you know, okay because, okay yeah, no we're no already problem. running uh, yeah, we, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, we no would problem. we would love to see that you know it's very interesting but because we are already running out of time uh, we yeah, are already sure. running late so no let's problem. go on with the next talk uh if there are no further comments or questions so the last one uh, it was supposed to be a little earlier we were waiting for dr bharat dave to join us there he is busy with and he is on the podium in another session elsewhere uh, so we'll just run his talk on uh, atlanta axial spacer insertion uh, so it's a recorded talk by dr bharat dave greetings from bharat dave thanks assi and kshitij to give me this spacers are used for the vertical reduction of basilar invagination and it allows the c1 c2 reduction with minimal or no traction and it eliminates the additional posterior laminectomy as and when required c2 ganglion is routinely cut very nicely described this procedure by our own dr sharad chandra who is also faculty in this webinar as well He has described very well the single stage posterior only technique to reduce the basilary invagination, distraction, compression, extension, and reduction. He has developed his own device that helps to reduce and get the reduction very well. Midline subperiosteal uh, dissection is done. Exposure from occiput to C4, and we should have the joint exposure. ideal would be to have the non stick bipolar cautery and it is useful to prevent the bleeding and dissect it rapidly this is demonstrated very well in this uh, video as you can see the water swing we have to be done in order to not to have the sticky surface of the bipolar cautery points of venous bleed epidural venous bleed plexus is medially and i think you we really have to have it clearly seen visible and uh, we should really have the whole venous plexus coagulated and we should go from medial to lateral coagulation with anastomosis should be done as mentioned with the non stick cautery bipolar cautery if it bleeds then we may have to put the patty and have gel wait for few minutes if it continues to bleed have gel then only one really need to have the head up blood pressure around 70 mean that also helps in reducing the bleeding as well so in the fact this bleeding is something which we really have to control it well and that is the key to access to the c1 c2 joint c1 c2 joint can be accessed by following the superior border of the c2 lamina and we will directly end into the joint c2 ganglion will be seen as shown in the lower figure preserve if one can or cut it with the 
with the cautery and leave the stump so away from the dural sac as much as one can because otherwise it will lead to cs oblique once the joint is exposed then one can put the small osteotome and one can open it up and one really need to bar the end plates of the c1 c2 joint in order to put the cage with the bone graft and the fusion so that is very important we have the oam and navigation and it increases the accuracy and honestly it has changed our practice and it also allows us to put the screw in the non traditional way so the entry of the screw could be different and many a times this cases have scoliosis as well so the not the classic entry which is normally described in the textbooks or one has experience we have found n number of times that the entry can be different variable particularly the angle right left angle and mediolateral uh, cranial caudal angle and mediolateral angle can be different as well and as i mentioned we have three sets of the oam navigation that helps us in putting the things together and also we have the 4d 4k 3d exoscope as well that also helps us in visualizing it better so just coming to case example 33 year main imbalance while walking clumsiness of the hand and had hyperreflexia and it was a fixed aad atlanto axial dislocation as you can see you know it was pretty nerve wracking case and it was also having the occiput the whole odontoid vice right into the medulla into the pons and we managed to reduce it with the careful dissection and we managed to put the spacer in it and we usually drill with the diamond bar in order to stop the skiving and that also we use it with the navigation as well so once that is done with the c1 c2 one can prepare one can remove the, the c1 screw and then put the spacer so that also helps us as well and then afterwards one need to just put the drive the screw in and then stabilize it and as you can see in this case we had put the cages and then we had put the pedicle screw and this is the two year follow up of the same patient who is doing well at the moment so that is it yeah. uh, i don't know if you could hear the voice was very low in this presentation yeah and uh, yeah yeah uh, there was a lot of disturbance as well so anyways i think that uh, brings us to the end of this session and uh, you know i should say that it was very exciting very wonderful and you know there was a lot of discussion uh, about the topics that we were uh, you know that we have uh, encountered in this ses particular session uh, any closing remarks from the senior faculty professor sharath or dr shrivatsa anything that you want to add or comment at the end and before before we uh, say goodbyes it was a very wonderful session and we were expecting that uh, all these cases uh, all these you know topics will be discussed uh, in plan and i think that is the reason we got little bit delayed but i think you we have nicely utilized the time and uh, i would request if dr sarachand wants to make some comment please around no <laughs> yeah is waiting for his video is switched off so hello i'll just in the yes. meantime uh, address all the uh, delegates you know uh, you know, don't be afraid you know some part of this discussion was maybe everybody is at a different level when they are doing cranio vertebral surgery so some of you maybe you know doing something want to learn something basic versus you know the end part end session was quite complicated and you know even for experienced surgeons i have like myself i i find some of these uh, techniques quite challenging to do 
but uh, you know it's a stepwise process so don't get disheartened we have a lot of time um, uh, you know coming up to the cadaver course utilize the uh, classroom uh, uh, to the best of your uh, ability and, and you know we are there available to answer your questions uh, we'll put up cases on the classroom uh, and we'll discuss at least uh, there'll be something for everyone uh, among the 20 of you here um, just don't feel shy you can ask us anything um, there is a whatsapp group also for you to ask and and on the day of the cadaver at least we want some uh, basic objectives to be achieved you should be at least confident enough in inserting screws in normal anatomy which the cadavers will be like putting in the c1 screw c2 screw and the occiput screw um, and and understand the basic principles like you know some of the principles were laid out in this course uh, like for example dr sarat chandra said never fix something uh, without uh, a good reduction and so that's so important take away and um, a very uh, clear statement that you should take home uh, you know those kind of uh, pearls of wisdom you are going to get in uh, sessions like these so remember those and uh, i think we'll meet again in person on the 21st in the meantime uh, we can keep the interaction online either on the whatsapp group or on the google classroom and please tell us uh, how we can help you give us a feedback and then we'll address all that we have some time before we meet you in person and also tell that we will share the uh, google map link uh, the you know venue of the workshop it is between cyan and chembur and you'll be getting that uh, address information on whatsapp all right and uh, you know we'll summarize all these talks for you on the google classroom and also there will be a recorded session uh, this recorded session will be available for you to watch even if you don't get time before uh, the conference you can watch it afterwards also uh, but uh, you know just uh, at least the basic ones at least revise them before you come for the cadaver course with that i, I think we'll end this session um yeah, i thank you and all the delegates for making this session wonderful. The faculty has taken out their valuable time and make it very, made it very informative. I personally thank all of you. Thanks a lot, and uh, I welcome. Yeah, thank you, sir. Organizing team, and uh, you please do join us uh, from uh, 18th onward. So 18th is our the first day of ACCon 2024. All of you are most welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. I thank uh, all thank my you. Uh, you know, moderators, my co-chair, Dr. Chitis, Dr. Uh, Shatis, Dr. Meher, Dr. Umesh, Dr. Manish. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir.